warm good morning one and all uh, we are a bit late to start the session now so i invite uh, ca divya dharmarajan for introducing the faculty and start the session straight away after that warm good morning one and all good morning once again i have the privilege of introducing the esteemed faculty for today's session ca money he is a practicing chartered accountant with more than 35 years of experience he is a partner at messrs shankar and murthy he has co-authored the book which was published by icai on concurrent audit of banks in september 2023 He has also authored an e-book which was released by SIRC of ICAI on the subject Quick Tips for Conducting Bank Branch Audit during April 2022. He has authored a book on GST named Handbook for Handholding GST Compliances. He has taken orientation sessions for all cross section of businessmen and professionals about GST in Calicut, Kannur, Ernakulam, Alappuzha, Perumbavur, Alua, etc. He has experience in handling four central statutory audit of nationalized banks: SBT, Syndicate Bank, Corporation Bank, and IOB. He has given lectures on bank audit in more than fifty branches of ICAI. He has also been the past chairperson of ICAI Calicut branch. he has been the past director of mercantile cooperative bank calicut sir it's an honor to have you among us sir thank you good morning <clears throat> in fact uh, i think uh, two years before it also i had come to trichur but the number of attendance was less so we had that in that small classroom so today i am happy that uh, we are all here assembled in the bigger one see we all know that uh, the reality of bank audit is fading out day by day because of various reasons as we all know the advent of computers have taken majority of the checkpoints in the banking reality likewise the banks are also asking the reserve bank of india as well as the regulators to reduce the number of branches to come under the audit because the data is available through the cbs at the head office itself except for the physical verification of documents everything is available at the fingertip from the cbs platform at the head office or any other place whatsoever so in this particular reality banks are also contesting and they are arguing themselves that why don't we dispense with the branch audit so that we will consolidate ourselves into the head of his audit alone so many banks have succeeded in convincing the regulators so in a phased manner because of the <coughs> icai involved and intervening in between they are only in a phased manner reducing the threshold or increasing the threshold so that the number of branches coming under the branch audit will come down anyway for us it is not the assignment which we look at it is a base of knowledge which we are going to chisel at every year end to understand the concepts and to fine tune our own knowledge 
in a better way so that we will be able to equip ourselves as a good branch auditor leave alone the <clears throat> audit statutory audit we have got plenty of opportunities in concurrent audit my good friend ravi the senior person in the profession will be able to tell you about concurrent audit because he is a doyen in the concurrent audit field accredited by the sarc as well as the chartered accountant fraternity so concurrent audits are becoming very very important <clears throat> when the statutory audit is fading out so i have been asked to discuss with you about the computerized audit under the computerized environment the practical aspects of the computerized environment has to be seen in depth as to how as a statutory auditor we are able to unearth the data and how we will be able to lay our hands on various data and the reports which is furnished to us for the purpose of signature if you go to the branch audit if you go for the pre audit they will say that sir everything is computerized you don't have to verify everything because everything is already done through the computer and we are also not verifying and it is all verified at the central office level you have to just come and sign that is the first statement he will tell you second statement he will say is that sir the system generated statements are being wet and it is already there embedded in the schematics of the system which is verified by the it auditors which is verified by the central auditors etc so your role in the statutory audit is only to put your signature ultimately he will end up in impliedly saying that we should all become the so called people who are very much a familiar in kerala and get the remuneration as nokuguli we all know about nokuguli i don't know how many of you know about nokuguli nokuguli is the specific identity of kerala where the loading and unloading workers will be looking at the load and if a tipper lorry comes and unloads the material they will get their part of the remuneration the tipper lorry is automated and it will unload it by itself they will just look at it and they will get their remuneration same way we have got uh, ducks in our uh, alpi area where the ducks uh, when they are brought in uh, big uh, uh, trucks we will two wooden planks will be put from the lorry to the down and the person standing there will be just putting a sound like this so with the sound the duck knows that it has to come down it will come down by its own row by row it will come down and this particular person who is standing at there will be getting the remuneration so that is called noku guli in kerala i i thought everybody will be knowing that so this is what is the way in which we are pushed to by the branch people saying that the computer has taken away all your job but in reality it is not the way idu varunnillallo presentation varunnado excuse me now what is happening is that we all know that the accuracy earlier in the earlier branch audit or any audit we were more concerned about the accuracy of the figures we used to find out whether the figures which are being given to us for the purpose of certification is accurate in all respects the calculation is correct and the modalities of bringing it to you for the purpose of certification is correct or not now that is to totally taken over by the system driven system generated documents where the accuracy is more relevant to understand 
from the logic in which it is being generated it is not the figurative accuracy or the calculation precision which is being looked into but the logic in which the particular statement or the report is generated and presented before you for the purpose of certification if you take the case of the general ledger balance and the balance sheet glb is the trial balance as you all know in a banking parlance glb is the trial balance but what is being asked to you for certification is the balance sheet so earlier we used to do an exercise of glb to the balance sheet we will find out whether all the figures in the glb has been properly classified in the balance sheet we will be verifying the arithmetical accuracy etc now that is not required because the computer takes care of the arithmetical accuracy part but my submission to you is that the grouping of the figures the grouping of the figures from the glb to your balance sheet is a very important criteria to be verified by the statutory auditors we may have savings bank account we may have current account we may have overdrafts we may have term loans we may have packing credits we may have bill discounted uh, loan portfolio so all this portfolio has been or will be given in various ledger heads in the glb and if you take the case of savings bank account the savings bank account will have nre sb your nr osb and so many other new products which has been devised by the bank so how it is being grouped for the purpose of the balance sheet is a very important task the logic how it is grouped the grouping of the glb figures to the balance sheet is the verification part which the auditor has to ensure we have time and again found that the debit balance in the current account and the credit balance alle uh, sorry that uh, the debit balance in the current account and the credit balance in the sb account this being net off in the system as per the balance sheet principles what we have learned uh, any debit balance has to be shown as an asset in the balance sheet separately as debit balances in sb account and it cannot be net off so likewise your credit balance in the od account also has to be shown as a deposit so this particular classification when it comes to the case of your uh, balance sheet preparation the schematic which is given to the computers may omit to do that and at the end of the day what will happen is that you will get only the net figure of your uh, savings bank account and the net figure of the uh, assets that is your loans which means that there is an understatement and overstatement in the balance sheet so what we have to do is that we will have to very clearly understand the logic behind how this particular balance sheet is prepared from the glb so the grouping of the figures there is a schematic which is available there is a working note which is available in the system itself so i would request you to kindly go through that particular working notes and the schematics for the purpose of your attestation of the balance sheet and profit and loss account same is the case with profit and loss account also so many expenditure will be clubbed together staff expenditure administrative expenditure so many expenditure will be clubbed together when it comes to the final profit and loss account so this final profit and loss account will contain a group of figures which is appearing in the glb so whether there is any grouping errors in respect of your classification of the expenditure is to be seen same is the case with your interest on deposits take the case of your fixed deposit interest fixed deposit interest as you all know is an expenditure to the bank and if you have taken a loan against the fixed deposit you all know that every bank will give you loan against their own fixed deposit when the loan against the fixed deposit is given 
we will be charging or the bankers will be charging 2% extra in respect of the public and 1% extra in respect of the staff and in certain cases they will confine themselves with special permission to charge 1% extra on the fd rates so now what happens is that the fixed deposit is now in the auto renewal mode the auto renewal mode so when you are going to make a fixed deposit for one year itself, they will get a mandate from you signed stating that it is in the auto renewal mode, which means that if at all you are not, or if you are forgetting to renew the fixed deposit, the system will take care and it will renew immediately for another term. So the auto renewal will happen according to the deposit rate available as on the end of the maturity date of this fixed deposit. So giving a classical example of a fixed deposit of 1 crore of rupees, wherein it is fetching an interest of 5.5%. And you have taken a loan of 90 lakhs of rupees out of the fixed deposit. And the loan interest rate will be 5.5 plus 1% or 2% as the case may be, maybe 6.5% or 7.5%. So your loan interest is your income and your deposit interest is your expenditure. So whether the expenditure is shown as expenditure and income is shown as ex income or whether only the net of figure is shown as income is a very, very important aspect. So in the computers, we have to bifurcate when the preparation according, according to the accounting standards and the preparation of the balance sheet, netting off of income and expenditure and netting off of assets and liabilities is not permitted. So from the signature point of view, we have to see whether the profit and loss account is prepared with the gross figure of the income in respect of the loan sanctioned against the fixed deposit and the interest paid to the fixed deposit as an expenditure. So this is also very important. Now comes to the case of your uh, fixed deposit auto renewal. Now your loan is 90 lakhs of rupees. You have taken this particular 1 crore at an interest rate of 5.5 percentage and the loan interest rate is 7.5 percent or 6.5 percent as the case may be. Now at the time when the auto renewal takes place, the interest rate is reduced from 5.5 percent to 4.75 percent. It is auto renewed. Whether correspondingly your loan interest rate is reduced or not. Because loan interest rate is pegged with the interest rate which we are getting for the fixed deposit. So time and again we have seen that the system will forget about reduction of the interest rates. And it will go on charging interest on the loan component against the fixed deposit at 7.5% or 6.5%. That is 2% plus 5.5%, the first interest which is given. So time and again we have seen... Uh, difficulty and discrepancy in respect of the interest on fixed deposits and the loan component which is taken against the fixed deposit. System errors are being identified and we have always commented on that. That is a major issue which is faced by some of the CBS platforms. Now the case of your premature closing of the fixed deposits. Premature closing of the fixed deposits as per the mandate of the banks. If I am going to make a deposit for one year and if I am going to close it after six months, that is 180 days, the system has to automatically calculate what is the interest rate for the six months and reduce 1% or 2% penal interest and interest has to be given only to the net of that particular figure for which period the deposit was current. Supposing I make a deposit on 1st April for one year, the tenure of my deposit is up to 31st March of the next year. I am going to close this deposit on 30th of September. So it has run only for six months. So my one year contracted interest rate for that fixed deposit may be 5.5%. Now what I have to do is that I will have to rework the interest for what should be or what should have been my interest for fixed deposit for 180 days. If it is 4.75%, then again I have to penalize. Huh. Oh, 
Oh, oh. Okay. So, <clears throat> two minutes. Huh? So, what is happening is that this particular interest rate, which is going to be applied, will not be adjusted or, or will not be corrected as per the auto renewal procedure, which is done by the system. That is another mistake which we find in the banking parlance. And I am speaking about the premature closure. When it comes to the premature closure, 182 days, we have to find out what is the interest rate had it been given on the original date, 280 days, and you have to have some PL charges on that, and you will be giving only 5%, I mean 5.5, if it is 4.75, minus 1% as, as per the bank policy, you will have to reduce the interest. What we have seen practically is that majority of the cases, the banks are the core banking solutions are not equipped to calculate the premature interest rates. So it is calculated manually. So any bulk deposit which has been prematurely closed at the year end or during the course of your audit or during the course of the financial year may be verified separately. Not all the deposits, bulk of the fixed deposits. Any bulk fixed deposits which is closed during the year prematurely and any bulk fixed deposit which is already having a loan parallelly against the deposit is also to be seen whether in between the maturity has come. So all these things will be available from a report. All these things are available from the handy reports which is available in all the platforms of the banks. As we all know, banks have got three platforms running as of today. That is the FlexCube, Finacle and the TCS banks. These are all the three softwares which is running in all the banking parlance and Reserve Bank of India, when the last merger came, made it very strict that all the banks should be coming under only these platforms in India. Any banks which is having its own software also has to migrate to either of these softwares. So, so many banks have migrated and now all the banks in India are under either of these three platforms. So, in all the three platforms, there is a report menu or the report option or the report software parallel to the operating software. There is a CBS operating software. Parallel to that, there is a reporting software. So the moment you go for the branch audit, you should be able to understand under what, in which, what you call your uh, uh, basic, your software, whether it is FlexCube, Pinnacle or TCS Packs. Once you get into the know of what is the software used, then you will have to understand what is the reporting platform of the corresponding software. So the reporting platform of the corresponding software may be all identical, but terminology may change. So you may have to ascertain with the bankers as to what is the terminology used for the reporting platform. Exceptional reporting platform, your operational reporting platform, day end reporting platform, there are a lot of reporting platforms available in the system itself. So you should get to know when you do a computerized audit, you should get to know of what is the software used and also what is the reporting platform available in the software for the purpose of generating your reports. This is a practical way that you have to start your audit. We will commence the audit once the inauguration is over. We will just, I have only just given an introduction about what is the importance of the computers and what is the way that we are carried away by the bankers in respect of doing an audit in the computerized environment. So uh, I think uh, uh, we can start the inaugural session. Immediately after the inaugural session, we will continue with the uh, presentation. Thank you.
ladies and gentlemen esteemed members and distinguished guests a very good morning to one and all it is with great pleasure that i welcome you to the seminar on bank branch audit hosted by the trishur branch of sarc of icai today we gather to delve into the intricate world of bank auditing a pivotal aspect of financial management our esteemed speakers are poised to share their expertise through engaging discussions and interactive sessions we aim to deepen our understanding of challenges and opportunities that lie ahead in bank branch auditing to start with let me invite dignitaries on to the dais i invite secretary of trishur branch of sarc of icai ca divya dharmarajan on to the dais next i invite chairman of trishur branch of sarc of icai ca anup v francis let me invite session speaker ca mani a sir on to the stage let me invite the next session speaker ca ravindran v on to the dais with great applause let's welcome our chief guest of the day shri k paul thomas md and ceo isaf small finance bank I invite C. A. Anup V. Francis, Chairman, Trishur Branch of S. A. R. C. of I. C. I. for the welcome address. Good morning, all. A very warm welcome to all distinguished guests and members gathered here. today for our bank audit seminar it's pleasure and a honor to have such a esteemed professionals and subject experts and a leading person from our banking industry today in our session as we embark in this seminar it's crucial to recognize the pivotal role that chartered accountants play in upholding the integrity and transparency of financial institutions our expertise and dedication ensure that banks operate with accountability and adhere to the regulatory standards thereby fostering trust within the financial sector today's seminar presents a unique opportunity for us to exchange insights strategies and best practices in bank auditing we will explore emerging trends regulatory updates and innovative approaches that shapes the landscape of financial auditing in the banking industry in an era marked by the rapid technology advancement and evolving regulatory frameworks like we are into a cbs uh, cbs based bank audit framework now the role of a chartered accountant in ensuring the robustness of bank audit cannot be overstated our attention to detail analytical powerness and adherence to the professional ethics are instrumental in safeguarding the financial well-being of the institutions and stakeholders alike so i'm entering into the official duty to welcome all the members and the dignitaries to the session over here i would like to welcome ca mani a the esteemed faculty from calicut who is here for us to for a detailed session and making knowledgeable on the cbs environment welcome sir i welcome see ravindran v sir who is first time taking the sessions on books and registers on the banking banking industry welcome sir we have a chief guest for the day like as we all know we are much privileged again one more company is listed and that is from banking industry and that is from trishur we have the Pres uh, precious moment with us after listing our poll sir is with us for the first time so i uh, we welcome you sir to the session all heartedly from icai on behalf of icai and personal name i welcome all the committee members and branch staff to the session and without your presence the bangodi seminar will not be successful i welcome each and every member 
present over here to the session of the bank audit. With these words, I'm just winding up. Jai ICI, Jai Hind. Thank you. Thank you, CA Anoop. I invite CA Ramesh K for introducing our esteemed chief guest, Shri K. Paul Thomas. A very warm good morning to all. I have the privilege to introduce today's chief guest, A. Paul Thomas, sir, to this seminar. Actually, he needs no introduction to the CA fraternity. Still, I will go on. A. Paul Thomas, sir, is the founder of ES, ESAF Group of Social Enterprises, which includes ESAF Small Finance Bank, he is currently the managing director and CEO of the bank. He founded ISAF as a non-profit society in 1992 by organizing neighborhood women into self-help groups. Under his leadership, ISAF has secured membership in several international organizations. Sri Paul is an avid supporter of sustainable development climate change, and democratic governance. To his recognition, achievement goes on and runs into pages, but cut short it, I will list a few. He is the recipient of SKOCH Award for Financial Inclusion and Karmaratna Award for Exemplary Contribution to Kerala Society. He was conferred the Entrepreneur of the Year Award by Thai Kerala, he was bestowed with the CEO with HR Orientation Award at World HRD Congress 2022. He has also won the Atal Pension Yojana Big Believers Award. He was the chairman of CII Kerala chapter and a board member of various institutions, including Microfinance Institution Network. He is also the co-chairman of Sadhan a Pan-India Association of Community Finance in India. With these few words, I warmly welcome Paul, sir, to this session as chief guest. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, CA Ramesh ji. I invite all the dignitaries on the dais and off the dais for lamp lighting ceremony. I also request all the senior members to join for lamp lighting. The lamp lighting ceremony symbolizes the illumination of knowledge and wisdom, marking the beginning of our journey towards enlightenment. As we light the lamp, let us also ignite the flames of inspiration and learning that will guide us throughout this auspicious occasion.
let me invite our esteemed chief guest, Sri K. Paul Thomas, for his inaugural address. Good morning, Chairman of uh, ICA Trishore Branch, uh, CA Anuvi Francis, Secretary CA Divya Dharmarajan, today's uh, session speakers, CA Mani, CA Ravindran, all the other uh, members of uh, CA fraternity from Trishore. Greetings to you all from the South Small Finance Bank. First of all, let me thank the management management committee of uh, the Trishur branch, specifically the past chair, chairman, uh, CA Ajit, for uh, inviting me and insisting me that uh, I should come today uh, to address this uh, gathering. So thank you, uh, Ajit. Thank you, Anoop, uh, and uh, all the members of the management committee for the for this invitation and it's a great privilege to be here uh, with the with the ca fraternity to interact uh, uh, with you all uh, <clears throat> the chartered accountants of uh, uh, chartered accountants play an important role in upholding the credibility of our country by way of ensuring the financial discipline through, the, through your attestation function. So together you have taken up the vital responsibility to ensure that the economic and financial system remains robust and healthy and is free from the evils of any malpractices. The profession is so noble that it is only the CA fraternity which is authorized to certify and issue an independent audit report to the effect that whether the Entries in account books reflects the true state of affairs and the results of operations and cash flow are free from material misstatements of an entity. So while discharging such noble professional duty, it embarks upon the need of and importance of independence and sharpening of professional competency on a continuous basis. So today the world is changing on a lightning speed. So whatever you have learned in the past become irrelevant in, to, uh, in today's. The risk appetite is changing, risk uh, 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 landscape is changing, business landscape is changing. So we have to be updated on everything, everything in the world. So maybe a few years ago, chartered accountants may have to be uh, informed or uh, uh, have knowledge about only the accounting function. But today, if you really wanted to do uh, your function effectively, you have to know everything in this world. So uh, the, the world is changing in, in that way. So the success of accountancy profession goes to a highest degree of understanding and evaluation of business risk. As I mentioned earlier, the landscape of uh, business risk is also changing. JP Morgan uh, today, uh, early this year, uh, announced a list of uh, risk uh, for the uh, year 2024 and climate risk stands top of it. The first risk they have identified uh, is the climate risk. The World Economic Forum also endorsed, uh, endorsed that the climate risk is one of the one of the topmost. A few years ago, we have been talking about climate risk, climate change, but we have not thought that it is, is not going to impact us. So today, uh, Bangalore is facing severe water shortage. Today's Malayalam newspapers also uh, talked about uh, Chimani Dam is drying, Pichi Dam is drying. So Trishur also we are going to face our coal fields uh, in the paddies getting ready for harvest. So mo mo many of the last couple, if you look into last couple of years, by the time the, uh, the paddy is ready to harvest, there will be a rain. There will be a summer rain. That means they lost the crop. So climate change is affecting, it is a reality. It is affecting our day-to-day -day life also. So RBI also recently, they issued a circular that uh, banks and financial institutions has to uh, disclose uh, on measure uh, 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 climate risk and also have to have a disclosure from next to financial onwards. That means auditors also have to 
understand about uh, climate uh, risk, uh, how to how to measure climate risk. We need to develop uh, new metrics uh, to uh, to measure the climate risk. So this uh, that's why so uh, continuous education, continuous learning is very very important. Not only in any profession, in any profession it is very very important. So I appreciate uh, the branch for organizing such continuous education program for the for for, uh, for its members. <clears throat> So our country has become a significant player in the world economy and has rapidly grown since the economic reform started way back in the early 90s. During and post-COVID uh, uh, pandemic, our country is surpassing the growth rate in a much faster pace than many other countries. So no other country in the world is growing at 7% uh, uh, today. And uh, when we travel uh, abroad, uh, the the response we are getting. So I have been traveling for the last 40 years, I've been traveling. So over the last couple of few years, I, 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 so when I say that if I go to for a conference, when I get an opportunity to introduce myself, when I say that I'm from India, immediately after that session, people come and meet us. What are the opposite? They, they appreciate the, the, uh, uh, the, the way India is changing, the way India is growing. So uh, uh, we all can we all can take uh, pride in that. <clears throat> so the speed at which uh, decisions are taken and projects are getting implemented, especially in the infrastructure development, is remarkable. Which will definitely support the dream dream goal of five trillion economy in the near term. The banking sector is the backbone of the Indian economy, and is rapidly changing due to technological innovation, financial liberalization, and uh, with the introduction of new products and services and geographical expansion. <clears throat> so we have seen landmark changes in the banking sector in the recent past, like consolidations, privatization, and emerging a new set of small finance banks and payment banks. Further expansion of NBFCs and other online lending platforms have also started emerging. So people used to ask these days, what is the future of banking? So I remember a few years ago, reform, uh, then uh, governor of uh, Reserve Bank, he said in one of, the, one of his speeches, he said, banking, banking will be there, but uh, I doubt whether banks will be there or not. So that, that, that is now happening. Um, you, you all know that a few years ago, embedded finance was only a theory. So today, embedded finance is a reality. What is embedded finance? Everyone today can, can offer uh, financial services. So banks' uh, uh, banks' uh, <coughs> exclusiveness of uh, offering financial services has gone. So today, a, um, um, uh, a grocery seller can offer banking services. Uh, um, you, you know, the technology companies are great players like Google, now people don't talk about uh, uh, even they don't even remember the, uh, which bank they are uh, transacting. They only knew uh, phone pay or Google pay. So you take Amazon, Google, any big tech companies, they are all into uh, financial services. So they are embedding. So the embedded finance is a reality. So that means anybody can offer embed uh, uh, financial services along with their services. So as a bank, we ISAF bank also from the Day when we day we launched, uh, we have understood this is going to be a reality. So we started partnership, partnering with uh, uh, these type of institutions. So today we have 35 uh, uh, business correspondents. There we are partnering with the uh, uh, institutions, cooperatives, milk cooperatives, producer cooperatives, agri agricultural producer cooperatives, other financial service providers, and we also agency banking is another. Uh, it was very popular in the Africa. In, by uh, in the uh, to, from 2014 to 2016 period, uh, countries like Kenya uh, took uh, leadership in uh, in the agency banking module. So we have also uh, adopted that model. So today we have uh, around 4,000 plus uh, uh, agents. So anybody can be anybody can offer a banking service. So considering the attrition in the banking industry, so I believe that in few, uh, a couple of few years. The, uh, the agency banking uh, will definitely uh, will take place. Uh, so that is another uh, change happening. 
in the future of banking which i am seeing so another uh, uh, area is uh, for a couple of uh, many years uh, uh, technology has become a very central part in, in banking so artificial intelligence artificial intelligence predictive analysis uh, these are all going to be take uh, very important uh, 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 roles in uh, whether it is credit sanctioning or uh, processing or customer service in all these areas technology is going to play an important Im Im important role so uh, as uh, auditors uh, you have to be aware about all these changes then only you will be able to do an effective uh, effective auditing of banks and bank branches and also to support the uh, support the management so at the same time tough regulatory actions are also seen against players to ensure the stability and protect the customers from uh, exploitation so uh, customer protection is the, one of the other key aspect the regulatory is looking into so whether the banks uh, are profitable or make but the customer protection is uh, going to be the the key so such stringent actions from the regulator are essential to ensure that the banking sector remains healthy safe and sound for ensuring the soundness of the banking sector one of the most important factors is the quality of various audit functions the banks are required to undergo and especially the statutory audit in order to strengthen the quality and ensuring the independence rbi has put more stringent conditions in selection rotation and availing services for other engagements from the statutory auditor this causes some inconvenience to both the bankers as well as the professional chartered accountants we find initially we find found it is very difficult every 3 years we have to find an uh, audit firm by the time it, it an auditor will audit firm will take at least one year to understand the business model by the time their time uh, will come to end so we have to start again so this this inconvenience is there but uh, we we have to compromise such a small inconvenience as considering the fact that the role of statutory auditors of banks is quite important in building a resilient banking sector the statutory audit of banks forms an integral and important part of ensuring the existence of the adequate control mechanism of the banking sector it also enhances the stakeholders confidence in the credibility of financial information provided by banks at a periodic interval the reserve bank of india the supervisory body comes up with uh, more and more guidelines to ensure the robustness in the financial service industry experiences from past mistakes are analyzed and more stringent checks are introduced to ensure that no such thing should be should get repeated credit risk and market risk are almost brought under control by way of transparency and robust appraisal and monitoring measures however operational and liquidity risk are yet to be stabilized and the current focus is in these lines regulator expects more and more from the audit fraternity to ensure that all the guidelines are properly complied by the bank in its day to day operations rbi also issued detailed instructions to the auditors on how to how to how do how the audit related certifications need to be conducted and what all are the deliverables auditors are required to be submitted to the rbi of late rbi has also started structured interactions with the central auditors regarding points to be focused more closely based on risk assessment almost every quarter there is there are interactions with the auditors uh, by the uh, uh, supervisory uh, officers of the ded uh, dedicated supervisory officers of uh, uh, of rbi so presently the regulator is mainly focusing on these following few areas one is robustness of implementation of know your customer norms kyc norms is assessment of kyc when you do the branch audit maybe today the most of the functions are centralized so branch level the major function at, at the branch uh, the auditor has to verify is the robustness of the kyc so kyc is very important robustness of the it systems including it general controls and automated controls third the compliance of corporate governance and oversight by top management fourth cyber security cyber security framework and the breaches and mitigation mechanism the level and automation of all important functions 
and the robustness of control. Controls around sanctioning of loans. So controls around monitoring of loans. Capital adequacy management. See, these are all the expectations of the uh, uh, regulator uh, uh, from the from the audit uh, fraternity. As the manage on the management side, banks have we the, the top management and the board of uh, directors also expect that uh, uh, the timely one is the timely completion of the audit. That's very very important, especially for a listed entities like us. It's very important. So we have to publish the result uh, by first week of uh, May every year. So uh, by, by April 25, 25th, the uh, balance sheet has to be uh, uh, prepared, completed. So the audit function has to be completed in, in April itself. That's very, very important for banks. And uh, uh, positive inputs and feedback for correcting the deficiency and, uh, and improve, the, improve the processes. So on a regular basis, so now audit, uh, even branch audit uh, is not happening uh, yearly once it is now spread across the year so on a regular basis uh, auditors are visiting the branches and completing the, uh, the, the the branch audits and giving third uh, is the giving inputs based on industry best practices so the management is expecting auditors have to share best practices with the so whatever you are learning from some of the some of the best practices in some other banks or other institutions uh, uh, can be shared with the management for improvement and uh, <clears throat> improve uh, advices uh, on uh, uh, on avenues uh, for improving improving profitability profitability and uh, the uh, recommendation on optimum use of resources so these are all the some of the expectation of the regulator and uh, some of the expectation of the uh, of the uh, management <clears throat> So statutory auditors of the banks are also required to submit an additional detailed report to the RBI called long form long form audit report, which is a detailed report on compliance of credit risk and related procedures, treasury operations, IT system, and scrutiny, capital adequacy, governance functions, etc. So accordingly, so I believe that the statutory auditors' major challenge is to assess the risk and design an appropriate audit plan and undertake adequate procedures to mitigate the same. In view of the risk involved in attestation by issuing a true and fair opinion based on the audit work performed, all such activities and documentation are also important. Unlike the traditional audit work of tick and tie and vouching approach, presently the auditors are expected to do the testing using an analytics audit tool, which can provide comfort on analyzing huge data. I think the... Uh, the uh, ICAI and the branch and the associations has to, every individual uh, chartered accountant may find it difficult to acquire such uh, tools and uh, uh, analytics expertise. Maybe uh, at a branch level, the association, you can think about setting up a common uh, tool uh, for uh, uh, all individual members use. You can think about that. So at the top management, including the board of directors, of directors of bank also expect the auditors to provide an overall impact of their findings and also value add in these in the systems and controls instead of getting a mere an audit opinion. Hence, I believe that auditors are also required to invest heavily in technology and also impact upskilling all those people who are engaged in bank audit to enhance the quality of the work they deliver to the organization. So I am happy to note that large attendance in this seminar is a positive step towards that. So I would like to uh, stop here as you are all here to update the knowledge level, listen to the uh, uh, experienced uh, uh, speakers. So I would like to appreciate the initiative of ICI Trishur, Trishur branch for organizing the CPE seminar, which is vital to update the knowledge of the chartered accountants to enhance their performance and also the initiative of, of the ICI to provide a detailed guidance note on bank audits, which provides guidance to the members on statutory audit of bank by incorporating recent updates, impact of amendments and changes in banking environment, which require attention of statutory auditors, such as master directions, circulars of RBI, relevant advisories, pronouncement of ICA, having bearing on bank audits and amendments, changes in applicable laws of laws or regulations. So I would like to once again congratulate 
all your efforts for being part of nation building and to help the banking industry in instilling the trust of the stakeholders. And you know that banking industry is totally working on trust. So the stakeholders trust, the depositors trust, the shareholders trust, the regulators, regulators trust is very, very important. And uh, only that, be, that can be proved by an audit certification. So, uh, so thanking all the managing committee members once again for uh, inviting me for this opportunity to meet and address uh, the uh, uh, CA fraternity of Trishul. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your insightful inaugural address and for shedding light on the pressing reality of climate change, our role as bank auditors and advancement in banking. Your remarks have truly resonated with us. As a gesture of appreciation, I kindly invite CA Anup V. Francis to present a memento to our esteemed chief guest, Sri K. Paul Thomas, whose gracious presence has enriched our gathering. I invite CA Divya Dharmarajan, Secretary, Trishur Branch of SARC of ICI, to deliver the vote of thanks. Good morning, everyone. On this special occasion, it is my privilege to extend our gratitude to our chief guest, Sri K. Paul Thomas, for gracing today's program and sharing his words of wisdom with our members. Thank you, sir. I extend my gratitude to our session speakers, CA Mani sir and CA Ravindran sir for accepting our invitation to share their expertise with our members. Thank you, sirs. I extend our gratitude to our chairman, CA Anup V. Francis for arranging one of the most important seminars of the year. Thank you, Anup. Next, I would like to thank our managing committee members and the branch for constantly supporting all branch activities. Thank you. Last but not the least, I thank all the members who have attended today's session. Thank you all. We will now resume our session. Good morning, friends. And uh, I'm, I'm Ravindran. Monisa is said to come. And just I want to share one information. Please keep your mobile alive you will be getting the allotment letter, allotment information from the banks. At least in vibration mode, don't switch off your mobile and please at least give importance for uh, one day or two days because those of us who have not got the audit, you will be getting the audit. You please keep your mobile alive. And also try to see your mail ID also. You'll be getting the mails from the banks. This is information I've got. So in a day or two, all adults will be over. Okay. Yeah. And uh, today's afternoon, I want to say the highlights of the session. I'm going to take up the first thing is books and registers. I've identified 67 registers that you have to look into the bank audit. 
and that covers not only stretch audit it is applicable for concurrent audit revenue audit stock audit fraud audit and all types of audits so don't miss the session so over to moni sir yes in fact uh, we had just started so coming back to the discussion we had earlier i respectfully recognize the presence of venugopal sir the dayan in bank audit i have seen him lot of days before traveling length and breadth throughout india taking classes and seminars all over the country so sorry sir so now <clears throat> the accuracy as i have told you earlier so the logic behind the generation of the statements and the reports which is given to you for the attestation is more important in the computerized environment than looking into the accuracy part of it so i have given you certain examples as to what is the way that we should be approaching this particular logic verification now coming to the important aspect which the reserve bank of india is also very keen about is the integrity of the granular data we all know that when we studied computers the most important three legs of a computer data is confidentiality integrity and availability cia that is a principle that we have studied so confidentiality is to be ensured through the physical controls logical controls firewalls etc integrity of the data is a very very vast terminology where we have to ensure that the data which is given by the computers are correct are not false or misleading and it is not having any intervention in between so whatever we are doing in the computerized environment we may be given a particular type of schematics and the program in the software and the data flow in the software but wherever there is a manual intervention in between the computers will go only by the commands which is given as per the manual intervention so here comes the importance of the granular data in the banking audit so in the bank audit scenario what is a granular data a granular data is nothing but the data which is given to the computers at the time of creation of the master of an account there is a master for everything when you open an account there is a master so the master creation is the base of the granular data your name your address everything is all your static database we call it and once you finish the static database you have to have a loan database or loan master or you should have a deposit master where you will give the main parameters of how the computer has to work on supposing that if you are going to write the interest take the case that today interest rate are pegged with the mclr so if a loan account is sanctioned 2% plus mclr the mclr is a figure which is evolved out of the asset liability management of the bank as a whole alm i should know what is my uh, advances what is my deposits what is my loanable funds what is my cost of funds what is the net interest margin i should receive at the macro level then i will fix my mclr that is the minimum lending rate so this lending rate is fixed upon that the bankers will say that 2% plus mclr is the interest rate for this particular loan so if the mclr at the time of sanction of the loan is 10.5% and 2% on the top of the mclr the loan is to be charged 12.5% as per the arithmetical calculation now if the master is going to be fed at 12.5% 
again it will take mclr plus 12.5% why because the master is fed in such a way that the mclr is always a static figure which the cbs has to have an impact on the master at the time of interface of charging the interest in the accounts so if you again go through the schematics of how the cbs is charging the interest what will happen is that the interest program will be run from the head office level and it will interface with the master residing at the branches so the master is going to determine what is the interest to be charged to this particular account so now the importance of the master is that if the master is wrong your interest is also wrong we have done a practical exercise of totally taking the interest rates charged by a bank at the central office level in various buckets so bucket wise interest analysis is possible not at the branch level but at the central level but you you will get an interest rate master at the branch level where you will be able to export it into excel and take a bucket wise interest rate analysis bucket wise interest rate analysis is nothing but we will be putting the entire interest charged on the deposits as well as the advances on various buckets as 0 to 3% 3% to 6% 6 to 9% 9 to 12% etc etc so if you get the interest master and if you are able to transfer it to excel and classify it into various buckets you will find that the important bucket that is the most cardinal bucket is lying between 3% to 5% in the case of deposits as well as 10% to 12% in the case of deposits so that may be changing i am just giving an example so you will be able to identify which is the major rate of interest which is charged on the accounts if it is predominantly an agricultural credit bank a bank which is doing agricultural credit the agricultural credit will have a subvention it will have some subsidies from the government and it will have a reduced reduced rate of interest so from the bucket wise analysis you will be able to understand if you are able to analytically verify the predominance of the business of the branch versus what is the bucket wise interest analysis you will be able to know whether there is any aberration in the charging of the interest you know that the food credit it is not maybe not coming in our uh, trichur side food credit is the credit which is given to the food corporation of india by the ministry of agriculture sanctioned at the higher level food credits will be interest of the food credits will be parked in some of the accounts and it will have a very very lesser interest rate so what will happen is that the mass at the time of master creation there are certain loans interest where the interest is charged at the head of his level food credit interest is charged at the head of his level so what will happen is that this 0% interest will attract only to those loans or by mistake if the master is created in such a way that you are going to charge interest at 0% in set of the loans we have found that many a time the master creation will have some clerical error with which the entire reports which is generated from the system goes wrong so the granular data has lot of other parameters also take the case of your interest rest interest rate rest is that in the case of a fixed deposit and in the case of a loan every month interest is being charged there are certain types of loans which is agricultural loans where the interest is charged on a quarterly basis or on a half yearly basis there are cases where the interest is charged after becoming overdue it is charged on a daily basis in the case of staff loans staff housing loans interest is charged only after the principal is totally recouped so the interest rest is also fed in the master so the interest rest fed in the master is wrong what will happen the application of the interest and the debit of the interest in that account will well also get wrong so there are lot of aspects which is to be covered in the creation of the master so what i would request you is that if you go back to the branch audit reality we have been asked to identify those loans which are above 10% or 10 crores whichever is higher in respect of selecting the transaction audit of the loan accounts at the branch level 
as per the latest lfir in 2021 what we have to do is that we will have to analyze what is the total fund based advances plus non fund based advances of that particular branch calculate 10% and the 10% if it is 6 crores of rupees every account which is 6 crores and above has to be individually verified and reserve bank also very clearly said that it is not the individual verification which is expected you have to do a transaction audit transaction audit which means that for that particular account you will have to go deep into each and every transaction and see whether the transaction is in line with the business of the client as well as whether there is any aberration in respect of the delinquency or potential threat to the bank as a lender in the conduct of the account so we have to analyze the conduct of the account so that is why they said that in respect of those accounts where it is specifically to be selected by you you will have to do a transaction audit i will just reiterate for you 10% of the fund based and non fund based advances has to be individually verified or 10 crores whichever is less supposing your advances of the branch is 120 crores and your non fund based advance is 10 crores your total non fund based plus non fund based is 130 crores 10% of that is 13 crores so your benchmark is 10 crores whichever is higher so every loan which is about 10 crores has to be verified by you on the contrary if your branch has got only a loan size of 45 crores plus 10 crores non fund based your total advances is fund based plus non fund based is 55 crores 10% is 5.5 crores which are is less that means every account which is more than 5.5 crores has to be individually verified and a transaction audit has to be conducted in that account when you do the when you are expected to do, do the transaction audit i would request you to kindly go to the master of that particular accounts in the computer see whether the master which is created at the computer is in tandem with the sanction terms and the sanction order ticket which is given for that particular loan the sanction may have lot of conditions the penal interest condition if the stock statements are not given within such and such date penal interest has to be charged likewise if the drawing power is coming down on a particular month the penal interest has to be charged likewise if the renewal is not happening a penal interest is to be charged so all these things will be and sometimes in some cases the stock statement will be waived in the sanction itself in those cases if you are going to create 2% additional interest if for not filing stock statement that is wrong because it is not in ten with the in line with the sanction terms so the sanction term has to be corroborated with the master creation so master creation again i am telling you that is the granular data which is going to interface with the cbs platform and to do all the operation at the branch level and the figures at the branch level in respect of the interest charged and the interest on deposits as well as interest on loan is going to be only on the basis of the master data so reserve bank of india has very clearly said that the auditors have to lay their hands on the granular data so the granular importance of the granular data has to be understood and we should visit the master created and again the importance is that it is not that the master created at the time of sanction alone any modification further into the master also has to be verified so master modification supposing on 31st of march or 25th of march when you go to the particular account you find that it is a potential npa you are going for pre audit at the time of pre audit you have marked a particular account selected a particular account which shows old incipient weakness and you find that this is going to be a potential npa for the purpose of your uh, year end audit and when you go by april at the year end for the year end audit you find that the account is not finding a place in the npa statement maybe because the master is modified with some initial holiday or you can also hold flag d flag lot of options are there in the master d flagging is totally restricted by the reserve bank of india but d flagging is possible in the master even now d flagging is a system wherein a master can be d flagged that it will not be taken for the purpose of your generation of the npa statement it will that database will not be considered any database can be deflagged at the branch level it is totally restricted by the rbi 
RBI says that deflagging cannot be happening. But we will be able to identify and understand how deflagging, whether any deflagging has been done at the branch level, we will discuss about it. There are a lot of analytical checks which you can put in through the output audit as well as the system audit where we will be able to identify, analyze and understand whether there is any deflagging has done or not. There is a master modification report available. Whenever a master modification is happening, there is a procedure, there is an SOP in the banking system. So whether the SOP has been properly followed in respect of modification of the master, especially with respect to the interest rate, especially with respect to the EMI, especially with respect to the term. Again, Reserve Bank of India has said that your enlargement of the term has to be only with the prior consent of the borrower, which means that earlier my interest rate was 6%, now it is made 6.5%. The EMI will be the same. Only thing is that my term will be elongated. That was the previous practice. Now it is restricted by the RBI. RBI said that it has to be done only with the prior permission of the borrower. So, so many checks and balances have been brought in by the RBI also in the process. So the granular data is very important. There is a specific circular given by the Reserve Bank of India on the verification of the granular data, which is residing in the master at the branch level as well as at the CBS platform. Now the same data is used by different people in different platforms. You know that the annual financial inspection of the banks is conducted soon after the branch audit is completed and the central audit is completed at the central level. When the AFI is conducted, nowadays Reserve Bank of India is directly interacting with the branch auditors. They are directly interacting with the branch auditors to say whether this particular loan account has been properly verified by you or not. In the case of Kingfisher account, at least seven auditors were called directly by the Reserve Bank of India to summon, to be summoned to the Mumbai office of the Reserve Bank of India to ensure that whether the provisioning of the Kingfisher was done at that point of time earlier. Branch auditors. All Mumbai, Madras, Bangalore branch auditors were summoned to Mumbai by the Reserve Bank of India only for the purpose of ensuring that the particular Kingfisher account provisioning was properly made or not. So it is not that earlier whatever we have done at the branch level is over at the branch level. So gone are the days where your database, your verification, your accounts and everything can be verified at the central level also. It can be verified from the RBI also. So our verification has to be so thoroughly examined and thoroughly deeply going into the details of what is the requisition. As I told you earlier, your individual verification of the accounts has to be perfectly verified. Those accounts which are insisted upon to be selected and verified individually for transaction audit has to, have be, has to be verified thoroughly to ensure that tomorrow if the RBI is going to call you, you may have to answer with the working papers available. The working papers are important and the documentation is also very important. So what I suggest to you is that for those loan accounts which I have told you earlier, which you have to select at the branch level, please visit the master created at the branch level at the time of sanction, further at the time of renewal, further at the time of the financial year 2023-24, any modifications. All these three aspects have to be verified. And if the master is going to have any impact on the revenue or the interest charging or the EMI or the term of the loan or the security value of the loan, all these things have to be very clearly understood. There are cases, practical cases where the master will be fed with the value of the security. Value of the security will be for collateral securities for land which is given by the customer or the borrower. And after some time, what will happen is that the loan will be reduced or there are cases where, exceptional cases where the collateral security will be released by the bankers upon reduction of the loan or by substitution of another collateral. There are cases where the collateral will be released. So when the collaterals are released, there is a difference in the valuation of the earlier collateral and the present collateral. So this is going to be very important for the purpose of your system generated NPA statement and the provision calculation. The value of the security is going to be very important. So if your updation of the value of the security or the master creation or the master is not updated to the value of the security, 
then your system generated npa statements and the provisioning there on will be wrong we all know that we we have uh, uh, learned about the gigo what is gigo in the computer parlance it is the garbage in garbage out if you are feeding a wrong data into the system then what is what you if you are going to feed a wrong data into the system then what you get is also a wrong data so if you feed garbage into the system system will give you only garbage that is called garbage in garbage out that is the fundamental system of a computer so computer does not have the logical uh, brain to think about the qualitative aspects of the figures which you are going to fit into the system so now <clears throat> coming to the system generated npa statement very important point to be discussed in the bank audit earlier we used to verify the accuracy of the figures we used to verify the tracing of the figures we used to verify individual ledger accounts with the system and npa statement prepared by the banks so it was in excel it was manual then it became excel now it is totally automated and the reserve bank of india has very clearly said that from 2022 onwards all this npa statement should be system generated there should not be any manual intervention but what you have to understand at the practical parlance is that there are lot of fields which will have an impact and a bearing on the integrity of the data which is given to you in the form of the system generated npa statement a system generated npa statement will be given to you and the branch manager will say that sir everything is taken care of by the system you just sign you don't have to do anything on this but the, here is the way here is the start start smooth point of our audit if you take the system generated npa statement as i have told you earlier the master data which is going to be the base for the preparation of the system generated npa statement will have an impact will have a bearing the master data can drive leverage the final provisioning of the branch through the system generated npa statement the major data which is more important for the purpose of the npa statement is the date of npa what is date of npa you should be clearly understanding the concept of date of npa npa as so as you all know npa is a non performing asset whether there is overdue or out of order all these things we have already known so now what is more important is that the date of npa the reserve bank of india very clearly said that npa date is not the date in which it is going to be identified by the bank NPA date is a process in which when it crosses this particular 90 days it automatically has to be classified as an NPA it need not necessarily be that at the month end only i should classify it as NPA or at the quarter end only i should classify it as NPA or only on the 15th i should classify it as NPA there is no definite dates NPA date is a running date where at any point of time when it reaches as an out of order category at the end of the 90th day automatically that particular date is the npa date so if you find that the system generated npa statement has got all identical dates as month end or quarter end as npa dates then it is a wrong statement so the npa date we have seen that the npa date bank has a wrong notion that the generation of the npa statement they will be taking only the month end figure so when it is generated at the month end the npa will also be recognized that the month end which is wrong if the account is going to be out of order on 15th of this month on the 15th day it is npa it is not the 31st of the day so if your npa statement given to you has given all the dates as the identical common dates at month end or year end or week end or fortnightly end or friday end or you were uh, quarterly end then it is a wrong npa statement because your npa dates are not captured by the system properly so npa date is very important so th those accounts where you are again going to lay your hands in respect of the insisted 10 crores or 10% you will have to go back to find out whether the npa dates are properly being recognized in the accounts or not if the npa dates are not recognized your income recognition income reversal provisioning everything will get changed your classification from da1 to da2 da2 to da3 substantive to da1 
all these things will change if the NPA date is changed. You know that there is a natural migration process in respect of classification and identification of NPA. If an account is going to be continuously out of order for 90 days, it is becoming an NPA on the day at all, with day end process when it is having. That is why very specifically, Reserve Bank said that it is a process of the day end which has to identify the NPA, which means that when the day end process happens on any day, 365 days, or on the days since the bank is working, when the day end process is working, you will have to also identify from the system through the system what is the NPA as at the day end. So every day end process, you will have to identify the NPA. That is what I told you earlier that if your system data statement give you identical dates of month end or year end or quarter end, it is wrong. Same is the case with your uh, NPA. Again, what I am telling you is that the date of NPA has to be seen very cleverly. And also, you have to see the value. Value as on the NPA date. Value as on the NPA date, we all know that when an account is recognized as NPA, a portion of the interest which is not I mean, uh, received or which is not collected has to be de-recognized. As per the income recognition norms, the interest which has not been collected so far has to be reversed. So what is the reversal process which has been done? When the NPA identification takes place, whether the reversal also is taking place simultaneously. So most of the cases, what we have seen is that the reversal entries are being not properly made by the system or manually to correct this particular process wherein the reversal of the income is not correct. When the reversal of the income is not correct, the value of the NPA is not correct. I will say that I have got an account of 60 lakhs of rupees, which is going to be an NPA. When I identify this account as an NPA, as per the Reserve Bank of India norms, income recognition norms, I have to re reverse 2 lakhs of interest which is debited last quarter, which is not realized. So what is my value of the account? When I am going to de-recognize de this particular amount, my value of the account is 58 lakhs. And 2 lakhs is go not going to be recognized and it is going to be reversed. So my NPA value is going to be 58 lakhs. And 2 lakhs will be there in the mirror account, which will not be known to the customer. For the purpose of your balance sheet, your life, I mean, asset is only 58 lakhs of rupees, not 60 lakhs of rupees and 2 lakhs income. So your property loss account is going to be reversed by 2 lakhs of rupees and vis-a-vis -vis your advance account is also going to be reversed by 2 lakhs of rupees. So the, re the reversal of the interest has to be properly taken care of by passing the accounting entries with respect to see that the value of the NPA is correct. So whenever there is a new NPA identified, we will have to ensure that the recognition, de-recognition of the interest, which is not realized as on the date of calculate, as on the date of identifying it as NPA is properly passed in the books of account. And that has properly been configured for the purpose of reduction in the value of the NPA. Now the value of security. The value of security is another important data which is going to have a bearing impact on the system generated NPA statement. I will give you a classic example where you are given a system generated NPA statement and it is for the purchase of a car or a machinery, any depreciable asset for that matter. So the loan is given for against a depreciable asset. And at the time of purchase of the car, I purchased the car for 1.1 crores rupees, Mercedes. And the master has been created properly that the value of the security is 1.1 crores. Loan is dispersed up to 85%, margin is brought, everything is goody goody. After two years, you find that the account is showing some incipient weakness or the account is identified as an NP at the end of the third year. And you know that the income has to be recognized, your value of the NPA, debt of the NPA, everything has been properly done. Now for the purpose of your provisioning, the value of the security is very important. Value of the security has got much relevance uh, with respect to the provisioning as well as even classification also. If you go to the master circular 4.2.9, paragraph 4.2.9, very clearly says that it need not necessarily be that the 
downgradation of the account from standard to substandard and substandard to doubtful has to be on a periodical basis it can go direct downgradation also direct downgradation is also insisted wherever the erosion in the value of the security is more than 50% on the day of identification of the account as npa if the erosion in the value of the security is more than 50% it need not be substandard it has to be directly downgraded to doubtful assets that is 4.2.9 so master circular usually comes on 1st july every year but this year it has come on 14 2023 itself so 14 2023 master circular is the base for the statutory audit for 2023 24 So you may all visit this particular RBI site and get know of the RBI circular as on one four two thousand twenty three, wherein for paragraph number four point two point nine of that circular gives you that the NPA classification need not be on a periodical basis and natural migration need not happen. You can directly downgrade the accounts also. So it says that at the on the on on identification of the NPA. or at any de future date if you find that the erosion in the value of the security is more than 50% it has to be directly downgraded to doubt plus assets likewise if the erosion in the value of the security is more than 10, 90% if the erosion in the value of the security is more than 90% it has to be directly downgraded to loss assets so if the security value at the time of sanction of the loan is 1 crore of rupees and your security value or the erosion in the value of the security is 90% or it is come down to 9 lakhs of rupees or less than 10 lakhs of rupees then it need not be residing for the first 12 months as substandard then in da1 then in da2 then in da3 you will have to directly downgrade it to loss assets so that is the direct downgrading so what is more important is that the value of security has got a very important bearing in respect of the provisioning as well as the even the classification of the account so whether it is to be classified as substandard whether it is to be classified as da1 da2 da3 or loss asset is also depending on the npa date again npa date is natural migration and second is value of the security has got a bearing on the provisioning as well as the direct downgrading principle also so now again coming to the value of security your mercedes car after 4 years the master will have the same value of 1 crore of rupees when it comes to the matter of making the provisions the system do not know whether it is 3 year old mercedes car or 5 year old mercedes car etc system will be capturing only the data of the security value as given in the master at 1 crore of rupees will the provisioning be correct for a depreciable asset we have all learned that the value of the security has to be reckoned as on the date of the balance sheet so as on the date of the balance sheet you have to identify the value of that particular security and on the basis of that you will have to apply the checks and balances in respect of provisioning take the case that the drawing power very important we all know that in the case of a cash credit account and in the case of any working capital limits the drawing power is very important what is drawing power is the calculated figure of the eligible amount which could be drawn on the basis of the paid primary security of that particular this is the definition of drawing power the calculated figure of the eligible loan amount which is a percentage of the primary security which should be paid primary security again so all these things are very important so drawing power is calculated from the base of what is your stock statement primary security is stock and debtors or your current assets that for that matter so you may be furnishing a stock statement so you will have to analyze what is the stock figure on the stock figure you will have to reduce what is the direct and indirect finance which is given to that particular stock creditors has to be reduced non moving stock has to be reduced obsolete stock has to be reduced and you will have to identify what is the moving stock which is paid portion so paid portion 
bankers will say that i will have to i will finance 75% you have to put in a margin of 25% so reducing that margin as per the sanction you will know what is the drawing power of that particular account so if your drawing power calculated as per the stock statement is 7.5 lakhs and if your limit sanction is 10 lakhs the eligible amount of loan is restricted to 7.5 lakhs because your drawing power is only 7.5 lakhs and this drawing power is a running figure it will qualitatively change according to the change in the stock change in the pattern of your creditors change in the pattern of your financing change in the pattern of your accounting so you will have to feed the drawing power on a periodic basis to the master on the basis of the stock statement furnished you will have to periodically change this master otherwise what will happen you will have a static stock is it correct that the current assets are static in a business no so which means that your security value in respect of those assets which is calculated on the basis of drawing power has to be updated in the master as on 31st march what is a stock what is a debtors what is a drawing power and whether this particular drawing power has been properly updated in the master so that the system is going to interface and calculate the provisioning accordingly correctly accurately so can you say that the system generated nba statement is correct can you directly sign the system generated nba statement without verifying this aspect this is what question you have to ask the manager can you give me a certificate in return that all the drawing power has been updated properly all the stock statement has been received on march 31st 100% it will be no because practically it cannot be possible that stock statement will be received for all the accounts on 31st march again going back to the reserve bank of india circular it says that in the case of consortium accounts you can take 3 months time because there is a lot of in information sharing which is to happen between the consortium member banks as well as the multiple member banks so in order to in the case of large accounts where it is a consortium the leader of the consortium has to calculate the dp on a monthly basis and it will be pushed to the member banks on a periodical basis so it may take some periodical procedural periodical time so it says that up to 3 months you can go the same parallel and same analogy we will adopt for other accounts also and if the stock statement is older than more older than 3 months i am going to audit for january i mean 31st march 24 and april when i go if the stock statements are not furnished for march 24 i can even go up to the december or i can as of january or february stock statement i can take and i can calculate the dp that is permitted not directly permitted because of the analogy which is framed from the consortium accounts practically we can take a call on that but if it is not fed into the system properly if the drawing power is not fed into the system properly periodically if it is not updated whether the system will calculate the npa and the provisioning correctly so there is a possibility that the drawing power is got a vital importance in respect of your identity i mean provisioning as well as the value of the security so the value of the security is to be properly analyzed understood what is the value of the security whether it is an asset whether it is a stock whether it is sundry debtors and the updation of the value of the security has got a total bearing on the integrity of the data which is given in the form of the npa and system generated npa statement which you are going to sign which the manager will say you don't have to look into anything so this is what is the verification process which you have to do in respect of the system generated npa statement next coming in the case of your customer id you all know that in the computer parlance and reading that computer am the parlance with the reserve bank of india norms of uh, prudential uh, circulars what it says is that the identification of the non performing asset has to be borrower wise borrower wise which means that if i have got three loans one is a car loan another is a housing loan another is a cash credit account if my cash credit account becomes nba all the three accounts have to be uh, reckoned as npa for the purpose of your classification so it is borrower wise so when it is borrower wise how does the system identify that a particular borrower has three accounts how does the system identify that the particular borrower has five accounts five loan accounts it is on the basis of the cust id or the customer id 
so the customer id is given at the time of you being after your kyc updation is done now kyc has gone beyond our uh, inaugural speech the, he said that kyc has to be verified now it is K, not kyc it is kycc no your customers customer it is it has been extended to kycc that is customers customer if you go to the bank also when you discuss about the transaction auditor you will have to know about the business of the customers customer your customer is bank and you have to know the profile and the customers business that is whether the borrower is running a petrol pump whether he is a contractor whether he is a gold jeweler whether he is an industrialist whether he is an sme whether he is an msme so it is not confined that you should know what is a customer you should also know the profile and the business uh, uh, prospects and the business potentiality of the customer of the bank who is a customer's customer so kycc is the present uh, norms for the purpose of your branch audit so now coming to the uh, customer id what happens is that the cust id may not be synchronized borrower wise so if you look at if you look at if you take balakrishnan as a borrower or balakrishnan company as a borrower if balakrishnan company is a proprietary concern the individual loan account of balakrishnan is also a borrower wise if balakrishnan company is a private limited company and balakrishnan as a director has taken a loan then this is two loans because there are two entities you are all with me balakrishnan as an individual is a proprietary concern and balakrishnan and company proprietary concern is to be reckoned in line with the personal loan of balakrishnan also because it is all one person whereas if balakrishnan company is a private limited company and the director balakrishnan has taken a personal loan of 10 lakhs of rupees these are two customer id has to be there because two entities so you have to analyze critically whether the customer id has been given properly or not cust id has to be evaluated the process of giving cust id and the process of giving customer id is to be seen and if you go to the system generated npa statement you can see you can see the id of the the loan account number will have first four digits only to identify the customer so the customer id will be the same for the first four or the first two will be Uh, uh, giving you the indicator of your term loan or whatever it is second two will be the customer uh, 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 name or customer id id so you will have to go through the schematics of the number of the loan account if you go to the number of the loan account you can bisect that and find out which is standing for what so the customer id has to be properly verified to ensure that whether the customer id at the time of creation of the master is properly being given for the purpose of generation of the npa statement at the year end and all the loan accounts of a particular borrower according to the requirement of the npa norms and the legal parlance is properly configured for the purpose of generation of the npa statements now coming to the optimization of the value of the security optimization of value of security is very important in the npa npa statements supposing that i have got four loans again coming back to the earlier example one cap one cc account one car loan account and one housing loan account my cc account is reckoned on the basis of the primary security value that is the stock statement or the debtor statement which i am furnishing which is to be updated on a regular basis in the case of my car i it is to be depreciated and the returned on value has to be given as a value of security year on year basis in the case of a house we have to give the value as per the valuation prescribed as per the norms of the reserve bank of india if it is above 5 crores it has to be valued every 3 years otherwise it is to be valued by the branch itself on a yearly basis year on year basis and if there is any deterioration in the value it has to be properly updated in the master now almost your house value will be static for at least 3 years so house value is taken at 1 crore of rupees your depreciable asset value is taken at 60 lakhs of rupees as per your stock your stock statement your drawing power is taken as 40 lakhs of rupees so 40 plus 50 plus 1 crore is 1 crore 90 lakhs is the total asset base for the purpose of your valuation of the security your total asset base is 1.9 crores 
and you have seen that the identification and the provisioning has to be applied on a borrower basis. So when I take this system generated NBA statement in the security value, I will write or the system will write all loans are backed by a security of 1.9 crores, 1.9 crores, 1.9 crores, 1.9 crores. Actually 1.9 crores is the aggregate value of all the securities together. So it is not 1.9 crores for CC account and it is not 1.9 crores for housing loan alone. So what you have to do is that you will have to take the aggregate. So now 1.9 crores into 4, <coughs> 7.6 is your total value of the security. As per the system generated NBA statement, your total value of the security will be 7.6 crores and your total value of outstanding will be X amount. And if you take the provisioning norms, it will be wrong because you are calculating the security value four times. So that is called optimization of security. So what is the amount of security value for the CC account has to be taken for the CC account. What is the amount of security value for the housing loan account has to be taken for the housing loan account. And what is the security value for the housing loan has to be take house has to be taken for the housing loan account or you can take all the loan accounts balances together and the total value of security. So the total outstanding exposure versus the total value of the security is to be reckoned for the purpose of your system generated NPS statement. We have seen that time and again, the system will adopt the total value of the security in each account without optimizing the value of the security, which will end up in a wrong system generated NPS statement and the provisioning thereof. So we have to be analyzing whether these type of data errors have corrupt into the system. The integrity of the reports which is furnished to you can go wrong in these type of data errors or integrity of the data. Now coming to the up, up, uh, updating of the drawing power, I have told you, updation of the drawing power has to be periodically done. If it is not updated up to 31st March, at least 31st March, uh, at least it should have been updated to 31st, uh, uh, 28th of February. So now again, the practical aspect which we are going to face this year is that I think 27, 28, 29, 30, 31 for so four days or five days holidays now. Year end. So I don't know how banks are going to recover the loan overdues. Usually loan overdues will be recorded only on 31st March. Saying that our audit is there, your account is going to become NPA, etc., etc. So there will be a lot of problems faced by the auditors in respect of the post balance sheet date recovery. There will be recovery on 1st April, there will be recovery on 2nd April because of the 4 days holiday, 4 or 5 days holiday is there. I think 5 day holiday is there. Up to 31st, Saturday, Sunday, 28th, when some, uh, yeah, our uh, Easter is coming. I, uh, I have not analyzed it properly, but there are around 4 to 5 days uh, holiday. Which means that your working day is going to be over by 25th or 26th. So your recovery will be post uh, 1st, 31st. So you have to know what we have to do with the post recovery. Post recovery, that is if the amount is overdue as on 31st March or 25th March at 3 crores of rupees and if the overdue amount is paid and this account is account is classified as an NPA. I am giving you a practical example where we are all going to face this particular problem in the branch audit. Because of these particular holidays, the borrower will be hammered by the banks from February onwards to remit the money. And because of this four days holiday, he will remit on 1st of April or 2nd of April or 3rd of April. Before you go for audit, it will be remitted. What is the stance we have to take in respect of the post balance sheet date recovery made by the banks? Time and again, there is a lot of pressure on the branch auditors to reclassify the account which is classified by the system as not an NPA because recovery has come on 1st April. They will say so many re reasons. To reclassify, they will ask you to pass an MOC stating that this is not an NPA because recovery has come on 1st April, 2nd April, 3rd April, or 4th April. We are bound by the mandate of the Reserve Bank of India Circular. Reserve Bank of India Circular very clearly says that in respect of the post balance sheet date recovery, the branch auditor can take a call only if the account is totally closed. Supposing that on 25th, your account is an NPA and the total balance is 10,75,765 rupees. 
and on 1st april if the borrower comes and pays 1075706 rupees the account is totally closed in those cases we can take a leave it does not say that you should take a leave but you can take a leave otherwise we have no say in the post balance sheet date recovery it will be decided at the central office level at the central statutory audit level there will be a central statutory auditors meeting and the board of board of directors meeting who will take care of this particular post recovery considering all the practical aspects they will get the ratification and the approval of the reserve bank of india and they will give the cut off date and which will be also be given in the notes forming parts of accounts it is not the branch auditors cup of tea as per branch auditors are concerned we are bound by the reserve bank of india circular and we are not concerned about the post balance sheet date recovery now again for the purpose of upgradation of a non performing asset for the purpose of upgradation of a non performing asset as on 31st march when you go to the branch the branch system should have or would have properly classified this account as npa and the overdues supposing that is a term loan account 6 months emi is overdue the borrower is remitting 6 months emi or 3 months emi because 90 days is the norm so he is remitting 3 months emi and the branch says that sir overdue portion has already been remitted by him why can't you reclassify it as a performing asset so upgradation of the npa is again spelled out in the reserve bank of india circular which says that upgradation of the npa can be possible only if the entire overdues of interest and installment is paid which means that if 6 months installment and interest is due all the 6 months interest and installment has to be paid that to not post balance sheet date prior to balance sheet date then only you will be able to remove it from the npa statement so the upgradation of the npa is again spelled out so we will decide we will discuss about it when we will uh, discuss about the npa movement report which is going to be signed by us there is an npa movement certificate which we have to set, we are we are certifying in the branch audit so the drawing power updation then the initial holiday take the case of the housing loans or any other project loans when we are sanctioning itself there will be a initial holiday we will be giving an initial holiday of 6 months we will be giving an initial holiday of 3 months we will be giving an initial holiday of 1 year according to the date of commencement of commercial operation as per the project report the sanction terms itself will contain contain that there will be some initial holiday in respect of repayment of loan so this initial holiday is very important for the purpose of your identification of the account as npa by the system if i am going to give the initial holiday as 6 months instead of 3 months your npa identification by the computer will happen only after 6 months because initial holiday in my master is given as 6 months so if it is going to be again modified from 3 months to 6 months i can also leverage on my npa at the year ends because your system generated npa statement again is based on the master creation and the master says that initially you have got a holiday of 6 months or 9 months or it is corrected to 12 months what will happen your npa date is going to be procrastinated so when the npa date is going to be procrastinated your npa statement will also get wrong so your initial holiday is very important you have to see what is the initial holiday if any given so that particular account for the purpose of remittance back interest will be applied regularly but holiday of repayment will be given after 3 months or 6 months whether there is any leverage which has been done by the branches in respect of modification of the initial holiday that is also very important now yes atms you know that nowadays the business is totally cashless cashless business is happening in the banking parlance in the case of atms there are two types of verification process which is to be done at the branch audit level one is a non site atm other is an off site atm an on site atm is an atm which is directly connected to the branch where the balance of the atm will be appearing in the balance sheet of the branch books so it will have cash balance atm balance 
but off site atms are atms which are not connected to the branch it will be connected to the central hub of the bank so in respect of those atms which are connected directly to the branch in the vicinity of the branch nearby the branch or in front of the branch it will be connected to the branch it is called an on site atm and the balance of cash in the atm on the of the on site atm is forming part of your general ledger and the profit balance sheet which you are going to certify in respect of atm balances which are not on or online on on site it is called off site atm which may be of the bank itself but the branch has nothing to do with that it is controlled by the central hub so you will have to identify when you go to the branch whether the balance sheet has got atm balance or not if atm balance is there it means that there is an on site atm working where the branch is directly connected it is an extended teller machine which is being kept outside the branch or near vicinity where i am going to load my own branch cash into it and any customer can take it so this atm cash balance has to be verified by us so atm cash balance there is a scroll which is to be generated as on 31st march day and you have to take a scroll and that scroll has to be kept for the purpose of audit that is the sop given to the branches so when you go for pre audit itself you will have to insist the branch people to take the scroll of the atm cash balance as on 31st march to reconcile it with the balance as per the glb as on 31st march but the day and time may differ atm is 24 7 24 by 7 whereas the bank day and the closes on 31st march by 8 o'clock or 8:30 or so so you will have to have some differences and that differences may be the timing differences which you have to reconcile so in respect of off site atms the entire money is controlled by the atm hub and you don't have to do anything and it is not forming part of your certified balance sheet at the branch level and it is a big uh, technology which we have to discuss in length i may not get time for that now electronic fund transfers you know that rtgs nft so in, re in respect of those rtgs nft accounts you will have to see whether there is any account parked in the rtgs rejection or nft rejection nft rejection and rts rtgs rejection will happen it is a normal process where if the if the interface between the real time gross settlement platform is not happening with the bank platform some of the rtgs will be rejected it will go back to the base branch itself if your base branch or if your branch in which you are auditing has got any rejection from the rtgs as credit or debit or whatsoever that is to be properly adjusted through an moc into the borrower account or the depositors account because it is forming part of your supposing that on 31st of march you are receiving an rtgs of 50 lakhs of rupees and this rtgs is hit hitting your account and going back it is rejected so it will not be appearing in the branch at all because it is all coming at the rtgs platform itself on the contrary if you are going to send an amount of 50 lakhs of rupees and if it is rejected it will come back to the base branch and it will lie as a rtgs rejection account in the base branch account which means that those rtgs rejection if any parked in any ledger accounts has to be properly configured for the purpose of redrafting the deposit balances or advance balances very important so in the case of your nft or rtgs you will have to ensure as that as on 31st march there is no rejection of rtgs or nft at the fag end of the day or at the day end and if there is any amount parked in the rtgs rejection that has to be properly considered for the purpose of redrafting the account balances of accounts uh, loan accounts or the deposit accounts so that your balance sheet is going to give the correct true and fair view now the trust areas i told you that the master creation this is a very important point that the accounts which you are going to verify you will have to see the master creation and individually and in the case of other accounts again going back to the lfar what it says is that in respect of those accounts which is to be specifically verified by you 
that is 10 crores, 10 percent, etc., etc. In respect of other accounts, you will have to verify the process. In the case of those accounts which is to be specifically verified, if it is a transaction audit which is specified, in respect of those accounts or the branch, what it says is that you have to do a process audit. So those process audit, in the course of the process audit, you will have to identify whether who is creating the master, who is approving the master, whether the maker checker principle in the computer system is properly being embedded for the purpose of creation as well as approval of the master, whether the modification of the master is properly documented, whether the modification of the master is properly authorized. All these things are the questions which you have to ask to the branch manager and the process in which it is being done and whether the SOP is properly being followed with respect to all these things has to be analyzed. And if you find any aberration, then you'll have to go deep into it to find out whether there is any mistake in the data which is furnished to you. Now, sanction terms. There will be a lot of sanction conditions, sanction terms which will be given in the sanction letter itself. It will say that if the stock statement is not submitted within 15 days, 2% penalty. If the renewal is not happening within 3 months, 2% penal interest. All these things are forming a part of your sanction terms. So your master creation and the sanction terms have to be verified. Since some of these loan products itself, the stock statement will be totally waived. So in those cases, you have to see whether the waiver of the stock statement and the penal interest clause is already there. That means it is wrong. So the sanction terms has to be properly aligned with the creation of the master. Because master is going to drive the system in future. Now master modification, I have already told you. Standing instructions. Many a cases we find that the housing loans taken by the non-resident in Indians will become NPA. Housing loans taken by the non-resident Indians becoming NPA. This poor fellow would have parked a huge amount in the SP account and he would have given a mandate, standing instruction of transfer of this money from the SP account to the loan account on a periodical basis. The standing instruction would not have been followed by the bank. So when the standing instruction is not properly automated and not properly fed into the master, what will happen? The loan installments will not be coming into the housing loan and the housing loan will be categorized as a non-performing asset. So at the end of the day, after six months, the branch manager will find that, oh, this account is going to be like this. All the six months interest immediately, he will put it there. Then unnecessarily, the penal interest will come for deferment of payment of EMI. So these type of standing instruction has to be fed into the master. So when you find that a terminal loan account is paid in bulk, and if the terminal loan account is of a potential good customer, where there cannot be any incipient weakness, then you'll have to see whether there is any standing instruction and whether the standing instruction is properly followed or not. There are a lot of consumer cases which is lying with the Reserve Bank of India as well as the Consumer Forum as well as the Banking Ombudsman only on this account because I have mandated to transfer my EMI from my SB account on a monthly basis but the bank has not done. Now my account has become NBA, my credit rating has come down or my loans are not being sanctioned by other banks because this bank account is NBA. Like that, lot of questions are being raised and customers are going to the ombudsman, to the consumer forum for this particular updation of the master and the NBA. It is not going to be a branch affair. It is going to be beyond that. Now, data flow and missing controls. This is what I told you, deflagging. The missing controls will come whenever there is a manual intervention, there is a missing control. If your manual interventions are not properly authorized, there is a missing control. If the SOPs in respect to the manual intervention are not properly followed, there is a missing one. There is a possibility that when the core is going to apply interest, the core is going to apply interest, as I told you earlier, the interest application software will be run at the CBS platform on a batch-to-batch -batch basis. Because the Server capacity at the central office may not be sufficient to cover the entire loan accounts of the entire branch or entire SP account or entire FD account. So what they will do is that they will select the zones or they will select batch. It is a batch processing methodology. So when they are going to process batch-wise batch, what will happen is that the batch will be run 
at various times. It will be run at the CBS platform from 7 o'clock in the night to 10 o'clock or 10 o'clock in the night to 1 o'clock or 1 o'clock in because that is working 24 by 7 at the central office. So when it is going to be working from there, what will happen is that the day end process of the branch would have been complete. And after the day end process of the branch is totally complete in respect of all the batches coming in that particular zone, they will run this program. As I told you earlier, this CBS application software will interface with the branch books in respect of the balance as well as the other parameters which is fed into the system. And interest will be applied in all the accounts and it will bind up by itself. But at the end of the day, there will be some interface issues, there will be some telecommunication issues, there will be some other issues which would have led to omission of charging interest in certain accounts. It happens. When the interest program is run out of 1,50,000 accounts or out of 15 lakhs accounts, around 4 or 5 accounts or 15 accounts will be omitted to be charged interest. It happens because of the telecommunication issues or because of the uh, what do you call your bandwidth issues. Lot of issues are there because it is all remote processed. So there is a platform in the computer software itself that after the interest program is run, immediately the branch has to take a, a report from the CBS, which is called the interest failure check report. There is a report called the interest failure check report. So the interest failure check report has to be generated by the branches on a regular basis after every interest run from the CBS is happening. So you will have to ensure that the interest failure check report is generated at the branch. And if there is any data in the interest failure check report will give you which is the loan where it has omitted to debit the interest and you will have to do it manually or you will have to get the approval and you'll tell it or it will be covered in the next run of this particular thing. So as on ideally as on 31st March, your interest failure check report should give a report saying that no data, no data available. So the report should be generated and you should be forming part of your working note or working papers because it is going to ensure that system wise you have charged all the interest and the system says that there is no interest which is to be applied on any of the accounts. So this interest failure check report, some of the banks have given instruction that on a manual basis you have to pass a voucher and you have to take the interest. Some of the banks have said that the interest run will be covered in the next run of the interest with other batches. Some of the banks have got a system wherein all these interest failure check report will be monitored at the central office level and only for that accounts a separate run will be done. So there are a lot of systems which is happening in the bank itself to make the entire system foolproof. But our duty as the auditor is to see that the SOP and the controls in respect of the interest application and the generation of this exceptional report of interest failure check report is properly done at the branch level and it's properly dealt with at the branch level. So you have to generate the interest failure check report and ensure that the data in the interest failure check report is zero. And if there is any data, you will have to analyze how it has been properly compensated at the branch level. Now <clears throat> the authorization and authentication issues. Lot of places where the branches will have a foreign exchange platform. The branches will have an Indian rupee platform. Take the case of a foreign exchange branch. You will have packing credit in dollars. You will have packing credit in uh, uh, yen. You will pa have packing credit in uh, dirhams. You will have Indian rupee accounts. But the bill or the packing credit will be given in dollar terms, PCFC. That is called foreign currency packing credit. FCTL is there, foreign currency term loan. So these are all denominated in foreign currency, but it is reflected as Indian currency. So what happens is that in respect of these type of denomination and the exchange rate changes, there is an authorization process which is in the branch. So it is to be authorized from the central office as to what is the exchange rate that you have to adopt for the purpose of doing this particular exchange verification or exchange transformation from dollar to Indian rupee or N to Indian rupee or GBP to Indian rupee. Take the case of a non-resident external account where your GBP fixed deposit is coming. 
So when the GBP fixed deposit is coming, what is being done by the branch is that the GBP will be given immediately to the foreign treasury, and the foreign treasury will give you the rate at which it is to be transformed into Indian rupees, and you will transform it into Indian rupees, and the account will be opened, and it will be in the Indian rupees in respect of the foreign currency accounts, and a revaluation is taking place on a yearly basis for the purpose of balance sheet, which is not to be concerned at the branch level. But there are certain SOPs to be followed. There are certain procedures to be followed in the system, in respect of accepting or transacting, doing any foreign exchange business. So these type of authorization and SOP, in respect of the computerized environment, has to be verified by the auditor. Now physical and logical controls. Logical control and physical control. You know, I will give you a classic example of a branch where we have visited in Dulia. Dulia. Dulia is in uh, some other in uh, Orissa or somewhere. I don't know the place even today. The bankers have taken me from Calcutta to that place through some uh, six hours travel by train from there a taxi. So Dulia branch of Punjab National Bank. We went to the branch. The branch is a big branch. But what has happened is that the branch met with a fire accident on twentieth of March. The entire branch premises is set fire. So what they have done is that as an immediate measure, they have hired two car sheds near that particular branch, and they have shipped all the computers, everything, into that particular uh, place, and they were operating from there. The IT team and everybody came, and it is all from that particular uh, nearby, what do you call your car shed? It is operating. We found that. The core nodes, which are having access to the core, is totally loose ended at the branch level. So I can go to the branch because it is a small shed. I can sit in a computer and I can do anything because the node is open. I can pass vouchers. I can do anything if I have got the computer open. So there are a lot of staff shortages also there. So there are exceptional situations where even if you go to the branch as per the SOP in the computer system, you cannot take a copy of the uh, output unless otherwise there is a permission to you to do that. Access privileges are to be there. So if you want to take generate an account copy, if you go to the branch, every branch you will find a particular computer, a dumb terminal outside where the customer can go, he can update his passbook, he can see his balances, etc., etc. Think of a situation that this dumb terminal is given with the operational privilege. Very dangerous. So these type of controls are there in the branches. We have seen that some many of the nodes, which are connected to the CBS, are open. <coughs> Likewise, <coughs> <coughs> some of the branches will also resort to application softwares for the purpose of calculation of interest. For the purpose of verification of interest, they will have their own application softwares in their system. That is not permitted. So, if you just go through the menu option of the systems which is prevalent in the banks, you find that there are a lot of application softwares, small small application softwares which is running, which is not permitted under the CBS environment. It should be reported by the branch auditor. Now, coming to the routing accounts. We all know that under the general ideal situation of a CBS platform, what is more important is that the inter-branch account should be zero because all are one bank. You are not dealing with the branch; you are dealing with the bank as a whole. If I have got three thousand branches, all the three thousand branches are one. As far as the customer is concerned, as far as the bank is concerned, at the end of the day, whatever transaction do you do. Between the branches should not be reflecting as an inter-branch item. There is no inter-branch item in CBS. That is the advantage of CBS. But if you look at the balance sheet, if you look at the balance sheet of the branch, if you look at the general ledger balance of the bank, if you look at the profit and loss account and balance sheet which you are going to certify, there will be a figure called head office account. It will be a huge figure, running to 2,355 crores, etc. The moment you say, ask anything about that, the branch manager will say that these are all taken care of by CBS. But you are certifying that. 
so ideally the cbs at the end of the day your this balance and the other bank balance everything should be zero which will be taken care of by the central level but at the branch level when you are going to certify the branch balance sheet will you be able to ignore this 2576 crores debits in the general account or in the cbs account or in the cbs general account or in the head office account you will have to do a disclaimer this disclaimer is not being done by any of the branch auditors because it is a huge figure which you don't have any say or you don't have any any verification methodology because ideally it has to be zero you know that it should be zero it has to be zero but in your branch the balance sheet it is 2500 crores debit will you be able to omit that 2500 crores debit as a figure it is material so this particular disclaimer has to be given in respect of those routing accounts routing accounts are accounts only for the purpose of your day end and for the purpose of routing they will be holding this particular account in the branch books but ideally and by and large 99.9% it will be settled at the head office level so head office there is a cbs platform which is working on this on a regular basis after the day end of all the branches are over they will permit you to log out only when all these reconciliation process is over that is the regular process of the branch there will be some entries which they will make it for the next day and they will identify that on the next day and it will be cleared but even then as a branch auditor we don't have any verification procedures or we will not be able to get a proper idea about what is this figure so the routing accounts have to be disclaimed now again <clears throat> software issues during the year we will have to identify whether there was any cbs issues during the year as per my understanding there are around four or five times our rpgs platform has failed for more than 2 3 days so when the rpgs platform fail what will happen is that your entire transaction transfers everything will be failing for the 3 days or 4 days so in the lfir you have been asked to report for any other exceptional items you will have to get a report from the branch manager whether there is any system failure of that particular bank during this particular year or not if it is not there well and good now again the black box and the white box approach we have seen that when we have studied the computers we have seen that the auditing around the computer auditing through the computer and auditing with the computer these are all the three things black box approach white box approach so when we are going to only verify the output we should also be verifying the integrity of the input that is what we were discussing from the beginning itself so whenever you are given an output i would request you to please go to the schematics of how the input integrity is ensured at the branch level at least in those reports where you are going to certify you are going to certify n number of statements n number of uh, uh, reports balance sheet of course profit and loss account is there then you are going to certify a restructured accounts you are going to certify a npa movement uh, report you are going to certify a gosh kila gosh committee report gilani committee report so many certifications are there in the process of your branch audit so what you have to ensure is that these certifications are properly being taken care of with the system generated reports and the figures which are given and the basic fault is that the verified data only is attested it may be looking very funny but we have seen that branch balance sheet signed by the branch auditors coming to the central office and everything is punched together all the branch balance sheet profit and loss account everything is punched together it is coming as a bunch to the central office level we find that the balance sheet is of the previous year signed by the auditor balance sheet signed by the auditor is of the previous year it happens and it has happened and it is happening so more importantly before you render your signature it's a very practical low level practical way in which a, because when i say that it may look very funny but it happens 
because some clerk is going to print out at the fag end of the day at 6 o'clock or 7 o'clock when you are going to hurry to go back to uh, your next branch after finishing the attestation they will bring some papers and you will sign that paper without knowing whether it is 2016 2017 or 2022 all all these things look like and number of copies taken seven copies are to be signed by you you will have to ensure that all the seven copies are of 2034 24 itself so these are all small small things which you may have to interest one of your assistants to verify whether to see that your attestation is the system or the gen you would have already verified one portion of the statement your system generated nps statement you would have verified one but what is coming to you for attestation should be the same thing so at the time at the end of the day when you get it is printed out from the system and brought to you for signature you will have to have some checks and balances to ensure that whatever is verified is only coming for your signature time and again auditors inadvertently has committed mistakes in this area because they will be signing the report which is generated at the branch at the end of the day but actually your verified report will be something else it may not be the mistake of the branch or it may not be advertent but it may be inadvertent and it may be leading to great mistakes now again <clears throat> going to the branch you have to get an audit module enabled the audit module is nothing but it will have a read access to the entire platform of the software you will have to have an entire platform of the software activated for your audit purpose most of the time what will happen is that the concurrent auditors module will be given to the auditors or some of the officer will say that you use my user id and password i would say that as a matter of abundant precaution and safety never ever try to attempt to do that your audit module has to be activated before you work on to the software very important second is that the audit menu the audit menu if you go to the audit menu there is an audit as i told you earlier we have got a operating platform in the software we have got a reporting platform in the software and the reporting platform there is an audit menu so there is an audit menu embedded in the cbs platform itself there are lot of reports which is very important and which is very handy for the purpose of doing our statutory audit one is an early warning signal report an ews report is an is available in the audit menu or the audit module of the reporting platform which is called the early warning signal report so if you generate this any warning signal report you will be able to get to the accounts which are going to be having potential threat in respect of the recovery accounts which are having incipient weaknesses so if you generate this ews report as on 1st january then 1st february 1st march and 31st march you will know the difference which are all the accounts figuring out in 1st january which is not figuring out in february which is figuring out in february which is not figuring out in march which is figuring out in march which is not figuring out in your final audit if you look at the movement of this particular accounts you will find that some of the accounts would have been taken out or some of the accounts would have been added all these things are a critical analysis for you to verify further into the individual accounts so how to if you are going to go to a branch and if you are having around 10000 accounts how will you be able to pick and choose those accounts this is the exceptional method you will have to use this is one of the exceptional methods you will be able to use where you will have the early warning signal report and you will have the npa report and everything is already there so there are lot of audit module reports which are available as per the, which is designed as per the customized design is there every bank will have its own uh, uh, way in which it is to be projected then the validity of the system generator ir i have already discussed now the interface issues i told you the foreign exchange platform and the indian rupee platform the sop and the authorization procedure in respect of the transformation of the foreign currency in the indian rupee and indian rupee to foreign currency has to be properly ensured it is not that you have to going deep into the accuracy part of it you will have to only go to the <coughs> schematic and the uh, process flow now read the menu options you have to read menu options are there every system will have a menu option so when you go to the branch you will have to ask your senior assistant or you yourself can sit under the menu options and find out what are the operational commands which is available in the system 
and vis a vis what are the ways that the reports can be generated from the operational as well as the report platform which is going to be handy for you for the purpose of selecting the accounts which are going to be verifiable by you or verified by you now flag the menus applicable to audit yes no about the software other than that is what i told you there are a lot of small small application softwares which is used by the branch for their convenience which is not permitted if you look at the computer system if you look at the screen that is the window of the computer system you will have some application softwares in that which is not actually permitted by the reserve bank of india every branch has to function all operations through the cbs only so if there is any such system that is to be reported in the lfar as well as in the audit report now coming to very important exceptional reports as i told you earlier these reports are going to be very important for the purpose of your audit and this is going to give you a lot of inputs there is a platform called exceptional reporting platform the exceptional reports are operational exceptional reports day and exceptional reports and audit exception reports exceptional reports you know it is a management by exception wherever there is an abrasion wherever anything is going out of the track it will come into the figure of the exceptional reports so exceptional reports are lean marked reports so if you take this particular report called the lean marked report you will get to know which are all the accounts where the fixed deposit is marked with lean so fd loans i told you earlier beginning fd loans how will you be able to identify the fd loans how do we be able to identify the loans which are closed during the period so if you take the lean marked report you will get the total amount of fds which are marked lean for the purpose of granting loan or otherwise also fd can be pledged for the purpose of obtaining your bank guarantee fd can be pledged as collateral security so all these things will come in the lean mark report and from that you would have to identify which are all the loans which is coming from the fd major loan accounts you have to pick and choose and find out this is the lean mark report then transfer scroll we all know that the reserve bank of india has very clearly said that the process of evergreening evergreening they have used the word evergreening that means that you cannot procrastinate the mba or you will not be able to cover up the nba or you will not be able to give some additional loans to protect the account from becoming an nba it is all restricted because if you find that an additional loan is sanctioned by the bank for the purpose of repayment of the overdues of any other account you have a cc account of 10 crores of rupees you have a term loan account of 3 crores of rupees where there are four five installments pending to be paid in the term loan account branch manager what he says is that sir you are always eligible for a temporary overdraft you take a temporary overdraft on 28th of march and use the temporary overdraft for the purpose of clearing this overdues the term loan overdues are cleared and the nba the term loan is coming out of nba vis a vis i mean uh, i mean uh, uh, consequently your cc account is also coming out of nba so this is a process of evergreen so any further sanction of loan for the purpose of circumventing the provisions of the nba is called the process of evergreen so any loans which is going to be given like that you are transfer from the fd account to the loan account loan account to the fd account even without the knowledge of the borrower certain branches will transfer the amount from their deposit account to loan account and loan account to deposit account to see that window dressing we all see we have seen about window dressing how do you understand that in the computer platform there is a transfer scroll at the day end process there is a transfer scroll so if you take the transfer scroll as on 31st march 2024 you will know or 25th march 26th march 27th march you take the transfer scroll of all these days you will know which are all the inter account transfers which has taken place so that whether it is going to be used for the purpose of evergreening or for the purpose of circumventing the provisions of the prudential norms so all these transfers may be used it may be genuine also so you have to see the credentials of those transfers if there is a bulk transfer of 3 crores of rupees 4 crores of rupees going to a potential np account and making it a performing asset as on the year end then this transfer scroll will be a leading uh, eye for you for the purpose of identification of those transfers which is going to be used for the purpose of evergreen 
Now coming to the SMA reports. Again, the Reserve Bank of India has very clearly said that every bank should report the delinquency of the loan accounts into a common platform called the Special Mention Account Platform. It is a common platform which is controlled and managed by the Reserve Bank of India. This is in the computerized environment. If you go to a branch, you will be able to generate this SMA report at any date. On any date, you can generate the SMA report. So please insist for the SMA report. SMA report as on January, SMA report as on February, and SMA report as on March, and even you can generate the SMA report as on April first week. Take these four SMA reports, you will get the no of the special mention accounts. Again, SMA reports are not one. There are three SMA reports. Three SMA report is SMA zero, SMA one, and SMA two. SMA zero is a report of special mention accounts where the delinquency of repayment of installment of interest is from zero to thirty days. If there is any delinquency of the repayment of interest or installment from zero to thirty days, that account will figure out automatically from the CBS platform in the SMA zero report. In the case of those accounts where the delinquency is between thirty-one days and sixty days, then it will be a figuring out in SMA one report. So if you take the SMA one report, the that will figure out all the accounts which is having a delinquency between thirty one days to sixty days. And again, SMA two is a report which has got a delinquency between sixty one days to ninety days. So from sixty one days to ninety days, if there is any delinquency. that will be reported in the sma2 report so now going back to the discussion we had earlier i told you that you will have to generate the sma reports for january february and march so if an account is potentially npa and is showing all the irregularities and delinquent this account which is finding a place in january in sma0 has to be naturally migrated to sma1 in february and sma2 in march and npa in april is it right same way if you go by the reverse order if you find that an account is finding a place in sma2 in february and it is not a finding a, it is not finding a place in april and it is not finding a place in the npa statement in march it means that it is upgraded am i right you are going by the progressive order of the sma where sma0 will naturally have a migration to sma1 and sma2 and npa if you go by the reverse order an account which is going to be sma2 in february if it is not finding a place in the npa statement as on april or march 31st it means that this account is either upgraded or it is regularized am i right so you will be able to get now of those accounts which is regularized at the end of the year regularized during the month of the march now coming to the test of check whether the regularization is by additional facility granted by the bank regularization is by a genuine credit that is what reserve bank of india says every regularization of the account has to be through a genuine credit what is genuine credit a genuine credit should not be an additional facility sanctioned by the same branch a genuine credit should not be this uh, uh, loan sanctioned by the or additional facility sanctioned by this bank because of the cbs platform i can have a loan sanctioned in mumbai and coming to my uh, trichur branch so additional facility should not be sanctioned at the branch level or at the branch level bank level but if an additional facility is sanctioned by another bank you should know the difference evergreening the definition of evergreening says that 
an additional facility granted by the branch or the bank not any other bank okay so any other bank is their prerogative their auditors will take care of that for me funds are coming from another bank so my branch and my bank is my domain of activity to verify whether there is a process of ever greeting or not and to identify whether this particular credit is a genuine credit or not take the case of a check discounted on 28th of march check discounting can happen and your credit proceeds are credited to the account and the account is brought a cc account which is having a limit of 10 crores of rupees for 90 days it is continuously going above 10 crores of rupees on 28th of march i am purchasing a check of 2 crores of rupees and crediting this proceeds to that and your cc account is coming down and it is going to be not out of order as on 31st march because there is no continuous lapse so this check is counting and on april 7th when you go for audit you find that the check is dishonored and again the account is going to be back which means that there is a process of evergreening so these type of evergreening process could be very well understood by the verification of the sma0 sma1 sma2 reports on the progressive order and on the reverse order you put it in the excel you don't have to do anything you trans you export this sma0 sma1 and sma2 to the excel platform and you can do any reverse order calculation or progressive calculation and you will be able to pick and chick choose you i think your uh, expert youngsters are here who will be able to do it so from the excel platform you will be able to filter out all those uh, data and you will be able to identify what are the exceptional figures so please verify sma reports which is very important now coming to the tcs there is a tcs report which is coming under 194n there is a you know about 194n any cash withdrawals above a particular limit will be attracting tcs by the banking system itself so if a particular borrower is having large cash withdrawals or cash deposits 194n is attracted so you will have to verify whether this 194n if a customer is having large cash transactions that is a incipient weakness when you go to the go to the transaction audit what it says is that when you do the transaction audit you will have to see and synchronize with the business model of the customer as i told you earlier the transaction audit has to be done in line with the business model of the customer that is why kycc if you are a petrol pump the business model of the petrol pump is that i am getting the sale proceeds by liquid cash or credit card in piece meal 2 liters 1 liter 50 liters 10 liters 5 liters and my deposit of cash will be always there if you look at my bank passbook i will have deposit of cash huge cash and on the other side my withdrawals will be payment bulk payment to my petroleum company it may be rtgs or neft or whatever it is so if you look at this particular account statement itself if you do a transaction audit you find that it has to be in sync with the business model of the customer if it is not syncing with the business model of the customer and if you find that instead of going or instead of sending neft and rtgs to the petroleum company on 15th he is withdrawing some cash and on 28th again depositing his cash and that is there is a diversion of funds so that is what is transaction audit on the contrary if there is a contractor in the case of a contractor's account if he is doing a government contract what will happen his income or his receipt will be bulk amount as per the passing of the bill government the bill or pwd or whatever it is you will be getting 70 lakhs of rupees 80 lakhs of rupees as bulk credit but your outflow will be paying of wages paying of salary paying of consumables etc etc so this is the transaction audit which you are expected to do likewise if the check dishonor is there frequent check dishonor is an incipient weakness in the account which you have to verify that is also a part of the transaction audit if you find that every month there is an installment going to another nbfc nbfc manapuram finance or your muthur finance huge amount is going on a month on month basis or your bens 
Tata has got financing services. If you purchase a car, Tata Finance is there. So if money is going to Tata Finance, BHFL, Divan Housing Loan. So all these things, if it is meticulously going through post-dated checks, it is a diversion of fund from the business. So these type of incipient weakness has to be identified by browsing through the account which is expected from the uh, auditors in the LFAR. Because only those accounts where you are specifically to verify the 10 crores and 10% which I have told you earlier. So you have to do a transaction audit. 194N comes in that. Now information sharing in respect of multiple bank. In the case of large accounts, you find that there will be either a consortium arrangement or a multiple banking arrangement. In respect of multiple banking arrangement, the Reserve Bank of India has insisted that there should be a monthly information sharing platform between the banks involved in the multiple bank. If three banks, that is Catholic Syrian Bank and your South Indian Bank and Federal Bank, are financing the same customer, it is called a multiple banking arrangement. It is not consortium. Consortium will have a leader. Where all the banks will come under one platform, there are a lot of other parameters and procedures to be followed in respect of consortium. But in respect of your multiple banking, each bank is independent. So bank is independent, but the finance is given to one single borrower. So in respect of the multiple banking arrangement, the Reserve Bank of India has stipulated the information sharing, which means that every month I have to share the information of the conduct of the account with me to other member banks. Likewise, vice versa, they also have to share it with me. This is a very, very important document in the hand of the auditor for the purpose of analyzing whether the contact of the account is proper in your bank or in other banks also. There is a potential threat. Sometimes I may be operating my account in my branch very good, but in other, other bank I may be very bad, which means that there is a potential threat which may reflect on me tomorrow. A good customer will be a good customer in all the three banks. If I am holding a good uh, transaction in one branch, it need not necessarily mean that I am a good person. Because in the other branch, I may have a lot of uh, overdues. I would not have paid properly or I would not have uh, paid the Tom loan installments or I would have taken a lot of TODs from there. A lot of bills would have been crystallized there. So these are all incipient weakness which is to be shared by the member in the multiple bank, which will have uh, an indication about your verification of the account of the base branch. So wherever you find that there is a multiple banking arrangement and if the information sharing is not coming from the other banks, it is very much required that you should insist for that and you will verify what is the potential threat of your branch account vis-a-vis -vis considering the operations of the other bank account. Now, in the case of parameter changed modified report, there is a modification, that is master modification report I told you. So there is a report available in the system, CBS platform, in respect of the modification of any parameters, whatever it is. If at all you are going to change the address, if at all you are going to, if you go to your GST site, you have got two platforms. One is your core platform as well as non-core. If you are going to change any database of your GST registration in the non-core platform, you don't have to require any any permission. But in the case of core platform, you will have to inform the GST officer and then only you will be able to change the core platform. Likewise, here also, there is a report which will give you the core changes which has happened in the master and in the non-core changes. Maybe the phone number change, mobile number change. All these things will be reported. But it may be a non-core change which may not have much importance for you. So, this parameter change report is very important. And if you take the parameter changes as on 25th March or on the month of March, you will find out that if the interest rate is changed, if the EMI is changed, if the initial holiday is changed, all these things are going to impact your system generated NPS statement. So the parameter change report has to be obtained and verified. Cash drawings in excess of 10 lakhs, again, you have got an LFR questionnaire. System generation, upkeep, maintenance, filing of the attestation. So these are all only operational administrative factors. Now coming to the exceptional reports in the advanced portfolio. Exceptional reports in the advanced portfolio in all the three platforms, FlexCube, Finacle and TCS banks, you have got an account statistics report. Account statistics report 
is a report of the total number of accounts borrower wise coming under term loan coming under cc coming under car loan coming under housing loan etc so that is used for the purpose of your mis in the banking system where they will have to report the number of car loans and the total amount of car loans number of housing loans total number of housing loans total amount of housing loans number of housing loans at teaser rates total amount like that there is an mis platform to be reported this report will give you this total statistics of the accounts which you will be able to verify with the system generated npa statement when we discussed about the customer id if you find that a particular person has got four term loan accounts and only three term loan account has been finding a place in the npa system generated npa statement it means that one is omitted or the customer id given to that one particular account may be different i told you that the customer id is very important for the purpose of analyzing and uh, verifying the system generated npa statement since the npa is to be identified and provisioning has to be made on a borrower based concept all the loans of the borrower has to be configured in the system generated npa statement how do you enter identify that from the account mask that is the account statistics report you will be able to go back to find out which are all the total accounts which is lying in the name of a particular person irrespective of the customer id this goes with another parameter so customer id is not relevant here in the case of your npa statement customer id is more relevant here and for the purpose of account statistics it is not customer id it is a business profile of the branch so there you will be able to identify whether all the loans of a particular borrower has been properly configured in the npa statement or not now i have already told you about the failure interest check report failure interest check report is that report which is available immediately after the interest program is run by the software there is a report which can be generated where if there is any interface issues where i am not able to apply interest in any of the account it will come as an interest failure check report which will be rectified by the bank you will have to see whether there is any data in the interest failure check report if it is there how it is rectified what is the sop what is the procedure whether there is any income leakage take the case that on 31st march when the interest rate is run i have omitted to apply interest of 3 lakhs rupees in one cc account interest failure check report is properly taken and on 2nd of april i pass a voucher is it not requiring an moc because it is an income as on 31st march so i have to recognize that income as on 31st march so an moc has to be passed in respect of this entry although the interest failure check report is generated and your entries are properly passed because as on 31st march your income is understated and your advances are also understated so you have to rectify that now account classification report every account whatever is a classification there is a health code within the branch itself there is an internal rating of the bank every account loan proposal will have an internal rating if you if you go to state bank of india if you go to punjab national bank if you go to kendra bank there is a internal credit rating internal credit rating is based on your balance sheet etc etc on the basis of the internal credit rating there is an account classification report which is available so some of the customers by themselves or some of the groups by themselves will be termed as risky group or will be termed as they will have some terminology used maybe uh, some good terminologies may be indicating a bad uh, usage also because it has to be deceptive um, ordinary people should not understand that so these type of reports will be able to give you the exceptional factors of the loan accounts which you have to verify and how it can be picked up from the mass of the database now coming to the overview account classification report overview bills report you know that in the case of classification of npa it is not the cc account it is not the od account or it is not the term loan account which is mattering for the purpose of classification of npa if at all a bill is due i have discounted a bill and this bill discounted is overdue for more than 90 days and it also obviously have to become an npa account if i have a foreign bill discounted and we call it as crystallization so foreign bill discounted and it is a dp bill or a da bill i don't want to go into da and dp so 
whatever it is if the due date is uh, uh, three months after and if it is not paid within the three months what will happen it has to be crystallized and this particular thing if it is not paid within a period of further 90 days it becomes an npa so even in the case of your bill platform there is an overdue so a report is available in this uh, cbs platform which are all the overdue bills likewise you will get an overdue pc report that is packing credit which are overdue bills overdue report loan overdue report then you will get tod tol report very important report that is, I told you that evergreening happens in the form of your temporary overdraft of temporary above limits. So temporary overdraft and temporary above limits. This report is available. So if you take this TOD TOL report as on 31st March, if you take the TOD TOL report as on 15th of March, you will know that who are all the customers who are using TOD for the purpose of leveraging their accounts and the operation of the accounts. Then loans overdue report. How many EMIs are overdue? Three EMIs over, four EMIs over. If three EMIs are over and if it is overdue for more three, more than three EMIs, then it has to find a place in your NPA report. So you have to go to this particular report, extra, export it to Excel, take withdrawal which is above three years and find up three, three EMIs. If it is not finding a place in your NPA, then it is not classified properly. Then suspense jotting. We all know that the suspense amounts are also attracted to the norms of the non-performing asset. It does not stop by the advances or loans. It also goes beyond stating that even any other debits, which is not recoverable for a period of more than 90 days, it becomes an NPA. So if you go to the suspense jotting, we are certifying the suspense jotting. Suspense jotting invariably will contain unidentified debits. Suspense credits will be unidentified credits. Like that, if you are going to purchase a, an asset which may require the Adobe sanction, you will put it in the suspense and purchase the asset. And when the Adobe sanction comes, you will capitalize it and you will eliminate it from the suspense account. So that is the procedure in the banking system. Supposing that an amount of LTA or any expenditure which is paid at the branch level without the permission of the higher authorities, then it will be first debited to the suspense account. So these accounts, if it is not recoverable, any amount which is debited to the suspense account, which is in the nature of a debit and advance in the balance sheet and asset in the balance sheet, which is not recoverable for more than 90 days. And if it is overdue, then it also attracts the NPA provisions. So you have to take the suspense jotting report and we are certifying the suspense report also. We are verifying, we are certifying that both suspense credit and suspense debit we are certifying. So please go through the individual items of the suspend debits and suspend credit reports and go. Now, at the end of the day, we have to go back to the manual calculations. Whatever said and done, computer is always computer. I would say that we have identified by manual calculation the product calculated by the computer is wrong. February, 31 days. How can you have 31 days in February? The system is fed like that. So what happens is that most of the most of the software platform, what we have identified is that in if you go to Excel, you have got a 360 days calculation, 360 days, which means that one year is calculated 360 days and every month is calculated 30 days. That is Excel. Same analogy was adopted by one of the some of the CBS platforms earlier. Now it is all rectified. Which means that even February will have 30 days, July will have 30 days. So your interest application will be only for 360 days. Now five days is totally of it. There were situations, not at the branch level, but at the end office level, we identified that. So now the important practical aspect is interest debit before 31st March. As I told you earlier, the interest program is run from the CBS on a batch to batch basis. So I cannot run all the batches on 31st March after the day, day end. So what I will do is that I will start my batches from 25th of March itself. 25th of March itself, I will start my batch running. So in major time loan accounts, you will find that the interest up to 31st March is put on 25th March. 
if you if you analyze your loan accounts majority of the loan accounts will be applied interest on 25th march for a product calculated up to 31st march cc accounts it will not happen because every day it is a there is a transaction so what they will do is in respect of major time loan accounts they will start time loan accounts first fd accounts first deposit accounts this is not static account it is not going to have any movements there are cases where between 25th and 31st there are transaction in the time loan accounts between 25th and 31st there is premature closure of the fixed deposit so these type of transactions between 25th and 31st bulk transactions between 25th and 31st we survey the application of interest before 31st for um, extrapolating the figure up to 31st is to be verified by the auditor then deposit accounts i have already told you interchange interest changes applied yes there is a report available for the changes in the mclr which is made by the core during the year 23 24 how many times they have changed it likewise your base interest rate on advances how many days it has been changed sometimes it would have been changed for four times five times a year six times a year because it's all dynamic so the dynamic changes which is happening at the base rate of interest both in advances and deposits is available in the core platform please take a report of that and find out on a test basis whether the interest has been properly applied from the rate of interest has been properly changed on that particular date charges updation we know that the system generated npf platform the charge creation in the case of company accounts is very important it is a qualitative aspect which cannot be configured in a system platform because i am assuming myself that the charge is created properly in the company form of organization if the charge creation is not being made what will happen to my system generated nps statement and the provisioning thereof and even again one more intricate aspect in respect of charge creation is that in the case of company form of organization we have got three type of charges one is a first charge another is a second charge another is a pari passu charge so first charge is a charge on the assets of the company where the lender has got the primary charge or primary rights on that particular assets second charge is that i stand in the queue after the first charge holder so only the spillover part i will be able to get as value of the security pari passu charge is that in the case of multiple banking arrangement if one collateral of 3 crores of rupees is given it is available equally to all the banks that is 1 crore 1 crore 1 crore each that is called pari passu charge so in the case of pari passu charge in the case of second charge you will have to consider only that security value which is apportioned to you system generated npa statement will not be able to configure this because it will only take the security value as per the master whether the master is updated properly with the second charge or pari passu charge or not is a big question we have seen that many a time the charges created in you during the year would not have been updated in the master so when the charges created in you during the year is not updated what will happen is that your security value will dilute it that has happened in the case of kingfisher accounts kingfisher what they have done is that at the fag end of their demise or i would say that their collapse they have taken loans from anywhere and everywhere so lot of foreign financial institutions lot of other in financial institutions also came into the fray of somehow supporting kingfisher what they have done is that they have obtained permissions from the bankers to extend pari passu charge or second charge to these people so the bankers have lost the security value in the process they have diluted their security value supposing that i have i am having first charge of 1 crore of rupees assets of that and if i am going an noc for giving a pari passu charge to you which means that whatever is there you are right is my right my right is your right so your exposure is 50 lakh my exposure is exposure is 1 lakh which means that my right is only 1 is to 1.5 
1 out of 1.5. Total exposure is 1 on 1.5. Mine right is 1, his right is 0.5. So, peripassive charge will dilute my security value. So, this is what has happened in Kingfisher. All the banks burned their fingers only because of the NOC. Some of the banks were having very solid collaterals with them. But because they have given peripassive charge or because they have given second charge, because they have seeded NOC to give this dilution of the charge, the asset base got diluted. That is why branch auditors were called by the Reserve Bank of India to see whether, why did not you look into this peripassive charge and the corresponding consequent reduction in the value of the security in the NPA statement created by the bank. They said, sir, how come I, we will come to know? You have got the audited balance sheet. Did you go, go, go through the audited balance sheet? Audited balance sheet will have all these figures. They said that, sir, we have no audited balance sheet. They said that Kingfisher is a joint stock company. It's a listed company. As per clause 41 of the listed company, every quarter audit has to happen. As an auditor, you should have got the quarter end audit. And the quarter end audit report will give all the liabilities. Did you verify that? These are all the questions asked. So mind you, the charge creation is very important in the parlance of your company form of borrowers. So whenever you come across company form of borrowers, please verify whether the charge creation is properly done. I don't have to explain anything more about charge creation because you have to only see whether there is any dilution in the charge and the consequent security value in respect of those accounts which you have to verify properly. Now, the critical advances analysis, nothing to do with computer and the computer platform. Your critical analysis has to be net NPA to net advances. There is a reporting platform where you will have to verify. These are all ratios which will be handy in the auditor's hand to verify the risk profile of the branch. You take the, these ratios of the previous year, 22-23, and this year, 23-24, and the difference between the ratios will give a clear indication about the risk profile of the branch in which you are auditing. The risk profile of the branch will be very clearly exhibited in discrete numbers if you take these ratios as on 31st March 2023 and 31st March 2024. One is the net NPA to net advances. What is a net NPA? Vis -vis what is the net advances? What is the percentage? What is the percentage this year? If there is a deterioration in the percentage, there is a improvement in the efficiency. If the if there is a increase in the NPA ratios, then it is a risky profile. Like that, you have got gross NPA to gross advance, incremental NPA to opening gross advances. These are all the ratios which is usually being followed by the central auditors as well as by the branch auditors for the purpose of evaluating. Now, again, reporting observations. If you take the case of your LFAR, long form audit report, what Reserve Bank of India has specifically stated is that the auditor has to report on the five large accounts. You cannot escape from reporting. You have to report. Your observation has to be reported in respect of five large accounts verified by you in the branch. Never ever omit that. It is a mandate given by the Reserve Bank of India. Five large accounts. What is five large accounts is your wisdom. You can select any five large accounts. Let it be standard asset, let it be substandard asset, let it be DOS asset, or it need not be five. You can select seven, you can select 10, you can select 15. But five large accounts you have to report. Whatever is your observation. So reporting is very important and observations have to be forming part of report and credit appraisal and the balance sheet analysis also has to be done. So these are all the thoughts I think I will share with you. Now 10 minutes is there to reach 1 o'clock. Open platform we can make for the purpose of any doubts which we can discuss. Holding chartered accountants for more than 2 hours is a big task. Because you will have a lot of engagements and we will we are not used to sit idle. We will always be en energetic and working. So sitting idle will make us drowsy ourselves. <laughs> so I should be thanking every person who has very patiently sat here.
for the deliberations for the last two hours. The young members are also many in Trichur. So I should appreciate everybody's receptive. Uh, the receptive audience have to be respected. And I should uh, congratulate the Trichur branch. Senior members, sir, I don't know your name. But I have seen you at least for four or five uh, branch audit seminars. Thank you, because you are all the people who encourage us. Venugopal sir, I sat here for five minutes. That itself is an encouragement for all of us. Thank you. Thank you very much, organizers. Thank you all for the patient hearing. Thank you. Sir. Sir. One question. Please, please. As far as the basal reporting requirement. I don't know. I don't know who is speaking. Ah, please. Ah. As far as the basal reporting requirement. Basal. Ah. So now, this is the basal two requirement is, that's what bank has to complain. Yeah, or, uh, yeah. So in CBS, you will be able to see this requirement or branch audit, is it has any relevancy? Yeah. yeah. See, mm -hmm. we are certifying a statement called the capital adequacy statement. Yeah. Basal yeah. two, base one, everything comes on capital adequacy. Yeah, yeah. So if you ask me very honestly, the capital adequacy statement, which is certified by the branch auditors, I should not reveal, it's not considered at the head of his level. Okay. Honestly, I should tell you the truth. We were the central statutory auditors. So that will be there as a backup paper. But there is a central platform okay, which will take okay. care of the entire norms through the CBS itself. Because certain informations are coming from the branch level also. Take the case of your fixed deposits which are underlying the bank guarantees. So for the purpose of putting the risk weight on the bank guarantees, we have to eliminate the fixed deposits already held as collateral, 100% security is there. Supposing I have got 1 crore uh, bank guarantee and 25 lakhs is fixed deposit, I will have to reckon only 75 lakhs for the purpose of capital education. So this particular thing, we will get the report from the branch and we will get the database of the branch. I'm capital adequacy report, yes, when you are certifying, you will have to be very careful. The major thing which you have to be seeing is that classification of the advances, classification of secured and unsecured portion, classification of priority, non-priority. We are certifying all these statements. So these are all going to have an impact on your capital adequacy statement for the purpose of your risk weightage. So the risk weightage and the classification has to be totally tally. We have found that many a time the capital adequacy is not system, uh, I mean, generated at the branch level but it is system generated at the head office level. So you have to verify only those accounts where the capital, uh, take the case of your credit card exposures, your personal loan exposures. These are all having high uh, rating or high risk weights or housing loans which are given at teaser rates, which is having a more credit credit uh, weightage uh, for the basal two and the capital adequacy those cases the information is coming from the branches although it is available in the master so i think your basal two basal three etc norms will be totally get taken care of by the head office and the system is properly configured to do that and capital adequacy we have to only verify whether the underlying fixed deposit and the collateral is properly configured or not that is what verification we will do and but the total advances Total advances has to match. Total advances, total contingent liability. Contingent liability also attracts uh, your uh, capital adequacy. So total contingent liability, total advances as well as the balance sheet has to match. Very many a time clerical errors are being found out there. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Excuse me. That gentleman. Yes. With regard to this uh, report login. Report? Login. You report login. Yeah. 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 We will be usually given only the CBS logins. Yeah. Uh, when we ask the branch manager, it is in, for the internal purpose only. Yeah. yeah. If the manager convinced, they will give some reports. Yeah. But we don't have any access to the Very reports. Very good. Okay. How we will be getting? Yeah. Is there any option? Yeah. yeah. It's a practical issue. Because... As I told you earlier, every CBS platform have got a parallel reporting platform. The reporting platform is enabled only for the managers or your offices, etc. His question is that as an auditor, 
if i ask for a particular report he will neither give me the he will not enable it for me nor he will give me the report so how will i be able to understand that two two ways are there practical ways one is that concurrent auditor is given the privilege of generating all these reports so concurrent auditor has to be contacted and you should be working in tandem with the concurrent auditor and you will be able to get the reports generated through the concurrent auditors module two is that if you activate your audit module i told you while discussing you have to work on your audit statutory audit module is there it may take one day for the cbs people to allow to you this particular uh, password and user id once you get into that you have got access to lot of reports and three is that as per the procedures the banks have to generate these reports and keep it in file and sign and it has to be sent so it may be there in the files you can go through the files four is that you can give some soaps to the officer or parpadi chaya ga medichu koduka alodu vecha ella report eduthiru edengil or officer nammude undavu idu or practical as nammala ga engane cheyyadu ഒരു രക്ഷ ഇല്ലെന്നുണ്ടെങ്കിൽ ആരുടെയും കാലം പിടിക്കുക അവനെ എടുത്ത് തരും അവനെ ഒന്ന് പൊന്തിച്ച് കൊടുത്തു കഴിഞ്ഞാൽ അവൻ റിപ്പോർട്ട് ഒക്കെ എടുത്ത് തരും അപ്പൊ ഏതെങ്കിലും ഒരുത്തിന് ഉണ്ടാവോ അവിടെ അപ്പൊ അൾട്ടിമേറ്റ്ലി വാട്ട് ഈസ് മാറ്ററിംഗ് ഈസ് ദ റിസൾട്ട് സോ യു വിൽ ഹാവ് ടു പ്രൊഡ്യൂസ് റിസൾട്ട് ദർ ആർ സെർട്ടൻ റിപ്പോർട്ട്സ് ഇഫ് ഐ ടോൾഡ് അബൌട്ട് അറൌണ്ട് എയ്റ്റീൻ നയൻറ്റീൻ എക്സെപ്ഷൻ റിപ്പോർട്ട്സ് സെർട്ടൻ വെരി സെൻസിറ്റീവ് റിപ്പോർട്ട്സ് ആർ ടു ബി ജനറേറ്റഡ് ഓൺലി ബൈ ദോസ് മാനേജേഴ്സ് യു കാൻ ഇഫ് എറ്റ് ആൾ you find that there is a sensitive point without getting the report you will not be able to report you can give a letter to the bank stating that i want these reports on these dates if they are not giving then you can report that i have not received this report so i can disclaim you can disclaim so they are supposed to give you and you have got all the right to ask also most of the cases what happens is that we will not give anything in writing we should start preparing letters to the branch manager stating that these are all the requirements i want these things nobody is uh, done that so please start writing letters to the branch manager that i want this or sending a mail to the branch manager copy to regional manager or copy to the zonal manager everything you will get okay anything else yes sir എന്താ പറയാ ഓക്കെ താങ്ക് യു താങ്ക് യു വെരി മച്ച് താങ്ക് യു സർ യു ആർ ടേക്കിംഗ് എസ് ടു ദ പ്രാക്ടിക്കൽ നോളജ് ഓഫ് ബാങ്കിങ് ആക്ച്വലി ആൻഡ് വെൻ ഈ സെഡ് ഒരു പരിപ്പുവടയും ചായയും വാങ്ങിച്ചു കൊടുത്തു കഴിഞ്ഞാൽ ഓഫീസർ നമ്മുടെ ഒപ്പം നിൽക്കും എന്ന് പറഞ്ഞപ്പോ ലൈക്ക് ഐ ഫെറ്റ് ലൈക് വി ആർ ഗോയിങ് ബാക്ക് ടു സം അതർ ഐം വിത്ത് മൈ പ്രിൻസിപ്പൽ ആൻഡ് ഹി ഇസ് ടീച്ചിങ് എസ് ഹൗ ടു ഹാൻഡിൽ വിത്ത് ദ ബാങ്ക് ഓഫീസേഴ്സ് അറ്റ് ദാറ്റ് പോയിന്റ് സർ വാസ് ടോട്ടലി ബിസി ഡ്യൂറിംഗ് ദ ലാസ്റ്റ് വീക്ക് ആക്ച്വലി വെൻ ഐ കോൾ ഹിം ഹി വാസ് അറ്റ് ഖത്തർ ആൻഡ് ഓൺ സിക്സ്റ്റീൻ ഹി വാസ് ബാക്ക് ആൻഡ് അഗെയിൻ സിക്സ്റ്റീൻ ഹിയർ എ സെഷൻ അറ്റ് ട്രിവാൻഡ്രം ഫോർ ബാങ്ക് ഓഡിറ്റ് ആൻഡ് യെസ്റ്റർഡേ ഓൾസോ ഹി ആർ എ സെഷൻ ഓഫ് അതർ ബട്ട് വെൻ ഐ കോൾ ഹിം ലൈക് we need a session of you last couple of years you are waiting to have your session at trishu he said wholeheartedly just send me the flyer that was the reply i got and i just checked which session you want he said i want the morning session it will be better for me to have a morning session and i want to interact with the uh, members of trishu so i never had such an experience when i'm calling a senior faculty like you i never got a reply send me the flyer i'll be there like that was the first experience i had in my life so thank you thank you so much sir for being here with us and as a token of our gratitude i invite joseph ta our uh, past chairman of trishu branch to have a token of appreciation to our moni sir
Thank you, Joseph, sir. I invite uh, Divya Dharmarajan for formal vote of thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of the Trishu branch of SIRC of ICAI, I extend my heartfelt gratitude to CA Mani, sir, who has shared pearls of wisdom, of his wisdom and knowledge with us that he has amassed over his period of practical practice. So I thank from the bottom of our hearts. Thank you so much for coming today. So now we'll be breaking for lunch and we will reassemble at 2 p.m. At 2 p.m. we'll be having an online session, short session of uh, by our uh, Central Council member CA Sri Priya Kumar. She will be handling a session on documentation for bank audit. So requesting everyone to please reassemble at 2 p.m. Thank you.
Good afternoon, everyone. We are waiting for our Central Council member, Sri Priya Ma'am, to join on Zoom. Uh, she'll be addressing us on the documentation, bank audit documentation via Zoom, and she'll be joining in two minutes. Meanwhile, Ravindran sir will be talking to you. Vanakkam. Vanakkam. Good afternoon, sir. I'm ready. May I start? Yes, ma'am. We are waiting to hear you over here. We are the entire team waiting for you. Uh, on behalf of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of India, uh, take great pleasure and uh, it's an honor and a privilege to be the program director for this program. So I was asked to come and present my views for about 10, 15 minutes. And I thought instead of just presenting some views, I will do something slightly more tangible, which might be of benefit to you. Right. <clears throat> so I've actually prepared uh, a standard documentation for a bank audit. Now I'm going to share this screen with you. And I'm going to actually walk you through this document. Uh, just give me a minute. Is this document clear? <clears throat> if it's not, right. somebody can interrupt yes, and say. Yes, yeah. Okay. So for the next 10, 15 minutes, let me just walk you through this document and what this document will do for you. Now, this document is actually supposed to be the one place where you put everything related to a bank branch audit and which will help you to comply with your standards on audit, your audit process that you perform. And most importantly, give you an audit comfort. So for, at the outset, what's a bank branch audit? It's an audit that you perform, which is an examination of the transactions and records of the branch with a view to expressing an opinion thereon. So what does a true and fair opinion mean? It means that the financial statements are free from material misstatement. So you audit primarily to ensure that there are no material misstatements which are not, which go undiagnosed in your audit process. <clears throat> so what is, so in that context, what is different between a bank branch audit and a normal audit? It's called cake. What's cake? Cake is cumulative audit knowledge. See, with every other client, you know them before you go for the audit. But with a bank branch, you don't know the branch before you go for the audit. So it's extremely important that when you actually go to the branch, you must quickly understand the branch and plan your work. And that's exactly what this template helps you to do. So let's straight away, everything else in regard to an audit is the same. I need to ensure that my assets and liabilities are properly stated. I need to ensure that my incomes and expenses are correctly stated and that there is no profit or loss is properly stated and there is no material misstatement in any of these components. Now, in a bank context, the top three things that matter in a normal kind of branch are A, the loans, the assets of the branch, are they impaired because of a customer's inability to repay, which is your NPA. The second is, have I accounted for all my incomes correctly? Three, have I accounted for all my expenses correctly? And how does a bank basically get money? It gets money through deposits. For deposits, what is most important is your KYC norms. Do I know the person who's paying the money? That's the most important. So this entire bank audit functions under four elements, loans and their recoverability, interest income, deposits and the ability to trace who my depositor is. Do I know who's coming and putting? Is the bank used to launder money? These are the important aspects. And 
the expense of the branch on account of interest. Now, one more thing I must hasten to add is, if you look at the loans or the assets of the branch, they broadly fall under two headings. One is your loan balances and the other is CCOD. Now, CCOD is something you have to check 100% because they are all the current year's transactions. Whereas the loans are those that have been given in the earlier year, etc., for which your primary testing will be for loans given during the year plus your NPA status on those loans. So how do you start? This is the bank name. Let's say Union Bank of India. Branch could be Thrissur branch. <coughs> year 2324. Date of commencement 1st April. Date of completion. I finished it on 28th April. Partner in charge. How many staff did you deploy? What is the advance value? What is the address? Why? Because five years later, if you open this paper or a peer review comes, you'll be able to recollect everything. Now, I have already given you everything here in terms of page number. If you have any additional sheets, you can number it as 2.1, 2.2, 2.3, etc. Print this whole document and keep it. This is the index for this document. It starts by saying, we have been appointed. Now, who is the we? It's your firm. We've been appointed as statutory auditors. Audit acceptance letter you have to keep. Engagement letter. If your client is willing to sign. A couple of bankers refuse to sign this because they say, look, it's all at an aggregated level. Letter of communication with the previous auditor. Now, one important thing is you can maintain this whole thing in soft copy as well. And you have to actually conclude this part. You can send him a mail, representation letter, reports and certificates. Before you start an audit, I think it's extremely important to know what you have to do. What are the key reports? The branch auditor's report, MOC, certified or attested financial statements, the long form audit report, certificates, tax audit if applicable. Who's the audit team? You write down all the names. Who are the details of the bank officials? Write down their names and their mobile numbers. Whom all have you discussed with? Central statutory auditor. What is the name? Now, the moment you get all this ready, if you have any issues, then you can easily call them and discuss. If you've had any discussions with the central statutory auditor, then you can put it here. Reports, returns and certificate. One of the first things you should do is to prepare this matrix. Because after 10 days, the bank manager will call you and say, hey, you missed out all this, sir. Can you please come and sign all this? So you be very clear what all you have to sign, how many copies you have to sign. Scope limitation. See, this is very, very important. You are asking for 20 loan balance files. They are giving you only 15. Then please, you should get alerted. There could be a problem with the other five. So say, I am not able to get these records. Then, you are saying, I want to go visit all this unit. They bought a big machinery for 5 crores. The new client. <coughs> you say, I want to go see that machine. And they no, no, you can't go. They're delaying, dallying. In which case, you'll need to come and say that this is a scope limitation. You have to bring this to the attention of your partner. Then, non-availability of reports. So, for you to, your very good start point is the previous year's audit report. So please don't start this work without the previous year's audit report, which you necessarily have to confirm. See, I have only 20 minutes, so I'm not going to go through the intricate details, but all this is self-explanatory. Then significant audit matters. After you finish all your work, what are all <coughs> the significant audit matters? Scope limitation, internal control, component-wise, you need to write down what is the major issue. You need to keep a copy of the signed financial statements. What are all the MOCs? What is the reason for the MOC? Now, see, this is there in page number 12. Should you go and fill up all this? No. Just write as attached. Just write as attached in page 12.1 to 12.20. For 20 pages, you have done MOC work. That's all. Now, before you start, so until now, everything was the top notes. You have to understand the branch. The branch could be a deposit branch or a loan branch. 
So, for example, in a Pakka residential area, it will be a deposit branch. So, those branches will necessarily incur losses. They may not have <coughs> interest income. It will only be expense. So, you need to understand whether it is an advanced branch or a deposit branch. What is a target versus accomplishment? We all know that misstatements happen due to pressures. Correct? So, if your branch has not been able to accomplish its target, there will be a pressure to misstate. There will be a pressure not to provide for a certain NPA. These have to be noted. What are the assets dealt by the branch? So, this is again a simple thing that you need to know. You will take something called as the loan balance file and the CCOD file. From that, you can figure out what are all the major categories of loans. Because you must know what you have to audit, right? Then what is the slab? This if you fill up, it will give you a very, very good idea. See, if it's a rural branch, there will be a lot of crop loans, jewel loans. Customer-wise advances, who are the big customers of the branch? Large advances, they are saying greater than 10% or 10 crores. <laughs> who has to give you the document? The branch has to give you the document. You don't have to prepare that document. <coughs> restructured advances. The Cree principle is you can restructure only once. If they repeatedly restructure, which is to give more time or reduce the interest or any form of change in the previously sanctioned terms and conditions, the account will move straight to NPN. Deposit profiling, what is the interest rate on deposit? Who are the top deposit holders? Then, so till now in part B, we try to assess, okay, what is the branch? What is the deposit? Who is the big customer? Who has taken the big advances? What are the types of advances are there, etc. Then part C is your risk assessment. What are the key risks? Unrecorded liability. Misstatement of income, expense, asset, liability. These are all the risks. For that, you will have to see the internal control. See, the easiest way, you are taking 20 housing loans. The easiest way to do an audit of a housing loan is to see what's there in the SOP document itself. Review of past audit reports. This is possibly the most important aspect. See, as a statutory auditor, I told you, right? You don't have the benefit of cake, which is your cumulative knowledge. So what happens? You virtually go to the branch and you have to start working. What's a good start point? The start point or your previous audit reports, which could be a revenue report, an inspection report, a concurrent audit report, a stock audit report. So once again, I come back to you. I am not telling you. I'm just trying to tell you this is like a toolkit. This is a toolkit where it helps you to, this is a toolkit which basically helps you to identify what are all the key building blocks you need to have with you to do a good audit. <coughs> Fraud reporting, very important. Suspense accounts, very important. Asset classification and NPA, this is the most important aspect of a branch audit. How much of my assets are impaired? Post year end transactions. Now, based on all that you've learned, what will be your audit strategy? You should have told me this earlier, right? It's live, is it? What should be your audit strategy? Based on a high-level review of the branch data, the audit strategy is actually a top-down approach. So you have to start from the balance sheet and then you go to the file. You don't do it the other way around. Utilization of other audit reports, review of previous year audit reports, high-risk areas, focus on advances, revenue leakages, etc. So this whole structure tells you for each of these categories, I have given you what is the checklist. So, CCOD accounts. So, for each category of loan or advance, this is an Excel that this is a sheet that will tell you 
for ccod accounts please check for the following for housing loans please check for the following for term loans please check for the following for jewel loans please check for the following for educational loans please check for the following for vehicle loans check for the following lod loans against financial assets bank guarantees what is the audit checklist for bank guarantees recording stopped It goes to NPA review, cash balance audit, money at call and short notice, etc., which will not be applicable to a branch, fixed assets, SB deposits, etc. So, as I had mentioned earlier, I am not, you've had two faculty today who told you what to do and how to do it. My subject here is very limited in the time that I took, which is about 20 minutes, only to show you how you can document. Now, along with this checklist, I also have an Excel checklist. Is it available? Is it seen? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. So for each of these, I've given a nice Excel checklist, which you can fill up for all the samples which you are verifying, including a CCOD interest validator. You can just change it and calculate whether the CCOD interest is accurate. So, and uh, I've also put in a small PPT on red flags on bank audits. So, I will also have this sent so that you can be very careful on the fraud risk angle in your branch. So, thank you once again, uh, everybody. And I will have these documents sent out to you. It's very easy to understand and implement. So I will send it both as a word. Uh, I'll send her the word, Excel and everything and whatever you've learned today. So this actually becomes a book. You can just bind it and keep it and your entire bank audit is done. So thank you very, very much uh, and hope to see you soon. Thank you. On behalf of the Trishu branch of ICAI, I extend a heartfelt gratitude to CA Sripriya Kumar Central Council member, who is also the program director of our One Day Bank Audit Seminar. Uh, thank you for taking us through the bank audit working papers, which was compiled by yourself, ma'am. It was a great experience. And we are sure that our members will greatly benefit from this. So thank you so much. And we are also eagerly looking forward to getting an opportunity wherein you could visit our branch and also interact with our members in person. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, thank you so much, Divya, for this opportunity. I just thought instead of saying something, I'll do something meaningful. As we speak, I have sent the email of the three documents that I have shown. And if somebody has a doubt, they can always reach out. Thank you very much. And the protocol uh, the, or the, the grace goes the other way around. Any of you coming to Chennai will be very happy uh, if you can come home for a meal or a coffee. Thank you very much. <clears throat> We are entering to the second session, actually, the third session. And regarding uh, CA Revidran Salem, like what he says over there, uh, when I talked to him for the first time regarding like taking a session in, at Trishu, he said he's taking a new era, like he's going to a new era over there. And he said he is introducing verification of records and register in banks. And we are lucky to get this session like 
16th, he had a presentation at SARC Chennai. And next second branch after his home, home branch Salem, Trishur is getting the session and he's taking the verification of records and register in banks. And he's the only faculty available in India who is taking this session on this topic. So with these words, I'm inviting our secretary for introducing the faculty. Good afternoon, everyone. Actually, it is a very difficult task to introduce a faculty with such an illustrious career and his accomplishments run into pages. So I'm attempting to highlight some of his major accomplishments. He qualified in the year 1987 and he started his practice. He has a diploma in systems audit. He's also an insolvency professional. He's a registered valuer. He's an independent director and he's also a social auditor. He has been in the panel of almost 29 banks. He has carried out different kinds of bank audit, namely statutory branch audit, concurrent, revenue, stock audit, credit audit, inspection audit, fraud detection, document vetting, election commission work. And he has also been an advi advisor to Tamil Nadu police in few cases of frauds. He has been an internal auditor for cooperative urban banks, central cooperative bank limited companies, firms, individuals, and colleges. He has donned the role of a faculty for uh, various uh, certificate courses of ICAI. And he's also the member of Digi Digital Accounts and Assurance Board of ICAI. He has presented bank audit papers on various topics. He has held key roles with ICAI. He was a chairman of Salem branch of SIRC of ICAI in 2017. He was a co-opted member of Banking and Insurance Committee of SIRC in 2019. He has co-authored the book on revising and rewriting ICAI's concurrent audit manual. Currently, he's preparing an exhaustive bank audit checklist for the benefit of our members. His area of consultancy includes giving expert opinion in bank audits, detection of bank frauds, industry and trade related matters. At present, he has written a book titled Vyabara Vedangal, covering only business experience. And he has also written books on bank frauds and a book called Tirukurulum Vyabara. He has released 182 videos on bank audit, FEMA, peer review, and other educational subjects. Sir, it's a great honor to have you in our midst, sir. Over to you now. Thank you. Manakam, I think you are all very sleepy. Uh, don't worry at all. This time, uh, the chance of getting the bank audit is very less. Uh, but today's presentation. I planned in a such a manner that this will be useful for all kinds of bank audits. It is not only for uh, search audit, it is useful for concurrent audit, revenue audit, stock audit, fraud audit, NPA audit, then uh, fraud detection audit. For everything, these uh, uh, registers you have to see. And uh, I'm proud to say that this uh, subject, which I am the first person to present this subject to their fellow members. And before going to uh, the presentation, I want to tell one thing, and even I want to ask one thing. Who has cleared the C examination the first attempt? Here. Yeah. Very old person. Only one. Second attempt, that's also a very old lady. Then, uh, less than five years. Okay. Why I am asking this question? See, those persons who are cleared the examination after 10th attempt, 9th attempt, 
So I'm, I cleared the examination the ninth attempt. I think I am the senior person here. See, our institute says depth knowledge is required for the subject. Those persons who have cleared the examination is the first, person, first attempt. He has read the book only once. But I have, clear, I have read the book for nine times. First, who has got the depth knowledge? So it's on the lighter sense. And the next thing is, uh, why I stress this point? Huh? Suppose if our institute change the rule, <coughs> once in three years, all the existing charter accountants, they have to write the examination. Then only when they clear the examination, they'll be allowed to do the practice. Is it possible? So we have to keep our certificate intact. So nowadays, the RBI has come out with a clear direction that if any fraud is undetected during the course of audit, then the auditor is held personally responsible for the loss to the bank. Held personally responsible for the loss to the bank. Suppose if the fraud is three crores, if you fail to identify the three crores, then your personal property will be attached. So apart from facing our insured action, etc., etc., or court action, regulatory action, etc. So you have to be very, very careful in verifying the bank audit. So I want to go with some basic uh, thing to verify the records and registers because this will be useful for you to come out of all kinds of frauds. And you have to give a true and fair view, which our uh, Manisar said uh, in the morning, you have to give the true and fair view. Here I want to share one of the experience which I had in my practice. In one of the statute audit where I have gone for I mean, uh, statute branch audit, I noticed that the system rounds interest rate instead of interest amount. If it is 12.75, the system provides provision for 13%. If it is 12.25, the system gives provision for 12%. Is it correct? You are certifying that the profit and loss account signed by you shows a true and fair view. So it has happened in one of the nationalist bank. I actually uh, reported this to the central statute auditor. Then finally, they revised the entire uh, p and account and they asked the chartered account once again, go and certify the p and account. Because the bank as a whole, there was an increase of some 700 crores profit. So don't, uh, do, normally morning also our friend said, every everything system takes care. No, system can be referred, it cannot be relied. So you have to go through the system operation and you should know all the basic things. Coming to the topic, first topic I'm going to take is Cash records. So whenever you are entering into the branch, which area you want to start first? Cash. Okay. How many types of uh, cash methods are there, sir? At what time you can verify the cash? I think you are not, you are still sleepy. Uh, you have to come out with the answer. How many uh, types of uh, cash verification or how many, I mean, which time you want to verify the cash? Is it opening cash? That is, I mean, before opening the branch, you can go and verify the cash. Next one is closing cash. Okay, now you are reaching the branch by 12.30 in the morning. Is it possible for you to verify the cash at around 12 o'clock or 12.30? Do you have experience? I think seniors, few seniors have got experience. I'll tell the uh, modus operandi how to verify the cash. Suppose if you verify, if you reach the branch by 12.30. This method is called as cover method. How many of you know this? Cover method, senior. One, two, only two. So let me explain the thing, sir.
they are going to do the cash verification. First, you have to educate the manager. What exercise that you have to do? You take a cover like this and you enter into the cashier cabin. You pull the cash at random. 500, 100, 20, 50. And you pull all the cash at random. And this exercise has to be done only by the branch manager and not by you. But this exercise has to be done in front of you. Then all the cash has to be pulled. And you ask him to store in a cover. So this is my cash, no? You ask him to put the cash inside, then seal it and give the cover back to the cashier. After closing hours, the cashier will tell the difference. So this is the cash on hand. This is the cash as per the book. And he will tell the difference. Now, you can go and open the bag and remove the cash, count it, and verify that the difference must tally the cash inside the cover. So this is the exercise. So you can first educate this to the branch manager. Then only he has to realize that without any uh, stoppage of business, you can do this exercise. This method is called as cover method. And what is the main advantage of this cover method? What is the main advantage? You are checking the cash at whose time? You are checking the cash at cashier's time. So your time is not wasted. So when you want to go and verify the opening cash, you have to uh, take the, uh, you have to physically count and do everything. But if it is done at the end by the cashier, then your time will be saved. This is the another method. And another thing, whenever you are going for concurrent audit, in the appointment letter, they will tell one thing. At what time you can verify the cash? They use the word any time. Suppose if you want to verify the cash around 3 o'clock also, you can verify. So this has happened in one of the concurrent audit where I have gone for uh, the cash verification. So, in this, I'll tell the modus operandi. Who, who are all going for content audit, sir? Anybody? Okay, suppose in future, you'll be getting less in statutory audit. You'll be getting more concurrent audit. So, concentrate on more concurrent audit. And another one advice I want to give you is don't bother about the fees. Whatever be the fees, you please enter into the branch. You learn the job. Then do the practice. Suppose if you are going alone and you want one-time settlement order, one-time one settlement circular, can the branch manager give? You have got no appointment, but you are going to the branch. Sir, I want to see your bank's one-time settlement circular. Can they give? No. But if you are an auditor, they have to give. So from there, you can start learning the subject. You can do the practice. In this branch, I noticed that one particular customer has come to the branch and is remitted, has uh, deposited some 200 to 300 instruments for collection. That is DD checks he has sent for the collection. So here, first thing, how many instruments have gone for collection that you have to take note of. Then, next thing what you do, you put the checks for collection, but he wanted immediately the money. But when you put the check for collection, it will reflect in the shadow balance. Any transaction done against the shadow balance. Suppose we are, you have got a, your client's check, say 1 lakh. You are going to the bank. Sir, send the check for collection. You have deposited the check around 10 o'clock in the morning or 10 in the morning. When you want to withdraw the money against the instrument, the manager will not give. Because the checks have to be collected and only when the amount is being given credit to your account, then only the money will be allowed to be withdrawn. Here, any transaction that has been kept under the clearing balance is called as shadow balance. So any withdrawal against shadow balance, the customer has to pay one day interest. Here, this party has given, has deposited something around 300, 200, 250 instruments daily. And immediately morning 10.30, he used to withdraw 
40 lakhs, 50 lakhs daily. Then when I noticed, when I observed his business transaction, I came to know that he is doing Hawala or he is again see uh, PMLA activities. He is doing all kinds of uh, PMLA activities and the bank is helping the customer to do this type of transaction. So as a concurrent auditor, you have to cover that point also because in certification course on concurrent audit, this is the first subject. As a concurrent auditor, you have to report all PMLA activities. Here, <clears throat> the party used to withdraw 40 lakhs, 50 lakhs. The cashier gives the cash, but without making any entry in the cash register, he gives the cash to the party. After three o'clock, after knowing the fate of the checks, the entry is reversed. So it is nothing but without making any entry in the cash toll, is cash has gone out of the bank. But checks are there. The officer has said, yes, pay cash, seal will be there. Cash has paid the check, but there is no entry in the cash toll. So this I observed during the concurrent audit. So around 12.30, I went to the cashier and asked the cash register and put a red mark in underlying the I mean, last transaction. I put the red mark and uh, told them, uh, cashier, please do not enter anything below the red line. Then he got shocked because without making any entry, he has paid 30 lakhs or 35 lakhs, but he has got instrument, but he has not passed the entry in the cash, cash book. Then all this we have discussed with the branch manager and branch manager said, sir, if you close the cash counter right now, it will affect our business. So normally this objection you will get from the manager. Suppose you can say that, sir, I want to physically verify the cashier counter. Then what they do? No, we will not close the cashier counter. This objection you will get. But this excess, I'm saying only for the content auditor. If possible, you can do it in statute audit. It's not possible in the, I mean, it is possible only in the concurrent audit. Yes. Now, the manager has subjected, then I, they, he called the general manager of that, uh, uh, private, it's a private sector bank, he called the general manager, and general manager, his name is uh, Anamali Swami. He came online and said, Ravindran, don't disturb the uh, banking transaction. You check the cash at the end. Here, I want to tell one advice. If anybody objects to your audit type, audit method, definitely there will be a fraud. This is, a, this is my experience. If anybody objects to a type of audit, definitely there will be a fraud. Here, general manager said, don't do, the, don't do this type of uh, verification. Then I asked the general manager, sir, I have suspected something fraud. Kindly share your name, staff number, and designation. Because I want to classify this transaction under fraud. I want to include your name also. So I, I told the general manager, sir, I want to include your name also. Then that anomaly sign says, no, 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 Ravindran, you proceed. Then when I verify the cash, I found that instead of 35 lakhs shortage, there was a shortage of 40 lakhs. That means 35 lakhs, we have got instrument, 35 lakhs uh, shortage should be there. Instead, 40 lakhs shortage was there. That means the cashier himself has lent 5 lakhs cash to his friend for one day interest. So seniors uh, would have got this type of experience. So these type of transactions will also be possible in cash transaction. Cash is very, very important area. And that too, uh, you have to be thorough with the registers and the records which I am going to uh, take you is also a part of LFAR also. First thing is, Cash vault register. Where you can find this register? You can find this register inside the cash vault. So you go to the bank. You ask the manager, I want to verify the cash here. Cash. Then he will take you inside the cash vault. There is a two almiras or big three almiras will be there. Everything will be loaded with cash. To record all the denomination, you have got a master cash register. That master re cash register is called as cash vault register. What are the items that you can see from the cash vault register is, it is kept inside the main cash vault. The entire branch opening cash or closing cash will be there. 
next thing that you can know is you can know the stock of cash in all denominations that you can find this this is the first register you have to verify during the audit next one is custodian of cash normally in lfir there is one column whether the cash is being kept under the joint custody of minimum 2 so minimum 2 or 3 should the cash should be kept under the joint custody in that cash wall register there's a last where is there and who is holding the key i mean who is holding the cash they have to affix the signature this exercise you have to include in your audit program you can instruct you are staff to verify all this uh, cash entries whether all the dates have been signed by the officers or not i can vouch you as a few dates the officer they will not sign this register due to some other workload or not they would have forgotten to sign this register if that is if that you think you found you please cover that point in your report and next point is verification of periodicals this is also another point in long form audit report whether the cash is being verified at periodical intervals what is meant by periodical verification how many days a branch manager has to verify the cash once in a month once in three months the regional office team they have to come and verify the cash register cash wall register they have to affix the signature you have to uh, give you a specific report in lfir saying that on this particular days the branch manager has verified the cash on this particular days regional office team they came and verify the uh, cash register so this is also another point in long form audit report so these points you can find from the cash vault register next one is in and out cash verification what is in and out the cashier closes the cash he hands over the cash to the uh, main that is branch manager so whatever cash is being handed over by the cashier to the branch manager they will put the column in and whenever cash is being taken out from the cash vault register that has been recorded as out so in and out cash verification you can find this next register is counter cash verification and uh, this register na uh, that is cash wall register another exercise you can do sir if there is any scribbling or cutting in the cash uh, wall register please cross verify the denomination this is one and second exercise that you have to do is all the closing balance of cash vault register must be tallied with the general ledger balance you give this access to your staff please compare and if you are a content auditor please do this exercise every month this should be your audit program in my in my experience in three banks i have found the difference that is cash vault register shows one cash balance cash balance as per the gl shows another balance if that is the difference then you have to give that point in your audit comment besides there will be a chance for fraud or misappropriation this work you have to give to your staff don't do it on your own because this will take a uh, lot of time and if possible you ask your staff to do the multiplication of denomination 500 into 228 you just uh, give him calculator ask him to do the multiplication uh, do the addition there also i found in seven branches that is denomination multiplication i found wrong so this is also another your audit program this is possible in your concurrent audit next thing is counter cash verification who is holding the counter cash cashier so cashier nowadays it is uh, online and even if it is online few cashiers they are doing the cash verification on i mean they are maintaining the cash register on manual system also so whatever receipt they receive they record here and whatever payment they made that will be recorded in that book this is a day to day operation done by the cashier it is the uh, it is under the control of the cashier now they are maintaining in manual as well as in uh, system based and surprise cash check this is a euro case this is what i said about Uh, make the underline verify the ca counter cash there i have found a fraud then that officer that cashier 
both of them were dismissed from service. So don't take the cash verification very lightly. I want to ask another question. If, if you certify that at the time of my verification, cash is correct. Can anybody come and question you? You are not verify the cash. But in Europe, you are saying that at the time of my cash verification, cash is correct. Can anybody question you? No. But it is your moral responsibility. You have to do the cash verification. ATM cash verification. ATM and ledger. ATM cash, ledger verification. Has anybody has got the experience of uh, verification of ATM, sir? Anything, any special points, sir? I'll tell how to verify the ATM cash. You go to the ATM, then uh, take the balance from the machine, one. And you have to count the cash that has been kept inside the ATM. If the, if the balance is tallied, okay. If there is any difference, you have to take note of it, one. And next to the exercise is you have to go to the bank, I mean branch, you have to take the ATM cash balance from the branch records. You compare it. If the branch cash as per, I mean ATM cash as per the branch records, tallies with the balance that you have taken from the ATM, if it is tallied, okay. If there is any difference, then who has to do the reconciliation? It is the branch, they have to do the reconciliation. Don't do the reconciliation on your own. It is your duty to go and verify the reconciliation. So normally, when there is any difference, not only for uh, ATM, for investments, for cash balance at the other banks, if there is any difference, the reconciliation has to be done by the branch manager and uh, it is your duty to verify it. Don't do the reconciliation. Then if you are satisfied with the reconciliation, you can give, okay, this is the difference. They did the reconciliation. I'm very much satisfied. Then you can go. Next important point in ATM is time of loading the cash in the ATM machine. What is the time of loading the cash? Address of ATM you have to collect. Cash sent through security team. You have to get the acknowledgement. Cash time, sent to time and deposit at the ATM. So the ATM cash should be loaded before 6 p.m. in the evening, before sunset. Say yesterday at the SARC, one friend said, sir, before sunset, you have to make the ATM cash deposit. If you go to Switzerland, the sunset will be around 8.30 in the night. So he said that sunset. But in Indian standards, it is 6 p.m. Before 6 p.m., the ATM cash should be deposited, one. And why it has to be deposited before 6 p.m.? Any experience? It is insurance. Insurance coverage, cash insurance coverage is available only up to 6 p.m. for the cash in transit transactions. So before 6 p.m., you have to make the uh, deposit. In case, if the ATM team, that is security team, they are not able to uh, deposit the cash on time. What to do? They are in transit. It is very difficult for them to come back to the branch, home branch. Then what to do? Any experience in it? I'll tell the modus operandi. If the cash is not deposited before 6 p.m., this cash has to be deposited in the nearby branch of the same bank or another branch, another bank with the acknowledgement. This is a permitted uh, in the contract of the securities. So you have to see whether the cash has been deposited before 6 p.m. If it is not deposited during the night where the cash has gone. This point you have to see. ATM cash balance you have to take. And another thing is ATM complaint. Sir, I have put the card but money has not come. There are so many complaints are there against the ATM. These complaints have to be Rectified within how many hours or days or months? Sir? Seven days. Then, any, anything other than that, seven days or two days or 24 hours or 48 hours, it has to be rectified within 48 hours. This information 
if it is not passed then this has to be informed to the controlling authority so atm rectification should be done within 48 hours because you are going for the audit even statutory audit also you can include this in your audit program sir i want to see the atm register details next item is cash in transit register so branch has sent the cash to another branch or sometimes the branch has got the money from chess branch or some other branch and sometimes this cash has been sent to some other bank also so all this you have to write in the cash in transit register please verify this register i'll see the highlight i'll tell the highlights amount taken by whom who has taken the cash is it from the branch or is it from the other branch so you have to if you are sending the money through your staff you have to get the acknowledgement from the uh, branch staff then as an auditor you have to see whether the cash which has been taken from the branch has been properly recorded in the register or not if the cash has been taken by another branch the requisition letter has come from another branch to this branch then you have to verify that acknowledgement also next one is cash sent out and reach it time that is six before 6 pm the cash has to be when it has to reach the destination then delay in remittance you have to analyze the reasons as an auditor you have to see why the cash has not been remitted before 6 pm what are the reasons that you have got the full right to verify next one is this cash has to be transferred as per the permission given by the central office or head office or regional office whether the cash in transit has to be I mean it has to be carried out or the request of the same bank or other banks then for this cash in transit the head office has to give the confirmation so these are the important items that you have to see from the cash in transit register next one is cash excess short register this is another type of register that you have to verify what is meant by cash excess short register at the time of uh, carrying out the day to day operation by the cashier sometimes at the end of the day there will be some shortage of cash or sometimes there will be some excess if the shortage it was not able to be identified by the cashier then the cashier has to reimburse the cash to the branch then this excess short I mean this shortage has to be recorded in the suspense account and the money offset by the cashier should also be recorded in the suspense account so that the balance will be nil and what about the position of excess cash see when the money is short cashier is refunding when cash is excess can the cashier takes the cash cash can the cashier takes the excess cash no this excess cash has to be recorded in the suspense register and it has to be kept separately and as an auditor you have to be very very careful when this excess cash is being reversed to a particular customer account then you have to see the genuineness of the reason what are the reasons why these checks this cash has been reversed to that particular account this is a very very uh, important item in cash excess register so you please call for this cash excess shortage that is date of occurrence cash excess or short cashier in charge number of times it happens suppose frequently there is excess cash or shortage cash then cashier is inefficient then this excess cash should be reported to the controlling authorities these points you have to uh, cover in your report release of excess cash to your customer account you have to see the genuineness next item is soiled note register how many of you has seen this soiled note register within how many days the soiled notes have been sent to the currency chest any experience within 6 months say once in 6 months the branch has to accumulate all the soiled notes and all the soiled notes have to be kept separately for that yeah, there is a separate register and once in 6 months these soiled notes have to be sent to the chest branch if it is not sent it is an audit point that you have to mention in your report soiled note register stock of soiled notes uh, period of holding 
return of uh, return to currency checks once in three months. So in private sector banks, it is three months, and national banks it is six months. It also varies from bank to bank. Then acknowledgement of receipt of soil notes. Sir, I have sent the soil note to chess branch. Yes. There's a reversal entry. Where is the acknowledgement? You have to ask for the acknowledgement. Suppose I had this soil note been sent to the manager's house. Without acknowledgement, this note should not be sent. So you have to see, as an auditor, you have to ask for the acknowledgement of receipt of the uh, Next one is chess branch register. Those persons who are going for the chess branch audit, because nowadays, the chess branch audit is being given to the uh, charter accountant instead of allotting the bank branch audit. The fees is only 5,000 to 10,000. For this chess branch audit, you will be getting the fees of 5 to 10,000. And money sent from branch to the currency chess, you have to see the records. And to send the money from branch to chess branch, you have to get the head office permission or regional office permission. And if you are taking money from currency chest also, that has also to be reported to the head office. Next one is payment from currency chest. In case if you are making direct payment from currency chest from one branch to another, there also you have to see the records. Then van loading and offloading time. What is the loading time and offloading time? Loading time is within the banking hours. Offloading time, 6 p.m. So this point you please bear in mind. Uh, I think only few seniors, they knew this time. But youngsters are here, please take note of this. And next one is key moment register. This is also part of uh, cash verification. What is meant by key moment register? That is the person who are holding the keys. For what purpose they are holding the key? One is for cash wall register, then branch premises key. There are two sets, branch premises key. They will have a, a full set and count, uh, counter cash, that is cash wall key, they have been kept separately. And the key holding person's details have to be recorded in a separate register called key movement register. That means this signature that the person has put the, in the key moment register must be tallied with the cash wall to register. So there are two officers who are holding the cash and those officers' signatures must be there in the key, key moment register. It must be tallied. In case if there is no signature is there in key movement register. That means without signature, the keys have been handed over to some other person. If it is a gross violation of head office norms, this point also you have to cover in your report. Don't take this register very lightly. In case if there is any misappropriation or fraud has taken place, this key register, key movement register plays a very, very vital role. Don't uh, omit to give the report on this. So you have to include this verification of key moment register in your audit program. That is person in charge of the keys. Signature must tally with the cash wall to register. Then all pages must be signed in and out and needed to fix the responsibility. Next to register is cash balance certificate. So whenever uh, you are verifying the cash, you have to get your cash balance certificate from the branch manager or from the cash officer. This certificate is a must for your audit working papers. Next certificate is cash retention limit. What is meant by cash retention limit? Any experience, sir? What is meant by cash retention? Sir, please participate, sir. <laughs> if I spoke continuously, then I'll be also sleepy. Huh? Maximum cash that a branch can hold on a particular day. Suppose if they say that 10 lakhs or 20 lakhs, beyond that, the branch is not supposed to hold the cash. The reason being, the insurance is taken only for the limit of 20 lakhs. If anything goes wrong, beyond 20 lakhs, insurance coverage will not be there. Only for that, this retention limit certificate, you have to see. Normally, whenever you ask for this retention limit, the manager will say that, sorry, sir, this, uh, uh, sir, I mean, uh, these certificates I have not seen, but I heard that the, our branch has got 20 lakhs or 25 lakhs. 
if the manager is not able to produce the cash redemption limit certificate please record this point in your report the branch manager has not produced the cash redemption limit certificate for my verification and if there is any difference that is more than the retention limit this has to be reported to the controlling authorities and controlling authorities they have to ratify this so this is a very very important thing because insurance coverage is related to the retention limit normally they say that if we hold more cash then we have to pay interest to the central office it is only an internal adjustment don't worry about it the cash should not exceed retention limit one and another certificate is cash insurance letter if you see it is also one it is also a question in lfir whether the branch has got the insurance towards cash or not whenever you ask this question the manager will tell what they tell it is being taken care of at the head of as but he never produces the certificate so if the manager has given this type of reply please get it in writing saying that sir even there is no branch for branch cash policy available at the uh, branch so all this cash insurance it is being taken care of by the head office so it is not possible for me to produce the cash insurance letter because in lfir there is one specific column with reference to insurance policy why i am insisting or touching the lfir now before to before uh, 2020 lfir whenever you go to any bank when you happen to see the previous auditors lfir what is the reply that you can find yes no nil not applicable yes no nil not applicable that's all nothing will be there but in this uh, recent 2020 lfir they say that you have to give a specific comment on against each and every point so you cannot escape from it so cash insurance letter yes now i am going to the next to register is jo loan here i want to start with an experience so I, this has happened in one of the national banks of uh, uh, in the statutory audit i went to the branch i handed over my appointment letter to the branch manager and the branch manager just like our chairman came in he has given me a very big room for my audit purpose and i i went along with uh, three of my staff and one of them is uh, retired uh, agm of uh, tamil nadu mercantile bank he was my classmate so i also took him then we we got introduced then i am about to start the audit suddenly one guy came and asked me sir do you need coffee or tea which one you prefer if you are the auditor which one you prefer do you need coffee or tea normally whenever and wherever you are going for audit they will offer which one you prefer i want water na you want water then which one you prefer coffee or tea sir coffee or tea kya chahiye na so normally what you say sir i want coffee i want uh, tea something then i ask him one question who are you sir you are new to the place and suddenly one guy came and asked you sir do you need coffee or tea i asked him who are you he said sir i am the jewel appraiser of the branch had it been stopped at the time i would have been kept quiet he said further that sir i am taking care of everyone who visits the branch so i changed my entire audit program who is who is here to take care of everyone what is going on in appraiser work then i changed my entire audit program then i i, I instructed my staff to verify only the jewels for two days so you please go and verify the jewel loan alive application you compare that apply i mean uh, application along with the stock that has been kept inside the vault you compare it so jewel loan application is there vault stock is there you compare it everything is tallied okay next in section i gave is jewel loan closed application what are the things that you have to see in the closed application the borrower must he must receive the jewel uh, 
I mean, return of jewels, he has to put the signature. Loan must be closed. And this closure must be certified by the branch manager or by the officer. And the same quantity he has to certify. Suppose if he has put two bangles, same two bangles, he has to, I mean, he has to record it. This is with reference to jewel loan opening, jewel loan closing. In the opening application, you have to see the appraiser signature regarding the payment. And the officer has to uh, pass the uh, I mean, uh, loan and the money has been given credit to the SP account of the customer. All these things, see, I changed my entire program because he asks, do you need coffee or tea? Next thing, you have to go and verify the packets. So we have verified the quantity, that is the number of application with the stock. Now we want to verify the number of packets. How to verify the packets? If it is transparent, you can see that, okay, jewels are inside. Normally, whenever we are going for audit, the jewel packets are in, kept in cloth bag. It, it is not transparent. So what you normally do when you go and verify the uh, jewel packets, you'll do one, two, three, four, five, six. Very fast, you will be counting. Yes, this tray contains 12 ornaments, 12 packets. This contains 18 ornaments. You are going very fast, but don't do like that. The slogan of verification of jewel packets, I want to tell, you have to touch the packet, sense the packet, whether something is inside or not, touch, sense, feel, whether it's a really jewelry or not, then count. Just, it takes, it took you only two seconds extra. Touch, sense, feel, and count. This is the slogan of verification of jewel packets. When I instructed this to my uh, team, they verified and they came out uh, with the report saying that uh, that to that AGM, he, I have given the assignment to his uh, area. Then he said, Ravi, as per the application, there are two bangles. But when I touched this packet, I found only one bangle. As per the application, two bangles. But when I, I have not opened the packet, but when I touched the packet, I found only one bangle. If we count all these packets, it runs into some 87 lakhs worth of jewels. That is loss of 87 lakhs. That is ornaments were not there. So I did some uh, test check and uh, confirmed that there is a fraud. The quantity has not been tallied. That has been kept inside the uh, bag. So it has been polluted uh, by the officer as well as by the appraiser. Later on, I have reported this to RBI as well as to the head office and saying that on test check, I found out the quantity difference of 87 lakhs. I use the word test check because I have not opened the packet I, I, because I want to be safe. If I said I have found only this and if it is more fraud, then I will be caught. So I did, I said on test check, this is the quantity of missing. Then I submitted all my reports and came Back. And here I want to share my, one of my advice or my experience. If you find any fraud at the branch, don't report this, this report from the branch. This type of fraud, you don't report from the branch because auditors' life are in danger. If there is any fraud, please come out of the branch and report from your office. Auditors are not safe inside the branch, particularly Ravindra. They will corner. Even I am proud to say that in my audit experience, I have dismissed some 17 officials and still 62 staff, they are still under suspension. So this is the audit impact. And two times I have got life threatening also. So I am not threatening you, just I am sharing my experience. So if you find any fraud, please come out of your, the branch and report from it. So here I have given this report. Then came, to, came back to my office. Then after three days, RBI team and uh, head of his team, they went to the branch. And they invited me to come to the branch. Here I need your suggestion. Can I go? I have submitted my report. I came back to my office. After three days, I, called, I got a call from RBI as well as from the uh, head office of the bank. Sir, please come to the branch. If you are in my position, can you go? Senior sir, can you go? You should not. Because 
our audit appointment terminates or over at the time of completion of the report. Then I immediately said, okay, sir, I will not come. If you want me to come, give the appointment once again with peace. Because why I have to go for it free of cost? Because my report is over. There, sir, we have got no right to give you the fees. Then you do your duty, sir. Then they found out 1.88 crores of jewels were missing. And these mistakes have been discussed with the officer as well as with the appraiser. After a long and hectic uh, I mean, discussion, this appraiser said, Sir, I'll go home and have lunch and I'll come after 4.30 in the evening. And he has not returned around 4.30, 5.30 also. Then the branch manager sent the substaff to the appraisal house. There, that substaff has found that that appraiser has committed suicide. So, now my next question is, who is responsible for this suicide? Is it me? Had I not been reported this fraud, eh, this person would have been alive. Had I reported the fraud, he has committed the suicide. So don't worry about what all. Auditor duty ends whenever he reports. Don't have any follow-up action. Okay, this is a very, very good experience that I have got in uh, jewel area. What are the things I discussed? You have to verify jewel load opening application, closing application, counting of the packets, comparing it. If there is any fraud, you have to report. All these points I have covered in this experience. So what is the starting point for this suicide? This person's suicide, what is the starting point? Do you need coffee or tea? So you ask coffee or tea, it ends with, I mean, his life has gone. So coming to the topic, this is my one of the experience that I have got in my practice. Now, Joel loan application, I will go fast. Uh, what are the things? Joel loan application must be tallied with the cash wall register and KYC of the borrower. Please verify the KYC of the borrower and wait to be checked <clears throat> and gram value and loan as per the head office norms. And appraiser recommendation and branch manager approval. Whether the appraiser can recommend or do the working or do the sanction. Appraiser has to record the weight and record the eligible amount. That's all. He has got no right to recommend the loan. Only the branch office, branch manager, he has to sanction the loan. This is a very, very important area. Who is holding the jewels after sanction of the jewel loan? I think who is going for content ready, sir? When you see this, in the morning, appraiser sanction, uh, that is, jewel loan is being released. All the jewels have been kept under the custody of the appraiser. In the appraiser, in the evening, he will hand over the uh, all the jewels to the cashier. Is it correct? After sanction of the loan, it is the bank's property. Because jewel, loan, jewel appraiser is an outsourcing person. He has got no right to hold the jewels. If you watch this, uh, if you observe this type of uh, uh, holding of uh, jewelry by the appraiser, please include in your comment. It is against the head office norms. So who is holding the jewels after sanction is a very, very important exercise that you have to take care. Next one is sanction must be tallied with in and jewel loan register. That is in case today, if they sanction some 20 files, that entire 20 files must be recorded in the in entry of jewel loan stock register. In case if any jewels have been redeemed, that has to be recorded in the out register. And please see that borrower's signature is there in the application or not, then manager's signature is there in the application or not. Next one is jewel loan duplicate receipt. This jewel loan duplicate receipt must be issued only after getting the contents from the branch manager. No one can directly issue the jewel loan receipt because there will be scope for fraud. So application must be duly signed by the borrower and not by the representative. Who are all representatives, sir? A jewel is being, I mean, jewel loan is being obtained by father. His wife may go to the uh, bank, say that, sir, my husband has lost the Receipt, can you issue the jewel loan duplicate receipt? 
you are not supposed to issue the jolon duplicate receipt so it must be signed only by the borrower and not by the representative signature must be verified by the branch and branch manager has to authorize and see that there is no fraudulent intention this is with reference to jewel loan duplicate receipt next area is jewel loan close application you have to verify highlights are jewel loan close after paying full money including principal plus interest plus penal interest plus other charges and processing charge it should be closed so that means all the charges have to be properly recorded on the rest that account statement must be attached with the closed loan application and jewel loan closer must be approved by the branch manager or officer jewels must be handed over only to the borrower and not to anyone and closer signature must be verified that is opening signature must be tallied with the closing signature if there is any difference then you have to cover that point in your report closed and not released why the jewels have been jewel loans have been closed but not released this is due to the reason of dispute death or due to foreign settlement and you have to analyze the reason in case if there is any excess of jewel stock when compared to alive application why there is excess that point also you have to verify this you can find from the jewel loan closed applications jewel loan stock register that is all, all the jewels that you have kept inside and you have to withdraw everything should be recorded and nowadays uh, you can see uh, some yesterday at sirc i have got a question sir a, a statutory auditor has to verify the uh, physical uh, jewel quantity and uh, purity is it necessary this is a question they raise i said you in a statutory audit you are not supposed to verify the jewel purity unless until you have got a doubt one and as per the recent rbi instructions and all the banks head office they say that once in three months the jewel appraisal work has to be done by another branch appraiser and this exercise they have to carry out once in three months you please verify that certificate issued by the jewel appraiser it's also a latest amendment jewel verification must be done by another branch appraiser it should not be done by the same branch appraiser once in three months you have to see and next one is stray stock register so for each and every stray there is a small book that is kept inside the each stray and all the quantities must be recorded in the each stray next one is nobody sees this register has anyone seen this register jewel loan auction register you are seeing in the newspaper this this jewels have been auctioned what is the procedure to be carried out for this jewel loan auction first thing the account must become overdue and it must be turned as npa the list of all the jewels must be reported to the controlling authorities controlling authorities they have to give permission for the auction then after that this has once again this information has to be passed on to the borrower that we are going to publish your name in the newspaper then after that after that uh, the borrower has not responded then you have to uh, include the name in the paper advertisement with a specific date of mentioning 30 days time in before 30 days time if the borrower has come and remitted the money to us dual loan those loans should not be included in the auction in spite of the uh, 30 days the borrower has not come then jewel loan will be and jewel loan uh, jewels uh, will be auctioned and all the process of auction should be given only to the credit of the borrower see in one of the banks i you know it's a private sector bank what the manager did suppose both the borrowers have got 10000 rupees 10000 rupees loan one borrower jewels have been auctioned and it fetched 16000 rupees another jewel auction another borrower's jewel auction it was uh, it fetched only 8000 rupees this 6000 surplus has been given credit to the account and all the 6000 uh, surplus of one borrower's excess auction amount has been given credit to the another borrower's account this should not be there so whatever be the amount auction that should be given credit only to the borrowers account it is against the contract of bailment okay in case if there is any dispute in the 
uh, jewels. Sir, this jewel belongs to me, but my brother has come and uh, got the jewel loan. If there is any dispute, those types of disputes, the manager has to immediately report to the controlling authorities. Those jewels should not be included in the auction. So my intention is, please uh, go and verify the jewel loan auction register. Please ask for the jewel loan auction register and see that all the proceedings have been carried out without any hitch. So data of becoming NPA, date of information to the borrower with acknowledgement, RO permission to go for auction, proper advertisement details, and must be tallied with RO permission, repayment done, court to stay if any, that has to be seen, and the full quantity to be auctioned and not in part. Suppose if the bag contains one, two bangles, one uh, chain, so when you want to do the action, it has to be auctioned in full quantity, not bangles. One, one part is bangle and one part is, uh, I want only bangle, I don't want the chain. You are not supposed to do the auction like that. So please see this type of uh, mistakes have not taken place in the, uh, the jewel auction team. Then auction participation formalities, then surplus must be given credit to the borrower. And if there is deficit, that has to be recovered from the source of the borrower or through legal source. And jewel loan scale, what is jewel loan scale? Tamil is one of the Taras. Malayalam is So because uh, I don't know Malayalam. So Tamil it is Taras. That is payment scale. What is the duration of the license of the scale? It comes under the labor law. Under labor law, this jewel loan scale comes. What is the duration of the license? It is one year. So every year, the license has to be renewed. Please see, this is also another important point in the jewelry. That is, comes under the labor laws. Every year, ceiling must be renewed and kept inside the airtight glass box. Why? Suppose if it is kept open and when any jewelry uh, I mean, payment is being made, it shows wrong figure. So, all this scale must be kept inside the airtight glass box. Then glass box must be transparent. So, I have kept the glass box, but it should be viewed by the borrower himself. Then electronic scale or manual scale. Next one is very, very important thing. Appraiser record. Has anyone seen this? You are going for audit. I think you have got a lot of experience in bank audit. Has anyone seen this appraiser record? An, an appraiser appointment is valid for a period of three years. For any appraiser appointment, the, the appointment should be given by the regional office or head office. An appraiser license is valid for a period of three years. And once in three years, this appraiser license has to be renewed. And the person name will be mentioned. And the area of operation should also be clearly mentioned. And the commission, how he will get the commission, whether the commission has to be paid by the party or by the bank. And in case if the commission has been collected by the appraiser, given credit to the p &L account of bank, and from there the amount has been debited to the uh, appraiser account, then TDS has to be made. So any debit in p &L account towards appraiser commission, if it is made, TDS has to be made. All these points you have to see in the appraisal. So uh, here also I want to share a very small experience. I went for the statute audit. <clears throat> this point you have to observe during the audit. This I observed during the statute audit. The father has got the appraiser appointment. He is also running a jewelry shop. His son has come to the branch. He is doing the appraiser work. The appointment is for the father. But son is doing the appointment and he is also holding the jewelry till the evening. So is it correct? So as an auditor, you have to see who is the real appraiser. His son is not permitted to do the uh, appraiser job. Actually, I have reported this. He has been removed from the service. Don't hesitate to report. You have, because if you observe this, because there is no responsibility, because that appraiser, he will come in the evening, he will sign the loan application. His son is doing the payment. In the evening, he will come and sign the 
because when i observe this I, because i went to the audit for three days and the entire three days sun is only doing the appraisal job so i reported this then uh, the even manager is also suspended because he is allowing his son to do the appraisal work so don't hesitate to report this is a very very vital point so here appointment letter and period of branch kyc of the appraisal you have to get outsourcing or employed method of commission payment then access to bank records borrower relationship declaration so nowadays another thing also you have to see is a regarding bsa direct selling agent have you heard about this direct selling agent for the loans the bankers now they are giving appointment to agents to get the loan reference files actually this bsa is sitting in front of the manager always from morning to 10 to 5 for whoever comes to the branch they have to have discussion only in front of the bsa so if you happen to see this type of uh, uh, presence please report because bsa direct selling agent he has to hand over the papers and he has to leave the branch actually he controls the branch manager even he handles all the loan documents is an outsourcing person all these activities have been carried out inside the branch and particularly if you are going for concurrent audit is a very very dangerous area if you happen to see this don't hesitate you report next area is next we are going for securities unissued dd okay unissued dd fixed deposit uh, traveler check all this you have to verify there's a separate register you have to physically count the unissued deposit registers then compare it if there is any difference you are you can give so you have to verify the unissued fd dd then duplicate keys of the branches here we'll stop then we'll break for a coffee and just uh, we'll come back in 10 minutes of in 10 minutes because don't uh, here after i'm going to tell the important presentation of professional areas and professional opportunities available to the charter appointments that is going to the next person apart from this each and every point i am going to share the professional opportunities please don't waste the time please come here thank you uh, there are two announcements uh, the ars has been fixed at 4500 plus gst that early bird will be up to 31st of may the flyer will be released after early bird it will be 5000 plus gst for the current year you will be getting the flyer i'm just making an announcement and we got a certain uh, request from some of the members we had a seminar for bank audit for the students on 16th of march but uh, but many of them are not aware or someone didn't got the mail or something like that so we are arranging a, another seminar on 23rd the same premises over here for the students uh, so you should send the uh, students to the seminar because last time we had only around 40 mem 40 students for the seminar so this time i'm making it very clear for only for the benefit of members we are conducting the seminar for the second time in the same year so please make sure all your articles and students or staff who are doing the bank audit are attending the program it's on 23rd this saturday for the whole day at the same venue thank you
So shall we start the session, sir? Okay, now another uh, point is duplicate keys. See, once in six months, the branch has to exchange the duplicate keys. It's a very, very important area. Uh, key, present key, the branch can hold only for six months. And the duplicate key will be kept at the other branches or other banks. For that, a proper acknowledgement should be there in the branch. This register you have to verify. Duplicate keys register you have to see. And once in six months, you have to exchange the keys. So this is the uh, importance of uh, duplicate key register. And period of exchange is six months. And authorization letter to deposit, that also you have to see. If you have kept the deposit, that is if you make the deposit of keys at the other branch, the authorization letter must be there to buy the, uh, I mean the branch has to hold the authorization letter. And that letter you have to verify. And when you go and deposit the uh, uh, keys in the other, other banks, then this branch has to get the acknowledgement from the other bank. All this you have to verify. Next area is balance confirmation from banks. <clears throat> what is this? Balance confirmation from banks. Normally this, uh, this you can find from the treasury operated branches. It will not be there in rural branches. And you go to the bank balance sheet, you can see that in the asset side, balance with other banks if that is there and also there is one column balance with rbi other banks and foreign banks if that is there you have to get the confirmation statement from other banks and you have to compare the statement that you have received from the bank with the your ledger you have to compare if there is any difference then reconciliation has to be done by the branch Normally, the difference must be due to some charges, service charges or some interest have been received. So, this is the basic difference with reference to the reconciliation. So, here we will see balance confirmation. Get the other bank statement, just what we are doing for our clients. You have to get the bank statement and compare the same. Then confirmation letter from the other bank. Then branch has to do the reconciliation and not you. This is a very, very important thing. Any difference is that then branch has to do the reconciliation. List of outstanding unresponded for more than six months. You have to suppose in case if there is any difference and if it is not, uh, if the branch, they are not able to do the reconciliation, which is pending for more than six months, then that point you have to highlight in your report. And investment record. I'll just tell the highlights of the investment record. Here, the investment has to be made by the bank or by the branch with the other banks. And to make the investment with other banks, you have to get the permission from the regional office, one. And second thing is, investment is made on whose behalf? Whether the investment is made for the benefit of the branch or for the benefit of the head office. If the investment is made on behalf of the branch, then the interest received from the investment must be going to the p and account of the branch. In case if the investment is made on behalf of the head office, that profit must go to the head office. Normally what they do, they include this interest in the p and account of the branch. So you have to give the MOC, memorandum of changes, you have to give because this profit must go to the head office. This is what, and another thing is regarding investment, investment made, whether that deposit is matured or renewed or not renewed. All these details you have to verify with reference to investments. Then you have to physically count the investment because they say that, sir, we have made investment with say Dhanalashmi Bank. There is an entry in the ledger. So, if the investment they made with the Unleashing Bank or some other bank, you have to get and verify the deposit receipt made at the Unleashing Bank. 
if there is no deposit as it produced then we can take the decision that it amounts to fraud so invest this is the key highlights of investment records investment on whose behalf made whether investment uh, there is interest on investment has been given credit to the branch or other head office or the investment receipt you have to verify and to make the investment they have to get the permission from the controlling authorities then whether those investments have been matured renewed or overdue all these points you have to see with reference to investment records now it's a very very important area and just uh, tell the highlights of advances when i said this then everything will be over for what purpose you are going to the bank for to get the loan what are the how many types of loans are there how many types of loans a person goes to the bank for what sir i want loan then it's a new loan correct second one is renewal of the existing loan third one is renewal with enhancement fourth one is take over of the loan there are four types of loan new existing renewal with enhancement and take over of the loan this is a first stage now there is a new customer who approaches the bank sir i want a loan and this exercise will be useful to your practice also now a client comes to you sir i want a loan from a bank then you have to advise your client what will be your advice what are the things that you have to take to the bank first thing the person goes to the bank sir i want a loan the manager will ask him the first thing produce your kyc records he will ask them to produce kyc record so as an auditor you have to see the kyc records which their party has produced from the kyc records what he will take they will take sibil from the sibil what they will uh, analyze whether the party is already a defaulter or not what is the score of the uh, sibil everything they will see after satisfaction of sibil here i want to tell another thing you can do the practice in sibil you can do the practice in sibil uh, suppose if some of your clients or some of the parties say that sir my sibil score has not been increased what is the modus operandi sir i want to increase my sibil score what is the advice that you are to give frequent viewing of sibil will will definitely reduce redu I mean reduce the sibil score don't do it then if there is any uh, return of figures then ask the party to go and settle that amount if there is any ots also one time settlement also the scores will be reduced so these things you have to advise your client normally at present stage few bankers they think that if the settlement or ots it was over i mean it has happened some 3 years back they never considered all those settlement they never consider all those settle i mean uh, ots ots so written off they never consider so this is with reference to civil but try to practice in civil this is one area now kyc after production of kyc manager is very much satisfied then the manager goes to the spot of the customer there he went to the spot he is very much satisfied with the unit then comes back to the comes back to the branch so here you have to maintain the inspection register pre pre sanction nada in that you have to verify the pre investment register they have to record now he hands over the application to the uh, borrower ask him to fill it and submit with the enclosures what are the enclosures first thing they will uh, if it is a individual let us say it is individual he has to submit along with uh, application kyc then gst registration then 3 years records 3 years income tax records if it is a unit if it is a new unit 3 years income tax record will not be there then udayam registration you know you know the trace of udayam registration how the udayam registration come initially they started with small scale industries registration then it comes to 
uh, entrepreneur memorandum, EM entrepreneur memorandum registration. Then it comes next stage is Udyog Aadhaar registration. Now all these three registrations must be clubbed and put into Udayam registration. What is the main purpose of Udayam registration? You can find a fraud in it. So once in a year, you need not, I mean, uh, bank has to take the Udayam registration, renew. It is not, there is no question of renewal, but they have to take the copy of Udayam registration. See, one of the clients from uh, nearby Nagarkoil, he approached me, sir, I want a loan uh, from a bank. It, I have already availed a loan from one particular bank. This loan, please take over. I want from 8 crores to 15 crores, I need the enhancement. Then I worked out everything. Then when I asked him to take the Udayam registration, he said, sir, don't ask me to take the Udayam registration. Then I asked him why. No, sir, I don't want to take Udayam registration. Then, no, then I insisted him, why? Then he said, sir, for income tax purpose, I have given you a turnover of 3 crores. I have availed 8 crores loan. What should be the turnover? Nayak, as per Nayak MT report, the turnover should be 40 crores. But actually, he has did a turnover of only 3 crores. This has been clearly reflected in GST as well as in uh, income tax records. But for bank purpose, he has given 43 crores. So he has added 4 in front of sales, 4 in front of purchases. So 45 crores of purchase, 43 crores of uh, sales, he has submitted the application to the bank. When, see, you just check, when you uh, downloaded the Udayam registration, it is auto-populated. It will fetch last year sales, last year purchases in the Udayam registration. So if that is the case, then it amounts to fraud. Then I, I have withdrawn from the proceeding saying that since you have already cheated the bank, I don't want to be a party of the fraud. So Udayam registration is a very, very important area wherein during the audit also you can verify what is the sales that has been reflected in Udayam, what is the sales figure that they have given to the bank. This figure also you can give. Now you have to take Udayam registration, this one. Then for partnership, what are the things that you have to give? Partnership deed, partnership uh, firm registration certificate, then partnership pan and all things related to GST, Udayam, everything related to partnership plus partnerships income tax returns, partners income tax return and partners KYC details. All this you have to give. Same thing to the company, same thing to the trust and everything. All these details you have to give. Next stage is the licenses. What are the licenses that you have to give? And also with the validity, any license they can give. Suppose if it is a factory, they have to produce the factory license. So how many of you are doing here? I'm, I want to tell the very big professional opportunity in factory license. How many of you are doing the practice in factory license? It's a very big area. Don't believe only bank audit. Don't believe only bank audit. Hereafter, say, even I am searching my phone because I was not in the panel for last six years. I'm still waiting for the opportunity from the banks. I'm not getting it. So I know that I will not get it. But I want to do the practice. That is, it is not the only area. Bank audit is only, it's not the only area. You can do the practice in Factories Act. We have read Factories Act during our examination. Please go and read the Factories Act once again. You can get a new license under Factories Act. You can renew the Factories license. In say, I'm, I'll tell the Salem market for getting the new factory license people, they are charging 50,000 rupees to 1 lakh. And for renewal, they are getting 25,000. If once, if that customer has become your client, he will come only to you. This is one. Factory license, this is another area you concentrate you, in practice. Second area is pollution certificate. Pollution certificate is also very much important. So, to get the pollution certificate, to renew the pollution certificate, you will get a regular practice. That practice also you can concentrate. All this you have to enclose along with the application because the pollution certificate is valid for a period of one year, two years or three years. It, based, it is based on the industry. 
and uh, there are there will definitely you will be getting lot of problems in pollution certificate and the client may create some violation so there also you can do the practice and there is one important certificate that you have to give a, under pollution is mines license it has to be renewed every year in mines license you have to issue a asset asset certificate that is the asset belong to that mine you have to give the certificate the minimum fees is 5000 so in tamil nadu and particularly in salem we have got something around 2500 mines licenses to be renewed every year so 2500 mines license into 5000 rupees just imagine the fees it is in only one particular area so if you are a specialist in this area you will be getting more fines so pollution la mines license is also a part so you have to enter the pollution certificate then all other license certificate say another one is explosive license suppose if it is an explosive industry you have to see the you have to uh, get the explosive license even i can say that the under the licenses provident fund act you can practice esi you can practice gratuity act you can practice labor laws l a b o u r l a w s not l o s s and a labor laws you can practice and if you practice in labor laws you can min money like anything there are various opportunities available to the chartered accountant only few they are doing the practice now what we are concentrating we are concentrating only on gst we are concentrating only on the tally we are just acting like an accountant so okay gst gives lot of opportunities for us to earn but here after you will be getting lot of opportunities in uh, appeals also so try to practice in all types of acts how many of you are practicing in rara suppose if you are going for any housing house construction industry you have to produce rara certificate to get a rara certificate the minimum fees you can charge is 2.5 lakhs so these are the areas you can identify you can do the practice all these certificates are needed for your bank loan yes now all the licenses have been given to the bank uh, to the branch manager along with the bank statement all the enclosures you have filled now you have hand over the application to the branch manager now the branch manager has received the application now next stage is he has to process the application for that he has to prepare a process note he has to prepare a process note it is the work done to be done by the manager sometimes the bank manager he has got no time he will give this work as outsourcing to the chartered accountants it is an unofficial mode but it is now few bankers they are giving few bankers they are also giving in official mode also they are giving this work to the chartered accountants the minimum fees is 5000 to 10000 per process note so it is a practice in bank it is a practice in bank process note preparation you will be getting uh, fees of 5000 to 10000 now you prepare everything now hand over the process note to the manager then on seeing the process note the manager he will sanction the loan he will sanction the loan based according to his delegated powers what is meant by delegated power is the power given by the head office to the branch manager how many scales of branch manager is there scale 1 is called as assistant manager scale 2 branch manager scale 3 is chief manager scale 4 uh, scale 3 senior manager scale 4 chief manager scale 5 agm scale 6 dgm scale 7 gm according to the designation according to the scale they will sanction the power so there is one column in the pay, in the uh, lfar and everything whether the loan is being sanctioned according to the delegated powers or not now the loan is sanctioned and it is being loan is sanctioned and after sanction the sanction letter has to be handed over to handed over to the party so up to this i have explained now going to the presentation then i'll come for the second part first thing is proposal received register there is a register called propose proposal received register in this the date of application everything that you have to clearly mention date of application name of the borrower and address purpose of the loan loan amount for domestic purpose or forex purpose 
pre inspection date before that is uh, what the manager has to go to, I mean, what date the manager has to go to the spot for the pre inspection that has to be clearly mentioned the pre inspection date and whether to accept or not accept na next stage it goes if it is rejected then he will hand over all the details to the borrower next register is process note preparation in this you can see the kyc details of the borrower then borrower with full details you have to give purpose of the loan and inspection details civil and other reports you have to record then legal opinion and valuation report here i'll tell about this whether a legal opinion can be referred or relied for any loan you have to enclose the legal opinion for any loan you have to give the valuation from the auditing point i'll ask you whether legal opinion or valuation report can be referred or relied by the chartered account here i will tell a very good uh, my practice experience in it because when i tell this only you can uh, say the answer so it has happened in a credit uh, audit so this is also another audit available credit audit or almost all the private sector banks they are giving this work credit and stock audit or credit audit here i scrutinized the document i found uh normally everything sanction letter everything is okay there i found the loan has been sanctioned to that uh, it's a spinning mill it has been sanctioned to the tune of 14 crores the loan amount is uh 14 crores it's a takeover loan the extent of the land is 6.19 acres this is what the sanction letter says my habit is i never rely on the legal opinion i usually prepare the legal opinion on my own when i trace the title the title goes to the year 1983 there i found that the originally the land was purchased by a firm then after some date that firm has been converted into a limited company they sold the entire land to the limited company when the firm purchased the land it was 6.19 acres when they transfer the land from a firm to company it was only 3.19 acres it is not 6.19 acres but the company has got the possession of 6.19 acres so this has happened in the year 1983 i went for the audit in the year 2020 for the entire years almost four banks they have financed to this unit in the year 2020 i found that the unit has got only 3.19 acres of land instead of 6.19 acres of land but the legal opinion says 6.19 valuation 6.19 factory license pollution and all uh, government records they say that the factory has got 6.19 acres of land i spent two days to identify this mistake because i want to prove that the factory has got no i mean uh, only 3.19 acres instead of 6.19 i proved then the ma manager got annoyed because it's a recent takeover so recent takeover then after some time i asked the manager sir can you do the survey of the land when they did the survey of the land that is existing 3.19 acres suppose let us say this is 6.19 the survey of the land shows this 3.19 is in the middle of the land suppose if you say that's in the middle of the uh, shade it is there so that means it's a land locked property the word is land locked property there is no passage to the unit but the unit has got possession of 6.19 that is immaterial in case if the unit goes for np i mean auction or npa then it cannot be sold to anyone so here in this case i proved that it's a land locked property then the auditor i mean that the manager has called the panel advocate has called the valuer my comment applies only to this case it is not i am not blaming all advocates i am not blaming all valuers as an auditor you have to verify the legal opinion and valuation there i found that it's a land locked property when they ask the panel advocate and panel valuer they say that sorry sir we did a mistake the loan amount is 14 crores now that md has expired that company's md has expired even his son is also expired 
now the account has become npa but the bank they are not able to recover the amount so this i have found out in the year 2020 when i gave this report even the law officer was also suspended in that bank because yes given a uh, yes due to negligence yes uh, confirm the legal opinion so my suggestion here is every auditor must know how to read the legal opinion how to read the documents please develop this exercise okay sir i want experience from where i can get this you go to your advocate's office he would have given some opinion you ask for the copy of the uh, his opinion you just go through it just spend through it you learn so the thing is you have to read in between the lines then only you can analyze the uh, legal opinion so next point that you have to remember is what are the documents that you have to title deed what are the title deed that you have to enclose is original deed parent deed then all revenue records then house tax receipt then fmb sketch that is plan then income and certificate for 30 years all the records you have to go through and you have to read all those parent records then confirm that all that rights the party has got so that he can mortgage the property so legal opinion and valuation the important point in valuation report is you just uh, see that at the end of the last page of the legal I mean valuation report you can find a photo you see that if there is any agricultural land and the property should be valued only in agricultural land but the value should have I mean you would have valued the property in square feet if there is a violation then that point you have to give next one is nowadays after the supreme court directions the bank has to finance only against the approved property you have to see that whether approval against a property has been obtained or not but when you go through the valuation report few are valuers they gave that nil report or sometimes they would not they would not type anything in that uh, valuation report so whether there is a legal opinion or whether it's a valuation report you see that all columns have been properly reported by the valuer as well as by the advocate and another important point here in this record is advocate or valuer they have to be appointed by the regional office or by the zonal office their appointment is normally valid for a period of 3 years and the area of operation also they mentioned suppose if the advocate has got the license for at trichur na they have to practice only in trichur they are not supposed to go to ernakulam or kochin because the area of operation is also restricted so if you are an auditor you see that which engineer has issued the valuation report whether that engineer has got the area of operation normally now nowadays what engineers they are doing they are opening offices throughout the state and they are sending the all diploma graduates to value the property and they are certifying it suppose the person is sitting at trichur and he may even value go and value the property at trivandrum so area of operation is also clearly mentioned in the appointment letter so once in 3 years that license has to be renewed and along with the along with the application or so along with the valuation report and uh, uh, legal opinion their appointment letter must be enclosed this point you have to cover so in the process note they have to mention the legal opinion and valuation report next one is swot analysis you have to give here i will touch uh, uh, swot analysis uh, in addition to that i'll tell another four points here that also you can mention in the reports our life is being governed by four points four areas one is swot you know swot strength weakness opportunity and threat so this you have to give in the uh, not only here this is a part of process note as well as it is also a part of our life second one is sape s a p a e that is nothing but survey analysis planning action evaluation that also you have to cover in the process note and daily we are doing we are accustomed to this uh, sap survey analysis planning action evaluation and third one is it is not part of process note but it is part of our life one has been 
and five wife is our life. One husband and five wife is our life. Any guess? It is nothing but how, what, when, where, why, whom. One H five W. So daily we are uh, following this, whether knowingly or unknowingly. And fourth one is Pestle. P E S T L E. This is also one more question in all the examinations. Whether if you are going for insolvency professional examination, if you are going for uh, valuation exam, register valuation examination, social audit examination, this Pestle is for one more question. It is nothing but political, economical, social, uh, legal, uh, technological, legal, and environmental. So all this you have to include in this process note. So SWOT analysis, this one, and I want to, uh, though it is not the subject, I want to uh, convey this message to you. Please pass on this message to your kids, your brother, your sister, particularly your daughter, and those who are earning more. These six commandments, please pass on. Don't give loan out of loan borrowed. Please pass on this message to your close relations and friends. Don't give loan out of loan borrowed. Don't put guarantee to anyone. You have to cultivate the habit of saying no. Fourth one is don't get trapped by fancy. Fifth one is respect others' time, and sixth one is ignore your ego. You please pass on this message to your close relatives. And these six commandments I have, I have already passed on to more than three lakh students. Through you, I want to reach the destination. Particularly, you tell this to your uh, kid. And particularly, rule number two: don't put guarantee to anyone. So that will spoil your, spoil their life. Please educate them. Now, coming to the topic, SWOT analysis. Then, demand, supply, marketability, viability, study report, everything that you can see from the process note. Then defaulter list and willful defaulter list. From where you can get the bankers have got the right to access to the RBI list, and you have got no right to access. And we only the bankers they have to fill the default. Whether the customer is under the defaulter list or willful default list, they have to report. Then additional conditions recommended to whom sanctioning authority they have to clarify. Loan sanction letter, sanction details will be there. Terms and conditions. Adhering to the sanction terms and conditions, acceptance of sanction letter. This is a fourth one is very very important. Acceptance of sanction letter by the borrower. If the loan is being sanctioned to a partnership firm, all the partners they have to come and accept the sanction letter. If out of three partners, only two partners have signed, that is invalid acceptance. So all the three partners they have to come and sign. Then MODT register is it there? Is it available? Is it uh, there in uh, Kerala? Memorandum of Deposit of Title Deeds. That is registration before the registrar after getting the loan. Is it prevalent in uh, Karnataka? I mean, uh, in Tamil Nadu it is there. I don't know about uh, Kerala. Okay, if that is there, it's a registration before the registrar. So MODT original copy. It's nothing but a mortgage copy. Then compare the loan amount sanctioned and the amount mentioned in the MODT. Then compare the legal opinion and document deposited. Next one is EM register. Normally bankers they are preparing the EM register. EM is valid for a period of how many? Twelve, thirteen, sir. Twelve. One plus twelve la twelve la. Only twelve la. One plus twelve la. Just verify. So EM register is valid. So date of EM is very much important, and property schedule form should be properly written, and amount of the loan. This is a register you have to see EM register. Next register is loan document should be updated. What is it? And first thing you have to get the DPN. DPN means demand promissory note. A DPN is valid for how many years? It is a period of three years. Once in three years, they have to get the acknowledgement update or revival update. As an auditor, you have to see for that a separate register will be there. Now it is system based. In system, if you go and uh, access the manual, the access the menu, it will give the full details. That is loan documentation updation. Then loan files list. See here how to do the advance verification. I'll tell. Go to the bank balance sheet. 
take the advances, total advances figure and go to the individual head overall. In that individual head, what are the total loan sanctioned? So you have to take the individual loan details, ask the manager to produce all those files. In one of the uh, banks where I have gone for a statute audit, I found that when I asked three files, when I, I asked for some 17 files, the manager said that the estimate I said, sir, all the files have been kept under the custody of the branch manager. Here I want to give another suggestion. If you ask any registers, and if the register is not being produced by the officer, kindly take note of it in your working paper. Before conclusion of the audit, again you have to ask, sir, kindly produce uh, those files. In spite of that, they have not produced those registers. You please record all those files which have not been produced for your verification. One. In my case, I asked uh, the assistant manager, he said yeah, all the files are under the custody of the branch manager. Because branch manager, he was on leave. After two days, manager came. I asked the manager, so I want to see the 17 files. Can you produce? Then on seeing this, the assistant manager has gone on leave and they are from autumn office. Then after some time, the manager said, no, sir, I am not having any custody of any files. Then he has sent the substaff to the house of the assistant manager. Then his wife has handed over all the 17 files to the substaff. So the modus operandi is the assistant manager, he has sanctioned the loan with the help of some customers. He is repaying the loan. So all the monies he has taken over. All the illiterate borrowers, he has got the loan with a thumb impression. So if you ask for any file, if those files have not been produced for your verification, please record this in your audit report. And with reference to thumb impression, what is, who has to affix LTI, who has to affix RTI? Left thumb impression, right thumb impression. Left thumb impression by the ladies, right thumb impression by the gents. Normally we are not, uh, you see some Rega, Rega, you know, in Tamil it is Rega, I don't know, thumb impression. You see something, some impression, but for gents or men, it is right hand thumb impression. For ladies, it is left thumb impression. So they have to put LTA, RTA, RTA for gents, LTA for ladies. Stock records. Next one is stock. It's also another very important area wherein you have to do the, uh, you have to verify it. Say stock, the first thing, Within how many days a stock statement has to be given? This you can find from the sanction letter. For this, the borrower has to submit the stock statement within seven days or 10 days. So first stock statement has to be submitted by the borrower. The importance of stock statement is the sanctioned items only should be mentioned in the sanction, uh, I mean stock statement. If the loan is sanctioned, uh, sanctioned for furniture business. It should not contain provision items in the stock statement. So the items mentioned in the stock statement must be tallied with the sanction letter. So then it should be item wise and not full, I mean it should be quantity wise you have to give and not in full amount. Suppose if he has, he has got three items or four items, he has to give a separate figure. So this is one stock statement he has to produce. After that, this stock statement has to be recorded in the stock register by the branch. Then arrive at the drawing power. Then if the drawing, if the outstanding balance exceeds the drawing power, then you have to put the uh, penal interest. So stock records must be updated. One thing is stock register, you have to see stock forms file. Then after receipt of stock statement, the manager has to go for inspection. This is, a, this is a, the thing clearly mentioned in the sanction letter. Next one is DP calculation. DP means drawing power calculation. Next register is charge creation. I'll go fast. Before register and before ROC, they have to go and create the charge. So charge creation register, you have to see. Next one is after creation of the charge, you have to take the encumbrance certificate in order to prove that the charge has originally been created. Then legal notice. Legal notice now, suppose for NP account, before uh, uh, I mean recovery, the advocate has to issue the legal notice. So in that, they have to mention the borrower name, address with the loan outstanding and date of return and the latest position details. Normally, wherever we are going for audit, we are not asking for the uh, details or present position of the legal case. 
you have to get your certificate from the advocate suppose in case of suit filed accounts what is the latest position everything that you have to ask and also here i want to tell uh, uh, another thing you can practice in npa has got a, anyone got the experience you this also another opportunity available to you professional opportunity available to you you can practice in npa say in one of the cases in kerala i don't want to mention the party name it's it has happened in uh, kerala one of uh, from kotayam uh, he called me uh, sir my client wants an advice can you come and give because his properties have been attached because due to npa and notice issued under section 132 of the surface act so the surface act says as on the date of issue of surface the account should be npa as on the date of surface the account should be npa in this case they have issued 132 notice and 134 notice and they made the attachment and the property have started to go for the auction the case is now pending with high court at that time that charter account he called me sir can you come to court am and advise us then i went there they paid me 50000 rupees also i'll tell the fees also just for one hour i got 50000 rupees for my uh, intelligence when i worked out the npa the account becomes npa one i mean two days after the date of notice of surface say today is 13 2 13 2 they issued i mean sorry uh, as a 23 2024 they issued notice under section 132 that is your account has become npa they have given the letter but originally the account has become only on 22 3 2024 after the date of notice the only that account has become npa then this i gave uh, this i proved and uh, hand over to the party customer and they filed this point before high court and the high court has dismissed the surpassy notice that under section 32 the notice issued is invalid and void ab initio so my suggestion here is please be thorough with surpassy act as well as with the iroc norms because just I, in 10 minutes i'll close this and go for the iroc i am there is importance of np i'm going to touch and you can practice in iroc that is you in npa so <coughs> you will be receiving you can see lot of legal notices have been issued under section 32 in newspaper if you have got contact please do the working and you can also do some practice in it so you can practice in npa accounts also and also here i will tell another opportunity that is available in the banks few banks they are giving this npa audit assignment separately per file you will be getting 500 rupees whether it's a standard or substandard they are giving this assignment to the charter accountants npa audit so this that is also another opportunity available to the charter accountants then suit file register that is an account become npa case has been filed before drt so who has filed the details so advocate details you have to get and get the latest position what is the borrower name loan amount latest position whether the case is pending order is passed whether decreed or not regarding point number c you have to get a confirmation letter from the advocate the reason for non invocation of decreed debts a decreed debts have to be invoked or have to be made within a period of 12 years an account has become decreed that is court has declared that it has decreed but they have not gone for case why they have not filed a case that reason you have to analyze next one is npa register date of npa npa amount provisioning norms then next register is aod oral register a separate menu you can find from the system previously it was manually maintained next register is dpn register demand promissory register next one is insurance register insurance la uh, first thing borrower name address place of business must tally with the sanction letter what is the address mentioned the sanction letter that must be tallied in the insurance register policy 
then products insurance and insurance value and due dates of insurance policy and bankers class here if the loan is say 50 crores insure say the, the loan is for say for 30 crores the insurance should be made for 40 crores if the insurance is made equivalent to the loan amount then this is called as under insurance so 30 crores is the loan amount the insurance has to be taken for 40 crores if the insurance is taken only for 30 crores we can say that that is an under insurance so banker class you have to see next one is last year moc form you have to get it current year moc form you have to get it why last year moc and this year moc last year the account is substandard that means this year it should be d1 but what they do last year substandard this year they put standard so they change the status according to their wish so for that you need next register is dscgc register cgt msc register credit guarantee fund trust scheme register next one is ecgc export credit guarantee corporation register that is useful for the uh, export client field then 21 climb register that is climb before the uh, insurance company or climb before the ecg or climb before the government that will be recorded in the climb register next register is subsidy register here i want to, this is a very very important register that you have to see how many types of subsidies are there there are two types one is front end subsidy second one is back end subsidy front end subsidy means immediately on receipt of the loan this front end subsidy has to be adjusted back end subsidy means this subsidy will be adjusted only after the uh, end of loan period end of the loan period so in my case this has also happened in the concurrent audit sorry it has happened in statutory audit and here before going to the point i will tell one thing we are not verifying the loan sanctioned during the year and closed during the year we are verifying only the loans alive we are not verifying the loans closed during the year or we are not verifying the loans sanctioned during the year and closed during the year in my case normally what i do whenever and wherever i go for statutory or for the subsidy folio you ask for the subsidy folio what are the debits in subsidy so if there is any debit in subsidy it has to be credited in some other account see in my case what has happened on one particular day some 22 lakhs worth of subsidy has been debited and credited to the some 17 loan accounts or 18 loan accounts so i went to the loan account when i opened the loan account i found that the loan was sanctioned two days back today they have adjusted the subsidy it's a back end subsidy and uh, again i went further and probed and uh, further and noted that the branch has received a matching deposit what is when we are matching deposit all technical term what is when we are matching deposit na? you are a customer you have approached a bank but you have got a eligibility to receive the subsidy here the manager said sir we are going to give you 1 lakh loan 50000 rupees subsidy 50000 rupees normally it is banker spends what the bank manager said sir you open a sb account you deposit 50100 rupees because the 100 rupees is towards interest so you open 50100 in a sb account the customer came he deposited 50100 the government gave him 50000 subsidy so the bank so total of bank manager's control it comes to 1 lakh the manager has given a dd of 1 lakh to the customer so the money has gone within two days this manager what he did he squared the subsidy that is he has transferred the money from subsidy to the loan account 50000 rupees from sb account he closed the loan i think you understand na 50000 rupees transferred from sb account 50000 rupees he adjusted from subsidy he closed the loan so the subsidy rule says it's a back end subsidy so it has to be closed only after 5 years instead they closed today so it amounts to fraud one you have to prove that it is a fraud so no asset is created as per rbi definition if there is any fund diversion in the account then it amounts to fraud please note if there is any fund diversion i am not touching that fraud class here if there is any fund diversion in the account, it amounts to fraud. 
that is why in all the audits even concurrent audit statutory audit there is in other, particularly in uh, lfar there is a specific column is there any fund diversion if you say no that means you are endorsing the fraud if there is any fund diversion you please take note of it and you have to report it so it amounts to fraud in this case 1 lakh has been closed loan is closed then when i asked the manager manager sir as per the instruction given by the regional manager i did this transaction that regional manager is very close friend of mine then i called the rm and uh, tell uh, told him sir manager is doing like this this is a fraudulent transaction i want to cover this point in the report since he is mentioning your name i want your name designation staff number because i want to include your name as also in the fraud report then he came and he ran and said he has made a request sir he said don't uh, classify this account as npl i said no i am going to classify but i have not included the rm name because he has not given any direction so here it's a fraud that manager is also he is also dismissed from service because he has received some kickback from the kickback means commission from the subsidy parties here since i use a uh, kickback i will tell uh, another uh, caution to you if anybody comes to your office so if they use the word sir 3kb 4kb if they use the word kb in a way it is a part of hawala so please if anybody uses that word kb means you have to be very very careful and you know about opm what is meant by opm sir i am doing the business in opm what is meant by opm other people's money if they use the word opm also you have to be very very careful and also you have to watch the uh, person who visits the office what kind of uh, chappal is wearing and uh, and also they used to use the word sir 5l 6c so he never wanted to quote this c is crore sir 6 crore na is a genuine person if he says sir 6c abhi na you have to be very very careful with it because it's all uh, practical experience i am telling if anybody uses uh, sir 5l sir 2.25c abhi na you have to be very very careful with it so coming to the topic subsidy is the very very important area this subsidy register please go next next register is deposit lien register bank guarantee and lc register in that beneficiary name invoked invoked or not that you have to see dued but not renewed loan return of register has anyone seen this loan return of register there is a separate register please ask for the loan return of register there you can find lot of uh, manipulations in the you go through loan return of register next one is surface notice register packing credit loan register bill discounted register fraud report register then csi forms register system maintenance register disaster plan register other records and registers stationery stock i'll go fast stamps petty cash suspense account register sundry assets register bills payable register sundry deposits register then list of overdues list of what is the difference between inoperative and dormant a loan is not in operation for one year then from the end of that one year first to one year it is called as dormant after the Uh, one year of dormant that account will become inoperative so this is the difference between dormant and inoperative service charges circular other auditor files so whenever you are going for audit please ask the files immediately sir i want concurrent audit file stock audit file revenue audit file rbi file inspection registers please go through it carefully because uh, even uh, yesterday i went for one of the national banks revenue audit there i have, I have reported one thing the bank has rescheduled the loans bank as a whole they rescheduled the entire uh, loans here i'll read that portion
this is a prudential norm this bank has rescheduled the loans without the uh, knowledge of the branch without the knowledge of the customer but after rescheduling they have sent a letter to the branch manager saying that if the borrower is not willing for the reschedulement you get a letter if no letter is received from the borrower that means the borrower has accepted for the reschedulement this is the meaning but what the rbi circular says in case of restructuring the accounts classified as standard this is all a standard account they have classified as restructuring and it should be immediately downgraded to npa non performing asset so the logic is if any reschedulement or replacement is done then for the next for the same year that account has to be downgraded to the next status so it's a very very important point so whenever you are going for audit and particularly you are a concerned auditor if any reschedulement has come you have to give the report as npa and there i have given a very big note in the revenue audit report though it is not related to the revenue audit but i want to give a report saying that your bank has done the reschedulement according to me more than 342 accounts have to be termed as npa according to rbi's master circular number dash dated 14 2023 now it is a talk of the entire bank because i am the only person who has highlighted this so whenever you are going for audit please go through the concurrent audit file and uh, stock audit file revenue audit file rba inspection reports you will get lot of inputs from it next register is log reports okay foreign exchange register check return register next one is self help group register these are the register that i have analyzed but each and every register has got uh, if i want to explain every i know the uh, inner of uh, each and every register and if i want to explain for each and every register i need minimum 10 minutes so i think tomorrow only we have to complete the session so that's why i highlighted the list the list of register goes on goes on goes on this is what i want to tell about the importance of register so audit if you concentrate on all these registers then your audit is over any doubt with reference to register you are welcome sir and also one uh, one fellow from sars one member said sir you are not included compliant register sir compliant register illa so please include so i am so telling yes sir few in physical few in uh, system now slowly they are uh, updating in the system sir so i will tell uh, highlights of npa up to what time i can go 637 just half an hour i'll complete i'll tell the highlights and uh, it is also another 3 uh, hour session since they have included in the topic i want to touch this what is npa's expansion you can tell which is correct npa expansion is non performing accounts non performing auditor non performing advances non performing assets which one is correct 
non performing auditor assets is it assets or advances one and two i mean a and b we can eliminate is it assets or advances we are classifying only that advances why it is asset is it asset or advances it is asset non performing assets now the portion i am going to deal is term loan that is non agricultural advances agricultural advances then npa technique npa pressure then npa games all this I, it's not possible for me to touch today but maximum extent i'll cover this is a base circular 110 2021 they have issued a new circular and from there only lot of amendments have come and this is a latest circular for this year audit you have to concentrate on this circular and another information i want to tell you go to rbi circular index rbi circular index there every month they are issuing lot of new surplus rbi circular index and particularly on 14 2023 14 2024 1st april of every year they issue a fresh new iraq norm circular so this is a circular based on which you have to do the audit and okay uh, this also first thing you have to see here is special mention account so you you know basic about the npa just i am giving the highlights from the year 2021 onwards in your all your audit reports you have to mention about the sma special mention account what is special mention account this exercise should be done before npa and close up suppose if the account goes as in special M, i mean sma the branch has to have the close follow up because it will land in no land into a stressed asset and this account will become npa after sma 2 so here you have to remember three items sma 0 1 2 it is not sma 1 2 3 it is sma 0 SMA one and SMA two. SMA zero means one to first. That is loan is due. It is not paid from one to thirty days. It will be called as SMA zero. But here only term loan is included and not CC. In SMA zero, le only term loan is included and not CC. SMA one starts from thirty one to sixty days. Both term loan and CC you have to consider. SMA two le sixty one to ninety days. Again, term loan and CC you have to consider. And uh, this is where I I have got a difference of opinion between the master circular and this twelve uh, eleven two thousand twenty one. I'll read the RBI circular says an account has to be treated as NPA if it is more than ninety days. They use the word more than ninety days. now you go through this circular this is also rbi circular if the due date of the loan is 31st march when it will become npa after 31st march but and full dues are not received by before the lending institution runs the day in process so the date of overdue shall be march 31 if it continues to remain overdue then this account shall be tagged as sma1 upon running the day in process of sma uh, day in process of april 30 21 that is on completion of 30 days of being continuously overdue accordingly sma one classification for that account so this one no one side so that means they say that when they run the day in process from there you have to calculate the npa that is 90 days or more so original circular says more than 90 days after that this circular come they say that it is when they run the day in process the npa starts from the overdue date that means it is 90 days or more it's a contrary view i have already written to rbi still they have to get the clarification anyhow since this circular comes after the 110 2000 uh, circular 
I am following this. So based on this, I am just I did the working, SMA working. In case if the due date is thirty one three twenty three, SMA starting date is thirty one ten thirty one three two thousand twenty three. So thirty days is yeah, that is March la one day twenty nine April. La. So thirty days. So <coughs> SMA zero period ends on 29th april sma 1 period starts on 34 23 sma 2 period starts on 35 23 after 35 23 this account is being slipped into npa now this is a 90 days i think uh, this uh, this also uh, same thing when they run the day in process so it is 90 days or more. So from that concept, I have prepared this. So due date of the loan is 5-4-23. So April one day, remaining days of April 25. That is 5-1. One put together on the 5-4-23. Then 25 April, remaining days of April is 25. May 31, June 30, July 3. So 90 days ends on 3-7-23. So the NPA date is 4723. So, um, so here this is another important date. This is called as NPA cutoff date. Suppose if the due date of the loan is 1124, for example. So the 90 days ends on 3324. So the NPA date is 31-3-24. This is the 91st day. Suppose if the due date of the loan is 2-1-24, then the due date ends on 31-3-24. The 91st day goes to the next financial year. So regarding NPA, the cutoff date is 2-1-24. What is meant by cutoff date? So any loans sanctioned on or after 2-1-24 or any loans due on or after 2124, you need not bother about NPA. So you have to ignore. So 2124 is the cutoff date. Any loans, new loans are sanctioned, are loan due and not renewed on 2124. Don't worry at all. All the accounts you have to treat it as standard. So the NPA cutoff date is 2124. So this is also another uh, important circular that you have to give in your report. The, this circular says the bank has to sanction a loan with specific due date mentioning. Suppose if the loans, uh, normally what the banks they are doing, the loan is valid period for a period of one year. They give the vague uh, observation. But from this circular, they say that loan sanction letter should specifically mention the loan due date. So this is the loan due date. And this has to be implemented, that is before, that is after 31, 12, 21, it has to be compulsorily implemented. And for the existing loan at the time of review or renewal, you have to say, it is nothing but the sanction letter must say the exact due date. This will be useful to arrive at the real NPA. So this is a, normally in uh, LFAR, there is one column, whether the branch adhere to RBI circular or not, there is a column. Here, if you mention this 12-11-21, you can give ample number of observation because no branch, I can vouch in my experience, for the last three years, wherever I go, I used to give this comment, the branch has violated the RBI circular 2021-22 uh, dated 12-11-21 with reference to specific mention about the due date. It's a violation of the RBI circular. This point you can include in your audit report. This you can include not only in statute to audit, in, you can include in all types of stock audit also you can include, concurrent audit also you can include. It's a very big violation. Huh?
repeat 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 madam at the time of sanction i am only determining the status of the eligibility of the loan the loan sanction amount maybe the term the disbursement stage at that time only i can decide on the loan due date because at that time only the loan will be due if i have not paid how can the loan be due so sanction date cannot have the loan due date right they say that in the sanction letter they have to specifically mention the due date so they, how can that be practically done sir that is the headache of the branch the auditor's headache is to find the fault <laughs> Practically, because it's quite difficult. So don't worry about the practical thing. The circular says you have to follow this rule. You have to follow. If they are not following, you report it. Keep quiet. So, see, so you can uh, download this circular yeah, from the true. site. Twelve. There is one ten two thousand twenty one circular, and there is another RBA circular dated twelve eleven two thousand twenty one circular, and another circular they have issued on February two thousand twenty two. All these three circulars are very very important. Because currently You'd... I am a concerned auditor and I have seen that in this branch, this is not being mentioned in any of the sanction letters. That is why I am telling hereafter you mention it. And if they ask why you are not mentioned in the previous report, na you are caught. But anyhow you report it. Say at least we we just now we came to know this. It's a very very important circular. All the branch they have to mention the due date specifically in the sanction letter. and also another thing is regarding npa non reporting of npa or wrong classification of npa then the auditor is held responsible non classification of npa or wrong classification of npa the auditor is held responsible so even i have got a call from reserve bank of india it's a sb account it, it has happened in your private sector bank the sb account the there is excess of uh, balance in uh, sb that is they allowed a uh, overdraft in sb it was around uh, 2500 rupees that's all it has drawn overdrawn for more than 7 months but before commencement of my audit that low, that sb account was closed but they say that why you have not classified this account as npa that is 2500 sb od why you have not classified as npa i got a notice from Uh, Reserve Bank of India. I said it's an event occurring after data balance sheet. There is no materiality concern because the loan is closed, so there is no point in mistaking this. And even that point, I have clearly mentioned in LFAR, and they use the word the learned chartered accountant has not mentioned. See, they use the word the learned chartered accountant has not classified this account as NPA, but in LFAR, I already reported. Uh, even since this loan has already been closed, I have not mentioned as NPA. So next year, luckily for the next year, I am going to the same bank, same branch as auditor. I have seen the RBI comments. In that, I have given my reply saying that the learned RBI officer has not seen my point here. So my working is correct. So we had a difference of opinion. And here, I want to tell another very very important thing. for the last 3 years most of the charter accounts almost uh, some 17 charter accounts they came and consulted me but more than 1800 charter accountants they have received notice from reserve bank of india regarding non classification of npa so you may be one among them in future please don't yield to any pressure if you find it is an npa you report it don't worry about it you will be getting the audit so everybody start they started to threaten sir you will not be getting the audit don't worry at all anyhow we are not going to get the audit here after because the audit level has come down but if you find anything as npa please report it don't yield to any type of pressure next one is everything depends on the sanction letter what sanction letter says you have to do it it is applicable for both domestic and foreign loans see the term loan working and uh, uh working capital loan agri loans term loan regarding okay uh, it's all theoretical how many types of loan repayments are there sir i am going to touch 
term loan repayment, I am going to touch working capital uh, NPA classification. I am going to touch agricultural loan NPA. These three items I'll uh, tell you, then wind up the session. Because for want of time, because you are not, uh, I mean, I cannot kill you more. So that's my, uh, I mean, you have come to a fag end. How many types of repayment? There are five types of repayment. One is principal plus interest. Second one is principal come interest, that is EMI. Third one is holiday period interest plus EMI. Fourth one is bullet repayment. Fifth one is balloon repayment. This is the five repayment term loan schedules. Banks, they are fixed. Principal plus interest, EMI method, holiday period interest plus EMI, bullet repayment and balloon repayment. I'll just give me five minutes time. I'll explain all the methods. Very easily you can understand. First method is uh, here. See, one and two is a two exercise argument. First, let us concentrate on one. Number of dues from the date of sanction letter to 124 is 50. From date of sanction to 124. Why 124? The NPA cutoff date is 2124. So up to 1124, all the dues have to be collected. So 1124 is 50, per due amount is 1000. So total amount, so, uh, one second, uh, madam, this I have circulated. No? This, are you going to circulate this? Huh? Okay, actually I have shared this working uh, to the branch. Uh, you just go through the thing. This will be definitely useful. Here I just forgot to pass. Total dues is 50,000. The sanction limit is 2 lakhs. So you deduct 2 lakhs minus 50,000. It works out to 150,000. That is the outstanding balance should be 150,000. Point number 6. For example, if the outstanding is 148,500. That means below the 150,000. So that account has to be treated as standard. Point number seven, the outstanding is 1,53,500. Instead of 1,50,000, the outstanding is 1,53,500. Then that means that account has to be termed as NPA. In the first example, you have to deduct the uh, outstanding amount, that is sanction limit, minus the total amount to be paid. So you have to arrive that this is the outstanding amount. What Then go to the, and, uh, the outstanding balance and compare it. This is the first method. Any doubt you can ask. This is the base based on which you have to do the audit. Can I move to the second method? Here, number of EMIs due from Date of sanction to 1124. What is the total number of EMI? 50. Per EMI is 1000. So what is the amount the party has to pay? 50,000. Then amount credited from date of sanction to 31324 because all the amounts they have to pay on or before 31324. The amount they paid is only 60,000. Actually the amount has to be paid only 50,000. The party has paid 60,000. That means he has paid the amount in advance. So that account has to be treated as standard. Instead, if the party has paid 40,000, instead of 50,000, the party has paid only 40,000, then that account has to be treated as NPA. First method, la, sanctioned limit minus amount due. That is a different way of working. Second, la, you have to take EMI. What is the total EMI to be paid? What is the amount paid? Compare it. If the amount paid exceeds the EMI, then everything is correct. If the amount paid is short of EMI, then that account has to be treated as NPA. The first thing, you have to calculate EMI up to 1124 from date of sanction. Because the cutoff date is 2124, you need not worry. So up to, is because it's a leap year. It's a leap year. Next year when you go for this, don't take this. That is 3112. Because next year, it is non-leap year. This is a leap year. That is why it is 124. <coughs> so this is a EMI paid, to be paid, paid. If the paid exceeds the EMI, everything is correct, standard. 
If the amount paid short falls short of EMI, then that account has to be treated as substandard. Can I move to third? Because this, uh, this I've already handed over. Uh, just I'm explaining. After the receipt of the material, you just go through it. Definitely, that's, that is going to be your Bible. In bank audit, please carry this. Carry the notes. And particularly, you will be enjoying when I go for the advances uh, NBA because most of the people they get confused because of uh, advances, I mean agriculture advances. Point number three is holiday period interest plus EMI. What is holiday period interest, gestation period? So whenever you are going for any housing loan, the bank they give one concession. For the period of construction, you don't pay the principal, but please pay the interest only. So that broken period that is till the EMI starts, whatever amount is added, that is called as holiday period interest. So here, holiday period interest is 20,000 rupees in this case. Two and three, EMI due, 50,000. So you have to add holiday period interest plus EMI. That is 70,000 rupees you have to pay, but the party has paid 80,000. Though that means, That means the party has paid the amount. That is, go to point number six, 80,000 he has paid. Point number is on the, it's a due amount. Instead of 70,000, the party has paid 80,000. So that means it is in full. That account has to be treated as standard. And point number seven is, he has paid only 60,000. That means it's a shortage. So that account has to be treated as NPA. And I can say a very good caution to you in my experience, I'll tell almost 80% of housing loans will be treated as NPA. I think uh, you heard this in, the law, in my last year presentation also. 80% of housing loans will become NPA because the system never calculates the holiday period interest. So you had to add all the, all the holiday period interest manually. You calculate the EMI. Then you had to go to the credit side Calculate only the genuine credit. What is genuine credit? The amount should not be given credit by way of wrong transfer. From That is, A account would have gone and he has remitted his money, but the manager, in order to avoid NPA, what they do? They post the amount in the B's account. Next day, they will debit as wrong credit, wrong debit. But the system calculates the credit only. So the system says it is standard. So don't believe the system. So you have to consider only the genuine credit. So this is with reference to third model. Can I go to fourth model? That is called as bullet repayment. That is at one shot you have to make the payment, your loan, FITL, that is funded interest term loan. The loan will be mentioned in the due date. So from the due date, within 90 days, the payment has to be made. Otherwise, that account has to be treated as NPA. This is with reference to balloon repayment. Balloon repayment. A balloon looks like this or starts like this. So that means first year la loan repayment is less. Second year, little more. Third year, more than that. Just like balloon, that repayment is being fixed. This will be fixed for any form of for any big industries and uh, colleges, institutions, institutions, they fix the balloon repayment. Even suppose any of your client comes and uh, asks for the term loan, you ask the manager to adopt balloon repayment because that account will not become NPA soon. So this is the advice that you have to give to your client. So balloon repayment is another method and the same concept, whether it's a EMI or principal for interest, you have to arrive at the uh, balloon repayment. So five methods that you have to do it with reference to repayment. Everything is based on the sanction letter. Next one is housing loan and education loan will definitely become NPA. On my experience as a system, sometimes are not considering the holiday period interest. The uh, battery level. Now, with reference to cash credit loan, there are eight methods. 
against which you can identify the NPA. Adhila. Power changer. Everything depends on the sanction letter and sanctioned on or after, I mean, uh, 2 -1 you ignore because the cutoff date is uh, 2 -1 So here, I'm going to explain this step one. Step one, la, you have to add interest debited. So now we are going for the cash credit account. Add the interest debited for the period from 1124 to 31324. Add all interest. Interest includes penal interest. Interest includes penal interest. Now go to the credit side of the account. Add all the genuine credit into the account. Compare it. If the payment made into the account exceeds the interest due, then that account has to be classified as standard. Correct? The period of, uh, say, for, for example, the interest is 35,000. Add all genuine credit into the account, 40,000. Instead of 35,000 interest, the party has made a payment of 40,000. Then all interest is serviced. Then that cash credit account will be treated as standard. In case if the amount paid is only 30,000, then there is a shortfall of 5,000. Then that account has to be classified as NPA. Is it clear? This is with reference to CC first step. CC second step. On any one particular day, the at least on one particular day, the limit should be brought down the sanctioned limit. On one particular day, the outstanding balance should be below the sanctioned limit. Otherwise, that account will be treated as NPA. Regarding step three, the outstanding balance is below the sanction limit. Always for the entire quarter, the outstanding balance is uh, below the sanction limit, but it never exceeds the um, sanction limit. But the same concept of one is applicable. That is outstanding limit. Suppose if the outstanding amount is 10 lakhs, then the outstanding limit is 10 lakhs, but the sanction limit is 12 lakhs. For the entire quarter, the outstanding limit is below the sanction limit. Again, you have to add all the interest from 1124 to 31324. Go to the credit side of the account, add all credits, compare it. If the credit exceeds the interest, then that account has to be treated as standard. Is it clear with reference to all the three methods? There are first method, la, some days the outstanding balance exceeds the sanction limit, some days it is below the sanction limit. That is one. Step three, la, always the outstanding balance is below the sanction limit. For both the cases, you have to add the interest from 1124 to 31324. Then go to the credit side, add all the amount credited into the account. This is the amount of interest to be paid. This is the amount of interest paid. Compare it. If the amount paid exceeds the interest due, then all the interest is serviced. Then that account has to be treated as standard. If it is not there, then that account has to be treated as NPA. And step two, at least on one particular day, the outstanding limit should be brought down the sanction limit. For the entire quarter, suppose if the limit is 10 lakhs, loan limit is 10 lakhs, for the entire quarter, the outstanding is 10.5, 10.3, 11 lakhs. And at least on one particular day, the outstanding should be brought below the 10 lakhs. That is 9 lakh 99,999. Then that account can be treated as standard. This is the three methods I have explained out of eight methods. Going for the fourth method. Now stock statement. Refer the sanction letter because uh, fourth method uh, gives importance for stock statement. 
Stock statement can be submitted on monthly basis, quarterly basis, half yearly basis. And date of submission is very much important. You have to verify the stock statement and stock register. And delay in submission, it attracts penal interest. <laughs> Items must be tallied with the sanction. And branch manager has to go for inspection after submission of the stock statement. Then LC stock should not be included in the stock statement. Then after that, you can arrive at the drawing power. Next area is data statement. Refer sanction letter, then see the margin. Age-wise, you have to prepare. Customer-wise, you have to prepare. Sister concern date should be excluded. And accumulation, if there is there, then whether it amounts to bad debts or not, that you have to concentrate. <clears throat> CA certificate, as per the sanction, you have to obtain quarterly and half year. Here, I want to tell a very, very even I can say so many very, 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 very bad experience. I want to share. It has happened in Salem. The unit has got 35 crores of term loan. It's a limited company. The company statute auditor says the unit was not working. It was not working. So he has given all negative reports in the statute audit report. Then this bank, this party has borrowed uh, 35 crores from the bank. So once in uh, six months, they have to give the chartered accountant statement for the debtors and stock. This customer has approached the statutory auditor. The statutory auditor said, no, unless until you produce these records. First thing, he asked about the electricity card. Why electricity card? to identify the production. So first thing you have to ask for the electricity card. Then purchase invoice, sales invoice. And he said, I will come and verify the unit. Then the customer said, that borrower said, no, I will not produce because we have almost stopped the production. There is no stock at all. But he said, sorry, uh, I will not, uh, this auditor said, sorry, I will not sign. Then this, this borrower asked the statute auditor, suppose if I got the signature from some other auditor, can you object? No, no, I will not object. It is his fate. Then what this uh, borrower did, a recently qualified charter opponent, that is, uh, was uh, just uh, SAR said, oh, yes, passed in the first attempt. Huh? So he will not sign. A re he has approached recently passed charter opponent and say that, sir, my auditor is out of station. I want to submit this report uh, to the bank immediately. I uh, will give you a management declaration saying that I have got this, this, this. Based on the management declaration, please issue the certificate. Even in the certificate also, you mentioned that based on the management certificate only, I have issued this statement. And I will pay you 5 lakhs for the certificate. To issue the data stock and data statement, this party offered 5 lakhs. <coughs> I think just now you resigned from the job, no? Nah? Nah, nah, you can sign Huh? Five years background, Parvala. You can sign. So this party has offered five lakhs. That is only three months old. That guy, that charter accountant is only three months old. He immediately thought, so just to put the signature, I have been paid five lakhs. Very good. So, the, so he has got 25 years of experience. How much five lakhs he would have earned? So in that manner, he has calculated. He signed the certificate. So here, it's a gross negligence. He has not gone to the unit. He has not verified the records. But based on the management declaration, he has sent. Then after next to six months, he has approached another auditor. So in this manner, for the entire three years, he has got a signature from six young qualified charter opponents. Then the present management team changed. New team came. They went to the unit. They found that there was no stock at all. There was no functioning. And they referred the matter to CBA. This party has ran away. The CBI has immediately taken the records of charter opponents who has issued stock and data statement. They summoned the CS who have signed those uh, stock and data statement. The case, it, was, it is still going on for the last four years. And every week, these six charter opponents, they are going to Bangalore. From Salem to Bangalore, they are going to appear before the uh, uh, CBA officers 
the case is not over they have already been issued a disciplinary actions uh, notice and now they are facing the cbi case and still the case is not over the suggestion is don't sign other auditors case don't sign other auditors case whatever may be the piece if at all you want to sign please do it with do it everything with care and among the six chartered accountants three chartered accountants have already taken a oath saying that i will not get marriage i will not uh, i mean going into any mi any any marriage life till this issue is solved so thus young chartered accountants life is doomed all the six so please do not sign other auditors case and if you are signing debtor and stock statement please verify the records and sign it anybody if he is interested i will give i will refer the case they will pay you 5 lakhs but for just for 5 lakhs their entire life is gone so my request to the fellow members don't sign other auditors case if at all you are signing any stock and data statement even the net worth certificate verify the records if you are putting a value for the immovable property you have to verify the value of the valuation of the property so in one of the cases even the registrar guideline is 52 crores based on that yes executed the gift settlement deed but in auction he has got only for 4.5 crores the valuer has valued only 7 crores but government says it is 52 crores so to what extent you can give net, net worth na you, what the engineer chartered engineer gives the valuation that for that only you have to give the uh, certificate but you can say that i have relied on the government records so there also we have got the base but without any base don't sign the net worth certificate also so a very very dangerous area don't give this uh, this type of uh, ca certificate step 4 says if the drawing power exceeds the outstanding balance then that amounts to npa step 5 is very very important there is a cash credit loan there is a cash credit loan if the limit is not renewed within a period of 180 days from the original due date so this is called as temporary deficiency temporary deficiency so a, lim- a loan is due but this loan uh, with reference to cash credit loan this account has to be renewed within a period of 180 days from the original due date so among the 180 days there may be lot of short renewals we renewed for 3 months we renewed for 4 months all should be part of 180 days all all should be part of uh, 180 days so here i want i went for a stock audit this has happened some uh, 20 days back i went for a stock audit the limit is 5 crores but the party is doing transaction of 500 crores into the account because he has got a very good uh, government order so he is doing uh, very good transaction but the limit has expired some 4 years back for every once in 6 months they are giving temporary extension temporary extension temporary extension i said the loan has already become npa some 3 and 1/2 years before since i am doing the audit for this year i am going to classify this account as npa because the limit is not renewed so here you are to be very very careful among the 180 days all temporary renewal should be included and they say that sir from the temporary renew it is another 180 days they will tell they will tell lot of stories but when you go to the rbi circular it says it is only 180 days if the limit is not renewed on 181st day that account will become npa and both temporary renewal and short renewal point step 6 is a period of 180 days must be included non submission of stock statement for i mean more than 90 days it will become npa so this is with reference to cc NPA has to be calculated on borrower wise and not facility wise. This is this point also you have to remember. 
Now I am going for the agricultural advances. Okay. In agriculture, it's a very, very important thing. I need five minutes of your full concentration. Within five minutes, we'll be master of agriculture and NPA. But to prepare this slide, I spent two and a half days. First, I have to understand. Then only I have to explain. So for my, for my understanding, I spent two and a half days. Then only in very, very simplified manner, I want to present this. There are direct agriculture and indirect agriculture. Direct agriculture is always related to crop loan. Non-crop loan, you are not supposed to consider. So direct agriculture with reference to crop loan, you have to consider. There are two types of crop loan. One is short-term crop. Next one is long-term crop. Short-term crop is the crop which is less than one year. Long-term crop, na, it is more than one year. It is called as... Uh, I mean, long, long term, long term crop. So here, crop season means crop period plus harvest period plus marketing period. This is called as uh, crop season. From where you can find, you can find find from the Nabod circular. So this is clearly mentioned. Now coming to the excise. This is with reference to crop loan short term. That is less than one year. Here. The crop season starts from 1615 to 31316. It is only an example. Here, the due date is 313 2016. From where you can find this due date, you can find from the sanction letter. You can find from the sanction letter. It is 31316. For short term loan, from the due date, add two crop season. For long term loan, from the due date, add only one crop season. The crop season must come after the due date of the loan. For short term, add two crop season from the end of the due date and that crop season must come after the uh, uh, after the due date. So here, the due date is 31.316. Next crop season is 1.616 to 31.317. Correct? Because first crop season is now. 1-6-2015 to 31-3-16. So that is the crop season for 17. That is the crop season for 18. So due date is 31-3-16. The two crop season that comes after the due date is 31-3-17, 31-3-18. So the due date for the loan is 31-3-2018. That is an agricultural short-term crop which is due on 31-3-16 should be paid on or before 31-3-18. Otherwise, that account will become NPA on 1-4-2018. Is it clear? Any doubt, you can ask. In five minutes, you can easily learn. Short term, short term crop, na, from due date, add two crop season. That crop season must come after the due date. So here, the crop season, as per the sanction letter, is 1-6-15 to 31-3-16. So the due date is 31-3-16 as per the sanction letter. The two crop season which comes after the uh, uh, due date is 1-6-16 to 31-3-17, 1-6-17 to 31-3-18. So the due date should be 31-3-18. So the NPA date is 1-4-2018. Clear, sir? Any doubt you can ask. So this, uh, this is going to be my uh, last uh, presentation of today. And next example is 2916 to 28317. Due date as per the sanction letter is 28317. The crop season which comes after the due date is 2917 to 2018, 2018 to 2019. So the due date of the loan is 28319. So the loan amount of uh, 2916 to 283 is not paid. On or before 28 3 2019, then that account will become NPA on 29 3 2019. Any doubt, you can ask. Is it clear? Okay, I'm moving to the long term. This is another example. 
you can ask see in the previous example 31316 is the end crop season again due date is 31316 31 28317 is the last date again due date is 28317 in the next example 22316 to 1810 2016 now on the crop season but the sanction letter says the due date is 31 10 2016 again two crop season which comes after the due date is uh, 17 and 18 so the due date is 18 10 2018 that is the payment should be made on or before 18 10 to 2018 it's a very tricky position first example uh, both the days colored here 31 10 16 is a due date from there add two crop season so the second crop season ends on 18 10 2018 so the due date is 18 10 2018 the 19 10 2018 is the npa date any you are not understanding it please ask don't hesitate Huh? The crop season short term duration that you have captured in huh. the first table, how did you arrive at that? Sanction letter. So sanction letter will mention the date of sanction and so the due the date. Sanction letter la crop season is clearly mentioned. They mention the due date. The rule says from okay. the due date add two crop season which comes after the due date. So end of the crop season is the due date. Okay. Fine. Is it clear? Yeah. Now. the actually uh, answers are here the uh, i think they will circulate the uh, i mean it's only a two page i prepared wherever you are going for any statute audit concurrent audit you take the paper that will be definitely a good guidance for you now coming for the long term crop one you have to add one crop season the crop season is 2014 to 3616 again due date is 3616 the crop season which comes after the due date is 2417 to 3618 same concept in crop season short term la you have to add two crop season long term la you have to add only one crop season is it clear same concept that is two crop season you have to add here only one crop season only one point you have to remember is the crop season which comes after the due date that you have to consider see there is a manual in our uh, ca issued they issued a manual on uh, bank audit you go through it you have got some 20 exercises here here only for the crop loan you have to follow this for all other non crop loans for all allied activities of agriculture the concept of 90 days you have to calculate only for the crop loan this concept is applicable for others you have to consider only the 90 days concept here 58182692019 the due date is 5919 the crop season which comes after the due date is 5820 to 6921 so payment before 6921 you have to make so npa date is 7921 same concept so here uh, i am uh, stopping the presentation and uh, i think Uh, for one time i'm just i'm stopping the presentation and uh, that registers loans and registers and if possible after reaching salem at 20 after 24th uh, i'll share the important registers name so that you can go through i'll share this to the branch uh, they'll mail to you you just take it and it will be useful for you and i wish you all the best don't be a npa don't be a npa non performing audit Thank you.
Thank you, sir, for the wonderful presentation. We know the three hours will not be sufficient for you to explain all the do's and do nots for the bank audits. And we are waiting for the last one year to get the bank audit. And you are saying you have to, you have to take care before signing the document and don't be an NPA. So <laughs> uh, we, are, we really enjoyed. That can be seen from the number of participants still on our seminar hall now. Even after 40 minutes, we are late on the schedule. Uh, thank you so much, sir. As a token of gratitude, uh, I request our past chairman, Anthony Sebastian, sir, to give a moment there to uh, Ravindran, sir. I invite uh, our secretary Divya Dharmarajan for a formal vote of thanks. Good evening, everyone. On behalf of the Trishu branch of ICAI, I would like to thank our session speaker, CA Ravindran, sir, for generously sharing his knowledge and expertise with all our members. I'm sure all the members have had a great takeaway from today's session. Your dedication to your craft and willingness to impart wisdom is much appreciated by the Trishul branch. So thank you so much, sir. I would also like to thank our chairman, C.A. Anu, for, uh, for organizing today's session. Last but not the least, I thank all the members who sat throughout the day and they, uh, they attended today's session. I'm sure you had a great takeaway. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye. That I'll send later. Hmm. Twenty fourth only.